good afternoon to everyone from india and good morning to everyone from the uk uh, we welcome you all to ortho tv uh, to conduct this very international meeting i hand over to dr praveen bhardwaj a good afternoon everyone and welcome to this uh, seventh mid term cme of the indian society of surgery of the hand and this is a combined meeting with the british hand surgery so british society for surgery of the hand so we have uh, set up the theme of the conference as tips and tricks and avoiding complications so as we go through you would see that there are five sessions and we have got a moderators and the top speakers in that particular field and i am sure you are going to have a good time all the viewers when you are seeing on the ortho tv you when you scroll down you will be able to see a chat box in which you can type your questions so your questions will come to the moderators and then we can ask to the speaker so now without taking any extra time let me uh, hand over to dr ravi mahajan who is the president of the indian society for surgery of the hand over to you ravi sir yeah thank you praveen Uh, good afternoon to all my indian colleagues and good morning to our uh, british colleagues and greetings to all others as per their time zone and on behalf of the indian society of surgery of hand i welcome all the faculty members moderators and all the delegates who are attending today's uh, combined issh bssh online cme and uh, this is probably the first time that uh, this kind of a combined uh, cme is taking place you know virtually and i'm sure all of you are going to uh, enjoy that and it's going to be fruitful to all of us friends you will all agree with me that every diversity brings some opportunities with it and that is what exactly has happened as far as the covid uh, pandemic is concerned in fact it has totally transformed uh, how we conduct our educational events in the medical field last year when the lock now was uh, announced in india we were going to have our physical uh, you know mid term cme in mumbai which was expected to be uh, attended by only about 150 to 200 uh, people but since uh, the lockdown occurred and we had to convert it into a virtual cme and we were uh, so excited to know that this was uh, seen by more than 6500 people so that is one you know plus point of having uh, a Uh, and, uh, a virtual cme and then you are able to conduct it without you know incurring much of the cost uh, to the organizers as well as to the attendees and similarly over the last year we have conducted 14 webinars uh, on behalf of indian society of surgery uh, of hand and the speakers were drawn from all over the world and it was attended by large numbers uh, not only by the indian delegates but uh, globally also so when we got a proposal from the british society of surgery of hand that uh, to have this combined cme we were really excited about it and uh, uh, that is what we are going to have today and i am sure that the sharing of our knowledge and experience with each other is going to be very helpful for both young as well as the experienced hand surgeons uh, on both the sides dr praveen bhardwaj uh, the cme coordinator from the ISSH site and Dr. Sumed Talwalkar from the British Society uh, site and their academic teams have really come up with an excellent academic program. And with these words, I extend a heartiest welcome to our to my BSSH counterpart, President Dr. Sue uh, Fulilov, Pres Vice President Jonathan uh, Hobby, Secretary Ian McNeil, and CME Coordinator Dr. Sumed uh, Talwalkar. and all the uh, british colleagues uh, who are attending uh, today's uh, cme so now i'll request uh, uh, the bssh uh, uh, president dr su to kindly give her presidential address thank you thank you very much good morning britain Good afternoon, India. Uh, greetings to colleagues from any other countries that are joining us today. None of us have much to thank the coronavirus for, but it did make me wonder: would we be having this conference at all today if it had not been for the pandemic? Over the last year, to everyone's disappointment, our face-to-face -face meetings, 
and our social gatherings have all been cancelled. We've been forced to move to online platforms and virtual conferences. But as we've made that change, we've realised that geographical boundaries that used to constrain us no longer exist. Suddenly, the difficulties and the expenses and the time involved in travelling far and wide have been overcome. We can share our education and our surgical experiences and indeed our international friendships more freely and more widely than ever before. So we find that despite the adversities of the pandemic, there are some very positive outcomes from it that we must hold on to. Last year, the Indian Society uh, for Surgery of the Hand extended the most generous invitation to the British Society to be guests at your annual conference. And it goes without saying that we were very honoured to accept that invitation. Since then, much planning has taken place and inevitably much coronavirus disruption of planning has taken place. But finally, here we are. On behalf of the British Society for Surgery of the Hand, I thank you all humbly for the invitation to join with your society to share educational events this year. In particular, I would like to thank the Executive Committee of the Indian Hand Society, led by your president, Ravi Mahajan, who have extended such generous hospitality to us. We are honoured and privileged to be your guests this year. We hope that today's shared CME meeting will be the perfect taster to whet our appetites for the superb conference that's organised in August near Chennai, which we're all looking forward to immensely. Turning to today's meeting, I would like to express our deep gratitude to Praveen, the meeting organiser, he has really worked assiduously both in Indian time and in English time to coordinate dozens of speakers and deliver a packed international programme. It's a great pleasure to be here now to commence today's conference. We are meeting in our hundreds, if not our thousands, from the most junior trainees to the greatest of hand surgeons and hand therapists. We come together to teach and to learn always remembering that at the heart of everything we do lie our, our patients. I'm sure we'll all enjoy today's meeting and I thank you once again for inviting us to share it with you. Thank you Dr. Sue. And now we go on to the academic session. So first to start with we have the panel discussion on PIP joint injuries and I invite the moderators of the session to take over and introduce the speakers and then uh, once you have introduced the speakers, we will play the video of the first speaker. Ajish and team over to you. Thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to uh, welcome everyone on behalf of ISS to, ISSH to this first session on PIP joint injuries. We have a wonderful session lined up with five uh, great talks. Uh, I'd like to remind the viewer on Auto TV that there is a chat box underneath the streaming, where the video streams and which you can use to ask questions to the uh, speakers, which we would compile and then forward to the speakers later. So please make sure you use that facility. Uh, it's my job to uh, welcome the two co-moderators for today. Uh, first is Dr. Srinivasan Rajapa who is uh, a practicing hand surgeon in Chennai, and as Dr. Terence Jose Jerome, who is a practicing hand, hand surgeon in Tinkirapalli. Uh, over to Dr. Rajapur. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. And it's uh, such a pleasure and a privilege to be a part of this meeting. And uh, I'm grateful to Praveen for uh, giving me this opportunity to moderate this session. So uh, let's get straight into the into the pool and the first talk will be uh, injuries to the proximal interphalangeal joints, tip, tricks, pitfalls and complications by Mr. David Shuring from Cardiff. Mr. Shuring. Good morning. First of all, when assessing these, 
it's important to establish the exact time since the injury. There may have been delays due to late presentation, which will affect the decision making. The mechanism of the injury is important. I see a lot of these injuries in Cardiff for various reasons. The first is the popularity of rugby union. And when you have one of these running at you at speed, there is a high potential for finger injury. Football struck at pace can cause significant damage, but the most lethal area is this, the local dry ski slope. You can imagine that an extended digit stubbed at speed against this honeycomb matting will cause some serious injuries. The priorities, occupation and compliance of the patient must be established. And for example, this person is going to have different priorities and expectations to this lady. Always remove the strapping before examination or taking radiographs, otherwise both will be inadequate as here. It is important that specific films are taken of the relevant joint rather than the whole hand, which is a common mistake. And it's especially important that a true lateral is obtained. This was initially thought to be an innocuous flake fracture. When a true lateral is obtained, it can be, see, can be seen to be a different scenario altogether. Always assess the range of movement, whatever the radiograph looks like. If the range of movement is like this, then surgery will not improve it. Above all, always treat the patient, not the radiographs, another common mistake. Frank dislocations can be significant injuries. Flexion contractures are common, and I have a low threshold for referring to therapy. Again, after reduction, a true lateral is essential. Any incongruity, however subtle, may indicate a more serious problem. In this case, the collateral ligament has ruptured and the condyle has buttonholed between the central slip and the lateral band of the extensor. They are best explored through a dorsal approach. These dislocations with a fracture of the palmar lip of the middle phalanx are fairly common. They reduce easily, but are unstable in extension. In compliant patients, they can be treated with a dorsal block splint. Alternatively, a transarticular wire can be used, which is easy and reliable. The wire is removed after three and a half weeks and the joint is mobilized. Fractures of the dorsal lip may defunction the central slip and so are best reattached. Condylar fractures are relatively common. The oblique fracture pattern renders them inherently unstable and malunion will result in deformity and, in, and articular incongruity. We published a paper on the treatment and behavior of these a few years ago. They are difficult to treat non-operatively, although we had more success with undisplaced fractures in children. They may be more stable in children due to the thicker periosteum, which may be intact when the fracture is undisplaced. Displaced fractures were treated with a single lag screw inserted through a lateral approach. The vertical retinacular fibers are incised and the collateral ligament is carefully preserved. The fracture is mobilized, flipped out into the wound and gently cleaned with a small curette. The fracture is then reduced and an indentation is made in the condyle so that the drill bit doesn't skive off at the start of drilling. This helps accurate placement of the screw as you don't get a second chance with these. A single screw is used. We never needed to use more than one. They were mobilized immediately and there were no losses of fixation. K wires can be used, but the fixation is less secure. This patient presented with a failed K wire fixation performed elsewhere and it was revised to a lag screw. Occasionally, these can present after several weeks, but they can still be taken down and fixed even up to eight weeks, which is still preferable to an intercondylar osteotomy for a healed malunion. In high energy injuries, for example, when miscatching a cricket ball, they may be comminuted by condylar with buckling of the articular surface and crushing of the bone, making perfect reduction impossible. And so it is as well that the surgeon is prepared and the patient warned. Not surprisingly, the bicondylar group had poorer results. So we use a single lag screw inserted through a lateral approach, semi-electively. A delay of a few days makes no difference and they can still be fixed quite late. Next, we have one of the greatest challenges, the comminuted fracture of the base of the middle phalanx. They range from these die punch injuries to these more disastrous pilon fractures. K wires are not the answer. Dynamic fixators, which rely on ligament ataxis and some joint remodeling are useful and popular, and we'll hear more about these later. The PIP joint is particularly incongruent, in, intolerant to injury. The ideal situation may be to restore the anatomy as accurately as possible, with a fixation stable enough for early mobilization. Always make it clear to the patient that this is a terrible injury and that there is a high chance of a poor result, whatever we do. But if we attempt fixation, then we might get a good result. It's useful to 
consider the creative mechanics and fracture architecture. There will usually be an axial force through an extended digit. Various patterns of fracture can be formed. If no central element forms, then you get a T-shaped fracture resulting in a pilon fracture. If a central element forms, then you get a die punch fracture. The base of the middle phalanx can be considered in terms of three columns, a central column, which are the die punch, and two peripheral columns. To create the die punch, the two peripheral columns have to move apart. One usually remains intact, but the other must be fractured to allow this to happen. Here, the dorsal column has fractured off, leaving the palmar column intact. The approach is made from the side of the broken column, so you have a ready-made axis to the die punch fragment. The broken column is reflected on the central slip here. The die punch is reduced with bone grafting if, if necessary, and the broken off column is then fixed back on with the intact column acting as a buttress for fixation. In this case, the central die punch can be seen. Although very subtle, you can see that the palmar element is intact, but the dorsal column has broken off, and so the approach is dorsal. Another example, this time the dorsal column is intact and the palmar column is dislodged, and so the approach is palmar. Here is a T-shaped pilon fracture of the base, but no die punch. The approach is dictated by the surgical ease, and so a dorsal approach is easier. For the palmar approach, the incision is longitudinal with short zigs to make it as midline as possible. The flexor mechanism is exposed in the usual way, and a midline approach is made through the pulley system. The flexors are retracted to expose the fracture, which is then reduced and fixed with a contoured plate. The periostom is closed and the flexor sheath repaired. The hand is rested on a palmar slab until the patient sees the therapist for mobilization a few days later. Radiographs are obtained, although one is loath to change the metalwork unless there is a truly pressing reason. The enemy of good, as they say, is better. And so an understanding of the mechanism of injury can aid planning. Patient compliance is still important in the rehabilitation, but not as crucial as when using a frame. In contrast to condylar fractures, the opportunity for fixation of these is lost fairly quickly. There's really no place for the occasional surgeon to treat these and to expect a good result. As to the management of these and the exact technique used, there is no one size fits all. And as always, this should be, take, be dictated by the nature of the patient, the configuration of the fracture and the skill and experience of the surgeon in each of the techniques available. Finally, we hope to see you in person next year in London at an event that we are all very much looking forward to. Thank you. Now we go to the second video by Dr. Gray Giddens. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to be speaking at the combined meeting of the Indian and British Hand Societies. I'm talking about the non-operative treatment of PIP joint injuries in particular, and I want to emphasize gliding versus pivoting, hence the title of my talk. These are the injuries that I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about pivoting versus gliding. Initially about DIP joint injuries, i.e. Bode mallet injuries, where I first established this concept, and then PIP joint injuries. So what is pivoting? You look here at a fracture subluxation of a PIP joint, and you see that in flexion, the base of the middle phalanx pivots against the head of the proximal phalanx. Why does it matter? Well, surgeons believe that the PIP joint is intolerant of injury. It often gets stiff. It's been suggested that broadening of the base of the middle phalanx gives a bad result. And we know that poor outcomes can be difficult to treat, although we will hear later about various options. This is what we want to avoid, a destroyed PIP joint, which is stiff and painful. So surgeons have operated to restore anatomical alignment. This has often led to x-rays that look very good, but maybe the finger doesn't. And I think we can differentiate better if we consider pivoting and gliding. And I'm starting with DIP joint injuries where we first did this work. So you see here a bony mallet injury. 
And our concern is whether the main part of the distal phalanx will sublux and sometimes even dislocate as here. So what we do is an extension stress testing. We get the patient to hyperextend their DIP joint as here, and then take a lateral X-ray. In this first image, we see the finger with the mallet injury and then hyperextended. And you can see that this is pivoting at the base of the distal phalanx. In contrast, this bony mallet injury with a similar size fracture fragment pushed back in a slightly different way glides with the base of the distal phalanx remaining congruent on the head of the middle phalanx. When we assess the two groups, those who pivoted had a high risk of subluxations, but those who glided had a low risk, although the fracture sizes were very similar. These are different biomechanical entities. So I'm going to be talking about base of middle phalanx injuries, not head of proximal phalanx, which David Shuring has covered. The base of the middle phalanx is a concave side, and we know that concave side injuries in the wrist and hand are more forgiving. So previously, if faced with a fracture subluxation or pilon fracture, I would use a dynamic external fixator. I think I was often treating the x-rays and I would put on a frame like this that I described and we reported 20 years ago. Now I start my assessment with a lateral flexion x-ray. So I get the patient to bend and if necessary use their other hand to push the finger down as far as comfort allows. We see here a patient with a comminuted fracture of the base their middle phalanx, but on flexion, initially on the left hand image, push down with their other hand and their right hand image at about three weeks, flexing with their own muscles, they're achieving good movement. And although the base of the middle phalanx doesn't look great, it's clearly gliding. This in patient who had a horse rein round her finger presented with a very comminuted fracture with separation of the diaphysis from the metaphysis. We got her to flex. Within a few weeks, she could get down here to about 60 degrees of flexion. And here she was at two weeks already with good flexion and has ended up with a very good result. So I encourage the patients to get their hand moving, working with as much as they can comfortably do. And quite quickly, they build up the ranges of motion, often assisted by a physio. Here, this patient you thought would need surgery, but with gliding, he got excellent extension and flexion, a result I think you'd struggle to get with surgery. So pivoting is the alternative to gliding and would generally give a res poor result. The aim of treatment in these patients, I think, is to restore gliding. So if you have this patient with pivoting, I would operate. Sometimes you don't even need to do a lateral flexion X-ray. You know that this patient will pivot and need surgery. If they don't, you get this sort of problem, presenting late with a divot in the head of the proximal phalanx, which is very difficult to treat. So the outcome of gliding is generally favorable. We've treated 15 adults, mainly with border digit injuries, followed up for over six months, mainly pilon fractures. Generally, they're comfortable, although with a little stiffness. The ranges of motion are very good, and I particularly highlight the DIP joint motion, which is especially good, and that's a joint that's often very stiff following surgical treatment of these injuries. So what would I do if faced with a patient with pivoting? Well, I aim to use to restore gliding, and I would use my dynamic external fixator, which we reported 20 years ago. So this is a case with a comminuted fracture subluxation and the extension of the fracture up well into the middle phalanx. We apply one of the dynamic external fixators I described, and you see the base of the middle phalanx isn't fabulous, but we've restored a joint that the patient can move with some gliding, 
they create their own gliding surface. And this patient ended up with a very good result. So in conclusion, I think gliding is very important. It may be it is the critical issue in finger and thumb joint fractures, and we should look out for it more. If you seek it on a lateral flexion x-ray, I think you'll operate a lot less and you'll have better outcomes in those patients. Pivoting in contrast is a bad sign. When you see it, I think you need to operate, not to restore anatomical alignment, but to restore gliding. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Dr. Giddens. And now I request Dr. Shalesh Gupta to share his screen, please. Sorry for 30 seconds delay from my side. I'll be talking about volar plate arthroplasty, focus on tips and tricks. So far in last 18 year, I have been able to operate around 19 patients. And uh, uh, I was able to gather the follow up about, about 11 patients. The follow up was a verbal communication or WhatsApp or actual seeing of the patient. I lost the control of the follow up on seven patient. So if you ask me, what are the tips and trick? I agree with Dr. David and uh, uh, that they have just said that the gliding is more important. It is not just the surgery. It is the patient selection and the post op rehabilitation, which is key to our success. First, this patient come with the X-ray that I have a, this problem. And when I saw this, he was having a moment like this. Do I need to operate like the, this patient? He is a six months post injury. He has, he has never taken any treatment. So there is definitely something else other than the surgery which helps in getting the range of motion. What are the most important tip? It's a pre-op counseling. Poor follow-up results in the poor, poor follow-up results in the poor outcome. Patient must know the expected range of motion they must be aware that some permanent swelling at the PIP joint will be there. Lot of patients are unhappy that because there is a swelling despite good range of motion. So they must know from day one what are, what are they going to achieve and what will be the probable complication. They must be trained before surgery that you will have to move despite pain. Allow them to talk to previously operated patient for sharing their experience. So the first important tip is adequate orthrolysis of the joint on table at least more than 90 degree passive flexion. My aim will be to align the dorsal cortex. Like in this patient, I just align the dorsal cortex, repair the volar plate, and this is what I am able to achieve. This patient was having a six month old injury. And he was a young, around 32 year old male cricket player. And this is the eight year follow up I could achieve with the volar plate arthroplasty. So my aim in all this surgery is to create a volar strain by repairing the volar plate or advancing the volar plate, which hold the joint back in reduced position. Another important tip, not to further damage the collateral ligament. I am not doing any shotgun approach in most of the cases. I just did the shotgun in one of the patient. If a patient has a simple collateral ligament strain of grade one or grade two, we explain to the patient from day one that he will have a pain for one year of time. And if you do a shotgun approach, you incise the collateral ligament, remember the amount of pain he's going to have for one year. That will help that will reduce his compliance for the post-op rehabilitation protocol. So as far as I have done only one short garden approach only in one patient. This was the patient who initially had a complete dislocation of the PIP joint dorsal dislocation, was operated by some surgeon in this position. And, and after 
probably has removed his pain, this pain at two weeks and started mobilizing without any dorsal protection and he end up at six months like this again. In this case, where there was a lot of stiffness, I have to do the shotgun approach. I have to incise the collateral ligament. I have to repair the polar plate. And when I tried to get the follow-up of this patient, uh, I saw this, what he has achieved. There is an additional lateral uh, sagittal band injury he incurred a few months back. That's why he's having it. But otherwise, his follow-up is like this. Another tip, avoid using dorsal block pin. Instead, use the transarticular K wire. I always prefer not to damage any virgin structure. There is a damage on the volar aspect. You do the surgery on the volar side, reduce it. Try to avoid any penetration from the collateral ligament, from the central slave, or try to avoid any damage to the collateral ligament. But however, there are exceptions. When I was trying to do the volar plate orthoplasty in this 60 year old gentleman, when I put the transarticular K wire after this repair, and I realize on table the wire is looking loose. So in that case, I have to use the dorsal block pinning to supplement my reduction. And again, a good cooperative patient with good rehabilitation, this was the follow up I could achieve around 80, 85 degree of range of motion with some flexion deformity. Some other small points to remember, as you all know, modified castor suture by 3-0 plowlin in the volar plate. While drilling the Keith needle, keep the DIP joint in flexion. Put A3 pulley between the tendon in the volar plate. So there is no scar tissue developing between the a gliding tendon and the healing volar plate. What is the post-op? Post-op in first three weeks is a once a week visit is must. You must mobilize active and passive MP and DIP joint. Remember the edema is key of movement. Patient should be given lots and lots of time and counseling for the prevention of the edema. If they have an edematous finger, they are, no, they are never giving to achieve a good range of motion. What you do in three to six weeks period of time of the rehabilitation, dorsal block teleform splint to be straightened every week by 10 degree. Add Kapner splint at six weeks if needed in long term night splint in extension. So few of the follow up, this follow up I could gather it's an 18 year follow up of volar plate orthoplasty. He works in the Air Force. It's a one year follow up of doing the volar plate orthoplasty. This patient who was having about one year old injury has developed a reasonable range of motion, but with some deviation deformity is not happy. If you look at this X-ray, there is some damage to the cartilage because of that there is ulnar deviation of the finger plus he has lost, lost the dip joint flexion so if you encounter the number of complication yes there is a flexion deformity of the pip joint there is a asymptomatic swelling of the pip joint which lot of patients complain there is a dip joint flexion limitation and loss and there is angular deformity of digit which was probably not able to recognize on day one about the loss of cartilage on this joint. So in conclusion, if I have to say, what is the most important trick in achieving a good result in volar plate orthoplasty is not to damage any virgin structure like collateral ligament and central slip. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Salesh. Now we go to the next video, which is on uh, Novel Technique of Modified Ar Volar Plate Arthroplasty by Dr. Pankaj Ahire. Good morning to all my friends from Britain and a very good afternoon to all listeners from India and greetings of the day 
for all the listeners from rest of the world. Today, I'm going to speak to you about a simple modification of ovular plate arthroplasty, which perhaps could give better outcome in certain difficult situations. And I proudly represent ISSH as secretary. So uh, whenever we discuss uh, PIP joint factor dislocation, this is one diagram which universally appears in every text, every uh, diagram, every presentation. What is universally depicted is that the actual force acting because of the extensor and the flexor causes a push-off fracture of the polar lip of the middle phalanx, the P2, and that leads to a dorsal fracture dislocation. In fact, AO surgery reference goes on to say that uh, it's the it's a hyperextension force at the PIP joint which causes the fracture and a subsequent dislocation. Even the most coveted text on this topic, uh, that by Eaton, uh, the, the first description of OLR plate arthroplasty, does not talk much about the mechanism of these injuries. And I believe they still are poorly understood. There is a very frequent occurrence of the DIP joint and a PIP joint injuries. And in this text, this is one of the texts which describes the mechanism of injury in great details. See, it usually is an actual force acting at the uh, tip of the finger. Depending upon the attitude of the DIP joint or the PIP joint, you get different fracture patterns. What is relevant in the diagram that we have all, always been relating to this injury? So let's go take a little more detailed look at this. You have this uh, sagittal section of the PIP joint. The one marked in blue is your volar plate and the, the one marked in gray are your extensor and the flexor tendons. To schematically represent, this is what we are looking at. Now, if you look carefully, the FDS attachment and the central slip attachment, they are not at the same level in, the, in, in P2 because the FDS is attached far more distally. The torque couple that this creates, these two eccentrically acting forces create, lies somewhere away from the articular cartilage about four to five millimeters away from the base of P2. And therefore, when the fracture of the volar lip happens, whatever be the mechanism, whether it is an actual force or whether it is, an, it is a forceful flexion of the FDS itself, the moment the volar restraint is gone, which was actually uh, preventing this force couple from subluxating the joint, the moment that restraint is gone, now you have a fracture which is which presents uh, complicates as a dislocation. Therefore, very logically, the moment we put this piece back by whichever means and fix it securely in that position, that should take care of the stability of the joint and give us a congruous joint. To achieve that, we have simple options like fixation. Here is an example of a good fixation or you have a hemi-hamid arthroplasty where the defect in the P2 base is reconstructed using a hamid graph. And third, of, of course, the one which we are going to discuss is the volar plate arthroplasty. When it comes to volar plate arthroplasty, this simplistic diagram actually misleads us. It's, it's, it's not a, as easy as it looks in this diagram. Volar plate arthroplasty fre frequently, it, it requires more flexion for stability as compared to what would be achieved after uh, for a conservative treatment or for a fracture fixation or after hemiamid arthroplasty. Also, invariably, we could be dealing with neglected fractures and there the volar plate is frequently contracted. Plain x-rays are quite poor in depicting the actual size of the defect. And in most parts of India, and I believe it would be true for many parts of the world, getting ideal screw sets one millimeter, 1 1.3 millimeter profile or hemi arthroplasty or even for primary fixation is still difficult. And therefore, volar plate arthroplasty does 
remain a good choice. AO surgery reference also mentions that when you do volar plate arthroplasty, if the volar plate is not inserted right at the base of the middle phalanx, it could actually allow the FDS to still effect a dislocation. This is much easier said than done. Getting a volar plate right at the base with adequate length is not easy. I started doing this a simple modification where along with the volar plate, I would also take the FDS and simply pull it into the defect. By doing this, I found that the joint remained quite stable in this situation. And even if my volar plate could not be very effectively pulled into the defect or it was contracted or it was not ideally placed at the base, this would still give a very congruous joint. This was three months old injury and we did exactly this procedure. This extension block wiring too much, this definitely uh, affects early, early flexion mobilization, but I think it, it when, when we are dealing with a situation where we want some uh, predictable soft tissue healing to occur in this area, uh, this may be necessary. We also start early FDP active motion. Extension block wire is removed at four weeks and pull out sutures are removed at six weeks. Fifth week onwards, beginning of fifth week onwards, assisted flexion of the PIP joint is started. Whatever flexion deformity develops is, a lot, is not stretched out until 12 weeks. At the end of it, this is the kind of result that we could expect. And for a neglected PIP joint fracture dislocation, this is a very uh, satisfactory outcome. So we are hypothesized that recessing the FDS anchor may lead to a better outcome in situations where volar plate arthroplasty is performed for extended indication. We have so far operated six digits, all of them neglected dorsal dislocations of more than three months duration. All have had near full range of motion with no late subluxation. And perhaps with a longer follow-up, we will test this hypothesis. What this all hypothesis also needs to be subjected to is a good biomechanical study in the lab. I thank you for your patient listening and I take this opportunity to invite you to Holy City of Mahabalipuram on 6th, 7th and 8th of August. That's when the annual conference of ISSH will happen. Beautiful place. It's a coastal city on the east coast of India. And there, there will be ample opportunity to socialize with social distancing. And our guest society, BSSH, promises to add to the academic flavor. All of you are welcome. Uh, you can check on the website of ISSH as well as the website of ISHCON 2021 for further details. Thank you very much. Okay. Now we go to the last video of this session, which is on hemi-hemate arthroplasty. And it is by Dr. Binu Thomas. Greetings from CMC Vellore. I will be talking on hemihamid arthroplasty with focus on tips and tricks to avoid complications. The stability of the PIP joint is due to both bony as well as soft tissue structures. The bony structure being the volar buttress, as you can see here in this picture, which is at the base of the middle phalanx. The PIP fracture dislocations are classified as stable and unstable based on the amount of the vola buttress that is fractured. The soft tissue structures are collectively called the ligament box complex and uh, includes the vola plate and the collateral ligament, as you can see in these photographs. Hastings identified that the hamate distal articular surface is very similar to that of the articular surface of the vola buttress and he described the hemihamid arthroplasty where the volar buttress is reconstructed when it is irreparable using an osteochondral graft taken from the hamate. And this has radically changed the management of PIP fracture dislocations. Here's a patient who had a PIP fracture dislocation. When we opened the joint, this is what we see. And the only way to reconstruct this is a 
hamate graft. One thing is never forget the lateral X-ray of the digits for assessing the fracture. The key points in surgery is skin incision is a Brunner incision and the fully flap is elevated to expose the joint. Once the joint is exposed by shotgunning, you can see uh, this uh, picture and then you have to take the, prepare the graft site and make take the measurements. The uh, graft is harvested carefully without breakage and attached to the recipient side with screws. A num it's a technically demanding procedure and a number of pitfalls are quite common, like a small graft being harvested. This can be avoided by taking accurate measurements. Graft while harvesting can break. So remember to pre-drill pre with a 0.8 mm KY before the osteotomy and ensure that sharp, fine osteotomes are used. The other important thing is the angle of insert of the graft, which must reconstruct the curvature of the articular surface. Here you can see two different uh, lateral views. In the first one, the articular curvature has been uh, reconstructed correctly so that the joint is still uh, relocated. Uh, and uh, while in this one, the angle is not correct and therefore the joint is subluxated. So this is what you have to be very careful while you're doing the procedure. This is a speeded up video of the surgical technique, Brunner incision and the pulley flap is elevated. This is followed by sharply dissecting the collateral ligament from the vola plate and elevating the vola plate as a proximally based flap. The collateral ligaments are sharply incised off the bone to shotgun the joint. And once the joint is shotgunned, the uh, graft site, recipient site is prepared. The graft is harvested from the dorsum using a transverse incision. The hamate articular surface is delineated and using 0.8 mm KY is pre-drilled. After marking the graft, sharp osteotomes are used to make the side and the proximal cut first. Once this is done, a curved osteotome is used to make the vola cut so that the graft comes out without breakage. On the table, KYs drills are uh, two KYs are used to drill the graft so that the graft can be easily transported to the recipient site and uh, temporarily fixed there. Then the two screws are used to fix the graft rigidly. This is the procedure. Complications which we've seen during this procedure is a PIP flexion deformity, which is quite common and can easily be corrected by serial uh, splinting. Unusual complications are graft resorptions, which may be avoided by rigid fixation and also allowing time for union before any uh, heavy lifting is uh, allowed. PIP ankylosis happens when the cartilage is damaged during the procedure or because of the injury and uh, all uh, care must be taken to protect this cartilage. We've seen swan neck deformities in chronic injuries. And uh, as you can see in this patient, this developed about six months after the original procedure. And when we checked, took an X-ray, we found that the graft had resorbed uh, slightly, as well as on exploration, we found that the vola plate appeared unattached. So we have uh, described some modifications to improve the stability, and this has been published as the augmented hamate replacement arthroplasty. What we do is we use a transosseous suture to um, reattach the vola plate to the hamate graft and then repair the collateral ligament to the vola plate to complete the reconstruction of the ligament box complex. Also, in addition to the reconstruction of the vola buttress. This is a, our uh, modification and uh, we use this transosseous uh, drill hole through which a hypodermic needle is passed. And then ethibond suture is threaded through this to reattach the vola plate to the hamate graft, as you can see in this uh, video. Once the vola plate is reattached, we 
repair the collateral ligaments on either side to this uh, vola plate, thus ensuring the reconstruction of the ligament box complex. Then the pulley flap is uh, tunneled under the tendon and repaired to uh, cover any protruding screws. Here's a 10-week-old injury in a 17-year-old male, pre- and post-op picture sees the, shows the good reconstitution of the joint. And this is the five-year follow-up showing excellent function. And this is the video at the end of five years. And I'm happy to say that this patient uh, managed to join the army who has very uh, exacting technical demands for all its soldiers. So the hemihamate arthroplasty is an excellent option in the management of PIP fracture dislocations. And it is technically demanding. Uh, there are the complications which you have seen have been already described and our modifications does help to improve stability by reconstructing the ligament box complex in addition to the vola buttress. Thank you for the patient listening. Uh, thank you. To, uh, thanks to all the speakers. Uh, the, the entire session is now open for discussion. So if any of the faculty or others could uh, have any questions to ask, they could please go ahead right now. We have a few questions otherwise that we have managed to compile from the Slido app as well. Dr. Terence? Yeah, my video is not working. Can you? Yeah. Praveen, can you hear me, Praveen? Yeah, I'm able yes, to hear Yes, you. we can hear you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Praveen. Yeah, it's working now. Uh, there are a few questions uh, uh, in the chat box, probably. Uh, we can discuss the questions. One is a question from Dr. Parag to uh, Professor Dr. Binu. Uh, do you really drill that bone graft before uh, the putting into the uh, position, the hamid? That's a very good question, uh, Parag. See, one of the major problems is cracking the graft when we dr put a drill hole. So to avoid that, I always... Uh, drill it on the table where we have much more control. So you make take a 0.8 mm K wire, you put a drill hole, and then remove the K wire and put the put another 0.8 mm K wire and make another second drill hole. And then you can hold on to the K wire and transfer the graph to the uh, recipient side. And all you have to do is just uh, drill the, you can adjust the angle of your uh, uh, you know fixation and drill this K wire into the recipient side. So after having done that, then you can very easily drill a point a 1.2 mm screw into the first drill hole. So I think this is the simplest way of not breaking the graft when you transfer. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. The, the other question is very favorite from you know Dr. Vijay. What is the role of uh, the Suzuki frame in such uh, fracture dislocations? Preferably uh, comminuted uh, proximal interphalangeal joint fractures. Probably the, the speakers can answer. Well, can I answer that one? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the Suzuki frame, like any of these other frames, I think it has a very good role in <clears throat> the fractures when there's pivoting. I mean, I've described my frame, which I obviously think is better, but there's no proof of that. So I think that any of the frames, if they work in your hands, I think they uh, work well and they're pretty tolerant. So um, provided the patient can cooperate, I think you reduce some of the big risks of open surgery, but open surgery in very skilled hands like my colleague David Shearing can work very well. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, a small uh, a comment to our question to Dr. Pankaj Ahire. Uh, your modification was very intriguing and you know, innovative of involving the FTS tendon uh, into that uh, you know, uh, defect. Uh, practically, do you think uh, you can uh, you know, put the Ola plate and also the FTS tendon into the defect uh, you know, while doing a modification of your Ola plate arthroplasty? And um, if you're going to put the FTS into it, are you going to use a single slip of FDS or the entire slip of FDS? Because do we really feel that there is a overcrowding of the plate and the flexor digitorum as was well in there? And how does it affect the outcome? Uh, the, 
the FDA slips at that level at the PIP joint are quite flimsy and flat. So they are not very bulky. So in fact, uh, the, by the very, uh, the, the nature of the design by which it is pulled, in fact, it's a double fold of the FDS with the volar plate that gets pulled inside. And there is always enough room for that. Never had a problem of overcrowding. Uh, in, in fact, the, the key is to pull it as much as you would put the volar plate in. Uh, so you, you, need, you need to uh, uh, relax the FDS by pulling it distally and hold it in a relaxed position while you are tightening your pull-out suture so that it gets pulled right inside the defect and volume is never a problem. Thank you, Dr. Pankaj. Yep. Oh, I'd just like to make a comment. I did notice that you, uh, Pankaj, that you preserved the collateral ligaments, which I found very interesting because the old descriptions uh, were to actually excise the collateral ligaments, which always, I didn't think that was a very good idea. So your idea of preserving them, I know it's technically more difficult. I think that's very good. Uh, okay. In the, in the beginning, I used to stretch out these injuries uh, using an external fixator for about seven days. Mm -hmm. And then uh, shotgunning them was much easier without doing anything to the collateral ligaments. Uh, now, uh, except for uh, dividing the accessory collateral ligaments to free the volar plate, uh, I've never had to transversely divide collateral ligaments. Yes, but... I do sometimes undercut them from the proximal phalanx mm -hmm. uh, as, as a periosteal flap rather than transversely divide them. Um, Dr. Shuring, if I could ask you a question. Sure. So, uh, in your uh, presentation, you did mention that uh, you uh, choose the volar versus the nostril approach for some. P2 base pylon fractures. So, how do you go about choosing the approach? What makes you go for the, uh, the dorsal approach versus the volar approach? Well, um, this is the, the three column theory of the uh, fracture of the base of the middle phalanx. Uh, to make that die punch, at least one of those peripheral columns has to be snapped off. And usually, uh, one of the columns will be intact. So, if the, if the palmar column is intact, the approach is from the other side, from the dorsum, because the dorsum column is, is snapped off. And you can just lift that piece out of the way and you have a ready-made approach, and vice versa. And then you use the intact column as your buttress when you fix it. Thank you. Can I ask um, Please, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, this question is to uh, Dr. Binu Thomas. Sir, good afternoon. Uh, now, yes, yes, now, the importance of restoring the volar lip of the base of the middle phalanx. Now, it has been shown in morphological studies that the, that the hamate does not actually quite reproduce the volar lip, uh, which Hastings and his colleagues emphasized by treating these injuries and uh, sort of uh, designing their operation. And even in some of your cases, there's a little bit of dorsal subluxation. So you think uh, the hamate graft is correct, number one, and you think uh, it can be effectively replaced all the time? That's a challenging question, uh, Srinivas. Uh, you're right. It may not exactly reflect the, uh, at the, uh, the volar buttress, but I think anatomically that is the nearest uh, uh, nearest uh, you know alternative for that so i don't think we have anything else right now available to us which does reproduce the volar buttress as much as a hamate graft and um, i do agree that you know in many situations you find that it does look uh, slightly different and the size of the hamate graft which you take may not be as uh, you know breadthwise at least uh, as long as the uh, the articular surface of the uh, middle phalanx base. But having said that, even with that, even if the graft appears slightly smaller, but uh, I in my experience the joint has been reconstituted well 
and the movements i've got have been very good so this is the closest we have got right now available uh, to we uh, reconstruct the vola buttress it's three o'clock can i just say one <laughs> thing about that um i think i think that's absolutely right but and i think what the hemi hamate is doing is it's taking a joint that's pivoting and you're making a joint that's now gliding it doesn't need to be perfect as long as it glides and then it'll do well and the body will cape around it well it'll, it'll remodel as these things always do as time goes on so it doesn't have to be perfect mr giddens your your experience with the hemi hamate arthroplasty Oh no, I very little. You don't want to hear my experience of it. It's, I'm I've done nothing compared to the experience that of the speakers here. But I'm under. But what I'm saying is, it's what the principle of what you're doing is you're taking your joint from a pivoting joint to a gliding joint, and I think we want to keep emphasizing that. Or in other words, you're saying the Walla lip recreation is a little bit of an imagination, if I can use that word. Well, I mean, I, it would be lovely if you could achieve that, but I think it's going to be difficult and it probably doesn't matter because as long as your finger is gliding, it will do well. And I think the reason for that is because if it glides, it will then have a better potential to actually remodel. If it pivots, it's not really going to remodel effectively. I think all these things rely to a degree on some remodeling over time. And you just have to create the environment to, to allow that to take place. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone is still doing the volar plate orthoplasty? One, <clears throat> may I ask one question? So uh, commonly patients uh, present a little late. So is there any specific duration after wood which you would not think like a conservative or a non-invasive treatment would work? Dr. Giddens? Um, well, again, I'm going to be very boring. I think it's key whether they're gliding or pivoting. If they present late and they're gliding, they'll do pretty well. I just keep them going and that should be fine. I think if they're pivoting, I think that's a big problem. I've tried to reduce them um, early, um, you know, at a few weeks. And I've not been very impressed with the results that I've achieved. Um, uh, it may be that we should go for a very early hemi hamate. Just don't manage to mobilize the soft tissues as well and they don't do so well in the UK. I think our experience is less good than yours. I think you, you are uh, very correct in the, the, the principle of gliding because many patients, they come with a bad X-ray, but nicely moving fingers. So maybe th that is a very good practical tip for all of us to follow. Thank you very much. Can I make uh, one comment, uh, Praveen? Yes, sir. This, uh, you know, we see mostly neglected injuries and most of the times, I have not been able to, you know, find any movement in them. They come so stiff and uh, there is actually, uh, you know, very little uh, movement. Most of them just a jog. So in that reason, maybe, you know, reconstructing the buttress and uh, doing an arthrolysis is important. Julie, as you are telling, there is a, a, a good variability in some patients coming with so much of stiffness whereas some patients coming with the good movement but bad x-rays. So in that way, if the movement is uh, not good, then it amounts to what Dr. Gedin says, that it is not gliding, and then we need to be more aggressive in treating them. Would that You're be right. okay to say like that? Yeah. I agree. Um, question to Dr. Shailesh. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so there is a question about the whole plate arthroplasty. Is how large a defect would you consider... Uh, volar plate arthroplasty for and not a, I assume that means that not a hemi hamate and you so whenever, volar plate. So whenever I try to do the hemi hamate, I end up in doing the volar plate arthroplasty. <laughs> That's my answer. <laughs> <laughs>
So, uh, does so that e- even you? even even up to fifty percent. See, uh, my aim is to restore the volar restraint. If we are able to restore the volar restraint and provide a gliding surface, it doesn't matter. Our aim is to get the range of motion. Okay, thank you, sir. Well, uh, the other question that is uh, directed to all the faculty is: dorsal block pinning of acute PIP joint fracture is a lost art. If one of the speakers could take that up, please. Um, I think it's a useful technique um, because if you're using a pin to uh, uh, to stabilize a, a PIP joint fracture dislocation, then it does avoid damaging the small amount of remaining articular surface, which is a shame if you put a larger wire through it. Uh, but you have to be a bit careful because sometimes it's not that stable and occasionally the base of the middle parts will sub- re-sublux. So you have to keep an, eye on, keep an eye on it quite carefully. And the other thing to realize is that if you do a dorsal block pinning, it's not an invitation to mobilize the PIP joint. You can't really because the central slip is transfixed. Uh, it's just uh, another technique, uh, but you still have to immobilize and probably split the finger until the wire comes out uh, after a few weeks. Yeah, I would say that, um, I mean, again, what the pin is doing is, is taking a pivoting surface into a gliding surface. In the main, I think with these, if you get them moving, there's enough articular surface that they glide. And if there's so little articular surface, and I think that often the dorsal block pin won't establish gliding, it will still pivot. So I think there's not much role for it um, if you look for gliding. But I think occasionally, and it is certainly, as David says, a very simple and typically reliable approach. Um, uh, Dr. Pagi? Yeah, no, uh, to Dr. Binu Thomas, sir, when you are uh, planning a patient for hemi hemate, so many times we see the head of the proximal phalanx also, we may find that not good. So, do you consent patients for a fusion when you are taking them for hemi hemate? I do. I do actually consent them for fusion. And uh, one of the cases, uh, which uh, went on to a PIP ankylosis after the hemiamide was such a case where I thought I would get away with, uh, you know, uh, you know, not really uh, considering that uh, little loss of cartilage in the head of the middle, the proximal phalanx. And that initially the, the patient had good movement, but then later went on to ankylosis. So you would be careful to do, not to do such a case, uh, after that experience. Yeah, sure. Are there any other questions, Ajish? Uh, yes, sir. So um, we have a question from Dr. Anil Bhatt, and that is to Dr. David Shearing. So what he wants to know is if, apart from a lateral flexion X-ray, can a real-time screening under the CM change the treatment plan? Yes, I think uh, that's a useful tool as well. Uh, I think um, obviously the, 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 when making your decision how to treat this patient, the, the most crucial thing is to assess the patient. And if you have a patient with a really good range of movement, then your operation is never going to improve that. But if you actually combine that with a real-time screening, with a mini, mini CR perhaps in, in clinic or even in theatre, then if you can see that the, the fragments are effectively moving as one, and uh, as gray as I think uh, Dr. David has to unmute himself. David, you're muted. Oh, sorry. Yeah, um, yeah please tell now. Uh, yes, <clears throat> sorry, I presume you didn't hear any of that. Um, yes, um, I think, um, again, that's a useful tool that the most crucial uh, thing when um, deciding what sort of management you're going to have is to assess the patient. And if you have a patient with a very good range of movement, then your surgery is never going to improve on that. But if you combine that with uh, real-time screening, perhaps with a, a mini intensifier, and you can see that those fragments are moving uh, uniformly and 
as one. And as Gray Giddings has uh, stressed to us, if, if those pieces are, are gliding, then that will obviously sway you away from, from interfering or from operating. So yes, it is a useful tool. Um, so, uh, question to Dr. Binu. So, just because we had discussed this concern for fusion, so there's another question whether if in such a situation when we have a cartridge defect in the head of the proximal phalanx, would you consider something else like an osteochondral graft or interposition? Would that be an option or would be straight away going to fusion? So, if you could sir, unmute, un yourself. unmute yourself, sir. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, I suppose that can be considered as an option, though I have only this experience where I've gone mm -hmm. for fusion, where I could not, uh, you know, do a hemihamate. And Shailesh did mention that whenever he went for hemihamate, he did vola plate. So that may be also another option. Mm -hmm. There's also another question from the audience. Which I guess we will let uh, any of the speakers take up is uh, what do you think about the risks of development of osteoarthritis after these procedures? Do we see those open after whole plate arthroplasty or a hemi I guess that is what the question uh, is trying to know. How often would you see these patients even after what looks like a successful reconstru reconstruction develop uh, OA in the long run? Um. Let me take that uh, question. May, you know, I've had about now uh, close to 15 years of, uh, you know, follow up on uh, some patients with hemihamid. I have not seen any arthritis till date, but I suppose, uh, you know, it's always there on the horizon. And uh, even if there are radiological changes of arthritis, they may still be functionally mobile and painless. That is... Uh, also, you know, all things considered, uh, can, can be considered as a good result. Dr. Shalesh, your experiences with yes. plate and osteoarthritis? See, there is no opposing rough surface for arthritis to develop then. <laughs> so, so far, the longest follow-up I had was 18 year, followed by 15 year follow-up. And so far, they are still doing well, no pain. And I think for the non weight bearing joint, the radiological arthritis proceeds much ahead of time than the actual symptomatic arthritis. Yeah, I would emphasize, I think Shalesh is absolutely right. I think these are non weight bearing joints. We're also talking about the concave joint. And I think the concave joint is particularly forgiving, especially in the hand. So I don't, we don't see people who had these injuries 30 or 40 years ago, by and large, who need joint replacements and so on. So I think once, they, once they've got to about two years, what they've got then is largely what they'll have for the long term. Thank you, Ajish. Now we will... Uh, Dr. Shearing, I guess, had something to say. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Sir? David Shearing? Yes, Dr. David. You want to make any uh, comment, Dr. Shearing? No, I'm okay. Thanks, sorry. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, Ajish, uh, nice of you. Thank you very much. Finished at perfect time and we had a very beautiful discussion. What now we go on to the next session. And this session will be on the panel discussion on base of thumb arthritis. Before we go on to that, let me just uh, do a, a share photo. Coming. So we were mentioning about the upcoming in, uh, ISSH BSH uh, meeting in uh, Chennai. And the British Society is our special guest for the meeting. And you, know, you all are welcome to join us in Chennai in August 6th to 8th. So now we start on the panel discussion on thumb base arthritis. And I would request the moderators, Dr. Darshan, Dr. Jayan Krishnan, and Dr. Varid to take over, please. And no. uh, meantime, I'll just uh, start on the video with, by Dr. Jonathan Hobby. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you to this session of the combined online meeting of the British and Indian Hand Societies. I'm delighted to present an instructional course on osteoarthritis at the base of the thumb. 
We have a fantastic array of talent for you today. The mobility of the first calf metacarpal joint is critical to hand function. Rotation allows thumb opposition, with my thumbnail rotating through 180 degrees in these pictures. This mobility is due to a double saddle configuration of the joint, although the saddle sits on a rather scoliotic course. The joint pivots around the palmar beak ligament, and this involves significant shear forces on the joint. This shear force results in frequent arthritic changes. The X-ray shows the typical features of subluxation, osteophytes, and joint space narrowing. A classical study from the 1950s in which whole body X-ray surveys were performed in a sample of over 300 middle-aged people found evidence of radiographic changes of thumb arthritis in one third of women and one in five men. I could find no published studies in the Indian population, but believe the incidence of arthritis is likely to be similar. An elegant cadaveric study by Richard Eaton has shown that X-rays underestimate the true evidence of arthritic changes. Osteophytes are seen before cartilage loss and associated scapha trapezial changes are quite common. Changes are usually progressive with subluxation followed by osteophytes and then joint space narrowing. This progression has been classified. Some reserve grade four for pantrapezial osteoarthritis with changes in both the carpal metacarpal and the scapho-trapezial joints. Tim Davis has investigated the relationship between x-ray changes and symptoms he found evidence of arthritis in one third of a sample of middle-aged women attending with distal radius fractures. Only 6% of those with no visible arthritis reported thumb-based pain, whilst one in three with arthritic changes had symptoms, six times as high. The incidence of symptoms increased markedly with the severity of the arthritic changes. In summary, X-ray changes are seen in one in three middle-aged women and one in five men. X-ray may underestimate the severity of disease. Only around one third of patients with radiographic changes are symptomatic. Symptoms are more common in those with severe X-ray changes and scaphotrapezial arthritis is seen in around one third of cases. The arthritis presents with pain and weakness and may progress to an adduction contracture with hyperextension of the metacarpophalangeal joint. In the early stages, there is swelling, tenderness and instability of the joint with a positive CMC joint grind test. Pain on radial deviation may be evidence of associated scapotrapezial arthritis. The symptoms typically wax and wane and a period of non-operative management with splints and analgesia should always be the first line of treatment. The three classic orthopedic operations are all options, but the first operation described was by Gervis at a meeting of the Royal Society of Medicine in 1947. He went on to have the operation that he had described. The surgical approach can be Palmer, as seen in this slide of Harry Belcher's. The tendon of FCR is reflected, allowing the trapezium to be excised in one piece. Or you can use a dorsal radial approach. The artery is mobilized. The capsule elevated and the trapezium is split to allow piecemeal removal. Since its inception, there have been concerns regarding 
instability of the joint following simple trapeziectomy, and a variety of procedures have been described to mitigate this. Many use part of FCR and some are really quite complex. So with apologies to the bard, to sling or not to sling? That is the question. Well, there's little evidence in the published literature of any benefit to any form of sling or interposition. As part of a large body of work on the arthritic thumb, Professor Davis has produced the definitive study with a long-term follow-up of a randomized trial of 100 patients in which no advantage could be found to a ligament reconstruction and tendon interposition. Just over 80% success was reported in both groups. What do I do? I use a dorsal radial incision with an approach between the tendons of EPB and APL. I protect the subcutaneous branches of the radial nerve and the artery. I carefully elevate the joint capsule, split and excise the bone. I then take one of the slips of APL and pass it around FCR as a simple sling, avoiding undue tension. I repair the capsule, release the tourniquet, and then close the skin. It takes around 30 minutes skin to skin, unless the bone's very hard. The patient then has three weeks in a soft dressing with a strip of plaster for reinforcement, and then they move into removable splint. It usually takes around three months for the patient to recover. About 85% are happy and the results seem to be durable. I don't use trapeziectomy in younger, higher demand patients. In conclusion, thumb base OA is very common. It's not always symptomatic and you should try a period of non-operative management initially. For most cases, simple trapeziectomy is the gold standard and there's no objective evidence for tendon slings. Thank you very much for your attention. I very much hope to see you all in Chennai in August. Which is about fusion and arthroplasty. Yeah. Thank you for asking me to speak today. At the end of Jonathan's talk, he mentioned that trapezectomy was the gold standard, but also mentioned that he does not use it for his younger, higher demand patients. I completely agree with this. I think it does give most patients a reliable outcome, but re recovery is prolonged, uh, grip strength is often compromised, and the thumb never feels normal. I'd like to start with a case. This is a colleague of mine, 42 year old consultant anaesthetist in our hospital, uh, referred to me as conservative treatments are now not effective and he's struggling to work. So what surgical options do we have? Well, the classic options for any joint. Um, and in this talk, I'm going to concentrate just on arthroplasty and arthrodesis. So what are the advantages of arthroplasty? Well, it gives you good movement, often normal or near normal, uh, much faster recovery than trapezectomy. It gives you good grip strength and function, again, often normal or near normal. There is some suggestion in the literature that restoring the height of the metacarpal actually improves MP joint hyperextension. And many patients tell us that they have a completely normal feeling thumb. Disadvantage um, are dislocation. As you can see on the right, uh, loosening. And this is nearly always in the trapezial component. Again, as you can see on the right, this is an Electra screw in cup, which is tilted, uh, which has caused a dislocation. These implants are expensive. And whilst using the Electra, I had three patients who were actually allergic to metals in the implant and they had to be removed. So what are my indications for arthroplasty? Well, it needs to be isolated trapezial metacarpal osteoarthritis with a normal scapho trapezial joint on examination and on x-ray. Use it for high demand patients, often still in work or who have hobbies reliant on a good grip. And although I don't have a, an age cutoff, often they're less than 65. Because of the issues with Electra, I moved to using the Maya. And in a presentation from a French surgeon recently, he reported very nearly 100 cases uh, with only 
four cases of loosening of the trapezoid component and all of these were within three years of implantation. So these results are now getting to the level that we'd be happy with if this were a hip replacement and I think makes the use of implants more acceptable. Or if it does go wrong, well, we have a very reliable salvage procedure in that we remove the head and neck component, the cup, and then do a trapezectomy. The stem is usually solidly fixed uh, and can be left in situ. Outcomes are similar to a primary trapezectomy. We noticed early on in our series in Swansea that males had a higher complication rate with the Electra, and we therefore moved to using a pyrocarbon interposition arthroplasty. This is a pyro disc which has a hole in the middle, allowing you to tunnel an FCR graft through bone tunnels and through the implant to prevent subluxation. Outcomes have been very good and a number of patients have come back to have the other side done. So in summary, they're not for everyone. Uh, most patients in our practice still have a trapezectomy, but for a selected group of patients, I think arthroplasty is a good option. Obviously, as long as it lasts, and I think more modern implants are looking more promising in this respect, we do have a reliable salvage option. So moving on to arthrodesis, what are the advantages? Well, it gives you good grip strength and function. It's reliable once a fusion is established. It's cost effective and it's durable. The disadvantage are that there's a significant non-union rate quoted anywhere between 5 and 50% in various series, but often at the 10 to 15% level. There's frequent need for removal of fixation, again, quoted to up to 50% in some studies, uh, but normally not nearly as high as that. The main concern, particularly if we're using it in younger patients, is of degenerative change in the adjacent joints, particularly the scaphotrapezoid joint, but also reported in the metacarpophalangeal joint, and even the trapezoid index figure metacarpal joint. There's also the issue of reduced range of movement, which is reported in most series, particularly opposition and retroposition. Indications, again, isolated trapezoid metacarpal arthritis and really reserved for roles which require very high grip strength and durability, classically in manual laborers. So this tends to be in younger males. There's also a suggestion that it's a helpful procedure uh, when there is severe adduction of the first metacarpal preoperatively to try and present the a collapse you sometimes see after a trapezectomy. There are a number of different methods of fixation. Here on the left is a plate fixation. This can be either a normal T plate or an angular stable plate. On the right, screw fixation. This is a cancellous screw, but the use of headless compression screws has been described. K wires with or without a circlage wire, and more recently, uh, memory staples have become popular. There are not many studies which have long-term results in large numbers of patients which describe the issues of arthritis in the adjacent joints. Uh, this publication from the Mayo Clinic in 2009 describes a large series with follow up to 28 years. They describe a normal sort of rate of non-unions. Um, grip strength was restored. Uh, pain relief was very reliable. They saw Scaphoid trapezial osteoarthritis in 39 cases, which represents 31% of the patients, but at the stage they reported only eight of these were symptomatic. There was MP joint osteoarthritis in 16 cases, which represented 13%, but again at the stage of reporting, none of these were symptomatic. So really in summary for arthrodesis, um, it gives you comparable pain relief and function compared to the alternatives. There are some issues with degenerative change in adjacent joints. Um, and this is a concern when the primary indication is for its use in younger patients. Salvage options are slightly more complex and would normally uh, need some form of excision arthroplasty to allow some movement. Really, it's a durable solution in younger working males who can tolerate a reduced range of movement. So what of my colleague, the anaesthetist? We had a long chat about different options um, and eventually decided that he needed full range of movements in his job. He needed good grip strength. And we felt that the most reliable solution would be a pyrocarbon interposition arthroplasty. 
He's now back to full function four years after his surgery, uh, and this includes playing squash. I had a chat with him last week, and he's now four years down the line and says he has an absolutely normal feeling and functioning thumb and is delighted with the results. Thank you very much for your attention and look forward to seeing you in Chennai. To the next video. So the next video is uh, by Dr. Sudhir Warrior, who will present the Indian perspective in the management of CMC joint arthritis. Thanks. I'm Sudhir Warrior. I have no financial disclosures relevant to this talk. I'd like to start with uh, the case of one of my orthopedic senior orthopedic colleagues who had bilateral CMC joint arthritis, which I had operated nine years ago on one side and 11 years ago on the other side. These are his present x-rays and they look wonderful, just as his hand is with no pain. He's a prolific orthopedic surgeon and continues to enjoy freedom of movement in all planes. Well, having shown you that case, it's still very rare for us to operate CMC joint arthritis in my country. And why is that so? Well, some of the reasons I think lie here that India is a very populous country. And a large proportion of this population lives in rural areas. And only 28% of the patients have public health care. It means we're not seeing many of them. There may be so much more of arthritis all around, but we aren't seeing all of them. Add to that that only 17% of Indians have health insurance. And that private health care is four times costlier, at least. That means we're not seeing all of them again. But that's on the men, fortunately for us, that the Prime Minister has, uh, and the National Health Authority have reached out to a large number, 50 crore pay, uh, citizens, offering health care up to 5,000 pounds annually per family. So things are on the mend, and maybe we'll see some more as times go by. Add to this that the milder stages of CMC arthritis are compatible with fair functional use of the hand, acute exacerbations are at times followed by symptom-free intervals, so they feel much better when they take alternate treatments. Radiological changes do not reflect the actual clinical situation. That's very, very clear from our practice. Well, let's look at my practice. My practice is that of a private practitioner. I see 10 to 12 new patients a day, six days a week before the pandemic, that is approximately around 2,500 new patients a year. I see three to five patients with varying degrees of basal thumb joint arthritis every month. It is a tertiary referral practice and therefore only the most severe grades probably end up coming to see me. When I look back over the last 10 years, I find I haven't operated more than seven cases in a year. Most of the times it's under four cases a year. And I keep wondering, why am I doing so few? So I asked a friend, Dr. Anil Bhatt, who works at, who was a professor at, the, uh, at a prominent university hospital here. And he looked up his records. And in 2019, he, he said they had done 11 surgeries and seen only 60 cases in their outpatient department of CMC joint arthritis of the thumb. And that's the list of surgeries that they did. I also then spoke to Professor Binu Thomas at CMC Velour, and he said they had similar numbers in that hospital too. So are we more pain tolerant or are we averse to surgical treatments in general? Or is it that we have a secret and we aren't telling you? Well, the Ayurvedic influence is there. So we have various forms of alternate therapies, which does have some effect in alleviating pain and swelling and allows patients to use their hands. Add to this that there are lots of studies that talk about the anatomical variations in the insertions of the tendons around the thumb. 
and there are many publications, including Bhatia and Oberla's publication uh, that talks about 70% of uh, dissections having an abductor pollicis longer slip in the trapezium, as uh, also from the other studies, including Marco Rizzo's study that talks about 90%. Well, the Indian studies reflect around 42% only. That's about half having that extra slip of the abductor attached to the trapezium. Does that have an effect on the severity of the disease? Well, we don't know. And is that slip causing rapid progression or more symptomatic arthritis in the Western town? Something that we need to look at. What about age and the disease? And this is a paper from Jesse Jupiter and David Ring, where they have shown that arthritis increases as age increases. The number of women affected are almost twice that. So when you're about 80, almost 90% of the patients, women have it. And when it reaches above 80, it's about 100% of the women having this arthritis. Does that have to do with it? Well, in the United Kingdom, your life expectancy is 81 years. In India, that is 69. We live 12 years young, lesser than you do. And as you see, Jupiter's paper talking about larger numbers being seen at High, at older ages, we are not reaching there probably. We have only 8.9% of the population above the age of 60, while UK has 22%. That's three times almost. So you have a larger group of older people who can suffer from this disease, and we are seeing lesser of that. A lot of our population lives in the rural areas, and the family structures there are very different than urban India. This is my father's family in 1960. Much of this family lives together with their offsprings and their children and three to four generations cohabiting. Help is always around. Well, help, even in urban areas, is always around and quite cheap to get. In the rural areas, it would cost about 40 pounds a month to about 300 pounds a month in urban areas to have someone attend to you for 24 hours. The official retirement age is 60 years in India, which means you're relieved from physically demanding jobs, rigors of travel, etc. And all you need to do then is to is to firmly mix chewable tobacco in your palms, and that's where the thumb is used maximally. This is one of my patients in a place where I do pro bono work, and she has prominent CMC joint arthritis, but she's quite happy doing all her activities without too much discomfort with a smile on her face. So senior citizens in India do not need to drive, don't need to cook sometimes, don't need to play tennis or golf regularly. And there's no physically demanding avocations. They follow their religious pursuits, rock in their easy chairs, and play with their grandchildren, many of whom are in your country. The smaller the family size, the lesser the help, and you need to be independent. So you are seeing more older people, more demanding people, more people living independently and living for much longer and having access to standardized medical care. And many choose not to suffer any pain. Well, our patients, uh, we do have a large number of patients and uh, who we don't know whether radiology is the key to all of this and whether we can standardize indications for procedures. Apart from excising the trapezium, we also tend to fuse some of them. Uh, while we await the long-term results of arthroplasties. But until then, we operate fewer patients of basal joint arthritis of the thumb. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay. And that was a nice crisp description of the Indian practice, sir. Now we go on to the next talk, which is <clears throat> on use of Cartiva and Artelon by Dr. Philip Sove. Hi, my name is Phil Sove. I'm a consultant trauma orthopedic surgeon based in Portsmouth in the UK. And I'd like to discuss interpositional arthroplasty and the treatment of thumb base arthritis. <laughs> I'll discuss why we want to use these implants when we have a perfectly acceptable treatment option in the form of a trapeziectomy. I'll look at what we've used historically 
and I'll look at some more modern implants and their outcomes too. The aim is to deliver a treatment that can provide our patients with pain relief, range of movement and grip strength to allow them to maximise their function following surgery. The question is, will these new implants provide all three of these aims? Early outcomes of one of the earliest interpositional arthroplasties, the stem silicon trapezium replacement, were very positive. Swanson series of patients all had very good functional improvements following surgery. However, multiple later studies demonstrated failure instances as high as 20 to 66%. And these failures were due to implant fracture, subluxation, and silicon synovitis. Nilsson published a series of patients treated with the Artelon spacer. This was a degradable synthetic biomaterial designed to resurface the distal part of the trapezium, preventing bony impingement and to augment the thumb CMC joints. Again, patients in this first series were pain-free at three years following surgery and had a better grip than those in the comparable trapeziectomy group. However, other series and reports describe pain, swelling, and erythema in the thumb base of many patients who had had this prosthesis. Histological analysis showed large numbers of foreign body type multinucleated giant cells within the soft tissues and bone closely associated with the implant, however. And when reviewing multiple publications on the outcome of this prosthesis, the revision rate was approximately 17% on average. There are various pyrocarbon implants available for the thumb base too. These implants can be used for intrapeziectomy surgery or following minimum trapezium resection. Stabilization of the PI2 implant was a concern with a high early dislocation rate leading to a revision rate of 33%. Pyrodisc offered more stability, and Smeraglia reported just last year excellent eight year results with a 7% revision rate. I've been an investigator for the GRIP studies of evaluating the use of the Carteva CMC implant for the last five years. This implant is made from polyvinyl alcohol. It's a molded cylindrical implant which sits in the base of the first metacarpal and is a proud by two to three millimeters. And a little like the rubber on the end of a pencil, it's press fit only and is not bonded onto the bone. The implant has a high water content and like cartilage, when load is applied, fluid migrates through it. It's previously been used in the foot for the treatment of hallux rigidus and it's been used in over 15,000 cases with an 85% survival rate for five years. We enrolled 50 patients with Eaton Littler stage two or three onto this multi-center prospective phase two study at sites in both the UK and Canada. We saw major improvements in pain and quick dash at 12 months with continuing improvements in the second 12 months. Not only did we identify further reduction in pain, but we saw continuing functional improvement too. Corteva demonstrates a greater improvement in pain reduction when compared to trapeziectomy data from the literature. And Corteva also demonstrates a 56% and 60% improvement in key pinch and tip pinch strength respectively, which is significantly more than that achieved following trapeziectomy. However, we had failures too. Eight implants were revised because of pain, and this was due to subsidence or joint laxity. And so the early results of this novel synthetic cartilage implant are not dissimilar to those of historic implants that I've discussed earlier. We'll have to look closely to see how this new implant fares over the coming years. At the start of this presentation, I asked if these new implants were the answer. Well, I guess but we still don't know yet. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Dr. Sue. Now we go to the uh, last talk.
of this session, which is by Dr. David Warwick, and it is about avoiding complications and dealing with failed trapeziectomies. Thank you all very much indeed for coming to, uh, to listen to this lecture. And I'm going to talk about trapeziectomy, complications and dealing with failed cases. Now complications are fortunately very rare, perhaps 4% in total, but they could be divided into soft tissue complications and mechanical complications. And soft tissue complications, infection, CRPS, scar pain, neuroma, FCR tendonitis. There was a problem with Artalon where a foreign body was put in, that's been uh, withdrawn. But the complications that are more difficult to manage are the mechanical ones, when the metacarpal base is unstable, or the metacarpal impinges on the scaphoid, or if there's residual STT arthritis, if there's a hyperextended MCP joint, if the metacarpal adducts and flexes. Now, soft tissue complications, you want to try and avoid them if possible. Uh, nerve damage should be avoided by very careful dissection, and probably there's less risk for the nerves through the Wagner approach at the front than through the dorsal approach. You should think about avoiding the unnecessary suspension procedures. There's evidence that there's no benefit for suspension arthroplasty with a tendon, and there's probably a higher complication rate. And if we get a soft tissue complication, well, usually it's time, therapy, maybe a steroid injection occasionally. Uh, most of these will settle down. This anatomical study looked at where the nerves are placed uh, and over the front of the snuff box, the, uh, you can see there's the Wagner approach, there's the radial styloid approach, and both of these have nerves in the way, the superficial radial nerve from the dorsal approach and branches of the lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm and the superficial radial nerve in the Wagner approach. This study suggested there were three times as many soft tissue complications through the posterior approach as there are through the anterior approach. So think about using an anterior approach. Now, how do you manage mechanical complications? What are they and how can we treat them? STT arthritis is sometimes overlooked in the first operation. It's really important during your first procedure that you pull on the index metacarpal uh, through the index finger and look into that space. And if there's arthritis there, you should just take away about three millimeters, not too much, about three millimeters. And I advise you use a fine saw for that uh, rather than an osteotome. An osteotome can cause the bone to fragment. Over time, you can get STT arthritis appear. And if so, a CT scan can show that. And again, if you're revising, you can go back and undercut the trapezoid with a saw. Another mechanical complication is if the scaphoid impinges down on uh, the metacarpal. And you can see an example in the top right. Now, if that's the case, uh, personally, I've had most success using the tightrope anchor, which will pull the metacarpal well away from the scaphoid. You can use a tendon weave, but I find that's usually quite lax and not strong enough, particularly when there's been such soft tissue contracture. And more recently, the internal brace from Arthrex, where you take a slip of tendon and that's anchored into the base of the first metacarpal and the second to try and suspend it out. Quite a difficult procedure. Other options? Uh, here, uh, from David Evans, was using the silastic implant. It's a digital implant. It's turned upside down. The, uh, it's cut a bit short, and that's put into the space. Only for impingement of the two bones. This option was discussed um, using a piece of rib cartilage into the space. I've not done that, uh, but I guess it's an option. And more recently, another inventive approach uh, in the Journal of Hand Surgery just last year was to put an implant in, and this time put the implant into the scaphoid and the metacarpal uh, to try and revise a failed trapeziectomy. And this paper suggested that for some patients, uh, there were successful results uh, a few years down the line. But unfortunately, they don't always work, these procedures. And if you have really painful impingement, then a fusion. And there's two options. You can fuse the first metacarpal to the scaphoid. That's difficult. And if you do it, you'll need quite a large structural bone graft, uh, as that paper on the bottom left suggests. What I've used, and uh, I found it to be successful, 
is to use bone graft between the base of the first and the base of the second, and then hold that with two fine screws or two fine wires, preferably screws, and that will restore length and restore stability, albeit at the expense of an opposable thumb base. Now, another problem is the metacarpal base is unstable. So the metacarpal base is wobbling around. And to treat that surgically, well, you have to pull the base of the first to the base of the second. And in a way, it's the same as you would use for the impinging base. You can use a tendon. Uh, that is quite difficult to get the tightness, a tight rope or an internal brace. And again, if it fails, well, you might have to consider a fusion. The fusion is not a good operation. That loss of opposition is troublesome. Another problem is the zigzag collapse, where you have the metacarpal base is flexed and adducted, as you can see there, and you have secondary MP joint hyperextension. This is really difficult to rebalance. And do beware patients who have this zigzag deformity before surgery. And uh, you should probably consider a CMC joint fusion rather than a trapeziectomy. Uh, you'll probably find otherwise that this zigzag collapse recurs. And after trapeziectomy, it's really difficult, really difficult to rebalance. There are options. You can leave it alone if they cope, as some do. The APL tenodesis is worth trying. There's one I've done on the right where you take APL and you find one of the slips beneath the, just beneath the brachioradialis and you insert that down into the radius using a bone anchor. Hold it with a wire for a few weeks and you can see how that pulls out the metacarpal base and at the same time corrects the MP flexion. Other options, you could try a tightrope. Uh, I find that doesn't really collect that adducted posture. And again, if all fails, the dreadful operation, a fusion onto the scaphoid or the first to the second metacarpal. So to summarise, complications are rare after trapeziectomy. It's a good operation. Some are avoidable. Careful surgery, um, careful thought about what you're going to do, particularly if they have a zigzag collapse. Think of the mechanics. And if you have to manage mechanical complications, it isn't easy, it's difficult, and it can be unpredictable. But sometimes you have to at least try. So, well, thank you all for listening. I hope that was helpful. And any questions, of course, I'll be very pleased to answer them. A big thanks to all the speakers. Uh, now we'll open all the topics for discussion. I guess like the number of cases which are less, the questions are also less for our session. We request all the participants to shoot out all the doubts which they have on CMC arthritis. Um, I'll start with a question What uh, from the Slido app. What are the faculty's thought on extension osteotomy in these high demand patients with thumb arthritis? Any takers? So I published a series as a registrar. From memory, it's a, it was 50 cases with about eight to 10 year follow up. I saw all the patients myself um, and they did really well. Uh, there were a number of patients that had bilateral arthritis and it was interesting to me that at 10 years, they'd had much less progression of the arthritis in the side that they'd had the osteotomy than in the side that they hadn't. So when I started as a consultant, I thought I had the answer to this. The problem for me is that I haven't been able to produce those good results in my own practice. So I, I don't do, I really have abandoned osteotomy. I did a, a, a series of them in younger patients and it was, about, it was pretty much 50-50 whether they found it helpful or not. So I don't understand why I couldn't reproduce my old boss's experience. The paper that I published, I did see the patients, so I know that the results are true, but I can't reproduce them. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hobby. What do you think reason for that, Dr. Hobby? I wish I knew. <laughs> any, any guess? I mean, I, I think he did the fusions with um, K wires. Uh, so some of them were in pretty odd positions, but I think they all had pretty stiff thumbs. I'd, I've done them with a plate, and I think the problem with a plate is you, they don't get stiff enough to reproduce the, the stability of the joint. 
I think the the thing that his procedure did is it stopped the joint from from subluxing, and I haven't been able to reproduce that. So in the group that I would have done an osteotomy, I now do um, a tendon sling. So if it's early OA um, with instability, I take a piece of FCR and put it through the base of the metacarpal. And that, that works quite well in the younger patient with early arthritic change, but a lot of instability. Okay, so uh, one question, Jake. Yeah, yeah, go on. Please go on. Yeah. Um, what's the use of the, the role of mini tight rope? How frequently do you use or what is the role of mini tight rope? Here we don't find to use too many either. We do trapezectomies or LRTI procedures, but wanted to know what is your take on to all the speakers. Um, David Warwick here. I use the mini tight rope for revisions in the odd case where the metacarpal has dropped down and is rubbing on the scaphoid. And in those circumstances, uh, it does seem to be helpful because it will lift the metacarpal base away from the scaphoid and in doing so, reduce pain. Um, so that'd be my role. I've not used it in primary trapeziectomy. I think it's probably excessive to do that because we know that most trapeziectomies do just fine. But for the ones where they drop down, or the ones where the metacarpal base subluxes outwards, uh, it is certainly an option to um, try and restore either stability if it's subluxing or impingement if it's dropped proximally. Oh, thank you, thank you. This is uh, another question. Um, what's the role of CMC joint arthroscopy in these arthritis? To all the speakers. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, please. Very good way of paying your mortgage, I think. <laughs> uh, where, where, whether it's actually a denovation and a, a I mean, that the, there is good evidence that the, the, the placebo effect of surgery, particularly in shoulder surgery and, and knee arthroscopy is really high. So it's a challenge in, in that if a sham operation is 70 to 80% effective, um, it is 70 to 80% effective. So I think it is, I mean, arthroscopy and partial trapeziectomy, I don't know. I mean, why does trapeziectomy work? You'd think taking a bone out would be a disaster. So uh, I don't know. I, I think it, <laughs> the, the, the science of it is probably a bit dubious, but it, it does seem to help. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, so we are getting a lot. Add something, if I may, just to carry yes. on what Jonathan said. Uh, just to be the devil's advocate, so John, Jonathan's absolutely right in terms of survivorship because trapezectomy is such a good surgery that um, you know you'll have to have a huge number of cases in both. So suppose you were doing a trial, you need a huge trial uh, in terms of numbers to prove that one method is better than the other. And for that very reason, it's very hard to run these uh, double blind type trials with this particular procedure. Now with uh, an arthroscopic trapezectomy, I mean, that's eminently possible with the, the newer sort of technical uh, innovations, for example, the nanoscope. What it doesn't do is the survivorship. So for example, a number of these partial trapezectomies that I've done at the beginning of my career, a, a number of them we've had to now revise to, to complete trapezectomy. So it doesn't necessarily stand the test of time. So in that sense, he's absolutely correct. And just one more point about David's uh, issue regarding um, the tightrope. So you have to be really very careful how you put this tightrope because yeah, the I first think. 20 or 30 that were done in, um, in Germany, I think it was Arthrex that came up with the tightrope, they put the tightrope in too tightly. Yeah. So essentially they lost pain at the base of the thumb, but ended up with pain with uh, yeah. So you've got to be really careful with that, that issue as well. Thanks. Okay, so thank you, thank you. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Wavik, please. Just another point. Yeah, certainly with the tightrope, don't do it too tight. Uh, the name tightrope might lead you into putting it in tight. It just needs to be just right. Uh, that, that's true. Um, I think we, we must think about neurectomy effect as well with some of these operations. And, and we do know that there are series showing that the neurectomy can help thumb base pain. Again, whether it's placebo or not, or whether it's a real thing, you might imagine if you take the nerves away, pain will go. And it, and it may be an explanation for Jonathan's um, extension osteotomy. If you did a big, broad, wide approach that exposed the joint before your osteotomy, I suspect there's a uh, 
at least a partial neurectomy, which may not happen if you do a, a gentler, more localized um, osteotomy without it, for example. Uh, but yeah, let's think about how things like trapeziectomy, it may just be the extraordinarily uh, broad neurectomy that we're doing rather than the actual bone procedure. You have to imagine some other uh, operations we do around the wrist, some of the scaphalunate operations, that's a pretty effective neurectomy when you do those. And uh, who knows if it's the actual procedure or just the fact that we denovate joints. Just a thought. So we are getting a lot of questions on Cartiva. So uh, Dr. Sove, if we can answer those, I'll just uh, mention one by one. Does a Cartiva works in advanced osteoarthritis? If it doesn't work, can it be compared to a trapezectomy, which is normally done for a eaten three or four, maybe advanced arthritis? And does it negate the complications which the silicone implants and others used to have, like synovitis, uh, subluxation, and all those? And yeah. uh, in your case of subluxations, uh, what do you think exactly was the cause for these subluxations? Uh, so first of all, for the study, we only involved patients with eating litter two or three. So it certainly wasn't a pantrapezial arthritis. So you've got to be very careful about the patients you select, first of all, because you don't want to address the first CMC joint and then still have a problem with pain from the STT joint. So we've, I've refu re revised a few and you've got to remember that this is a joint preserving procedure, essentially. So you're leaving a lot of intact damaged cartilage, uh, cyanovium still present. So the arthritic process is still going on. So the analogy I use to my patients is, is that you've gone for a long walk with your smart shoes on and you've got a blister on your heel but then over a period of time, the vertebra is going to be articulating with the trapezium. And so that blister will slowly settle. The synovium will sl slowly become less synovitic. And I think that's one reason why we get an improvement, not just up to six months, 12 months, but also up to 24 months as well. In the very arthritic patients, I've noticed that well, the cause for some of the revisions that we've had is been uh, severe arthritis in that first CMC joint and that synovitis just never settled in one case. We've had one complete subsidence of an implant so the patient was quite osteoporotic. And then when we, when I performed a trapeziectomy, the, the implant was then flush with the articular surface at the base of the first metacarpal. And then going on to your point about stability, I think stability is a real issue with the thumb base. And I think it's, a, it's an under-recognized problem in that more that hypermobility or joint instability is, a, is, is much more significant than we first realise. When, when I go into the joint, I do a dorsal approach for these and I do a transverse capsulotomy. And the one thing I notice is there's a lot of redundant capsule at the base. That dorsal ligamentous complex, which is now more recently been shown to be the main stabiliser of the first CMC joint, Whereas before we thought it was the beak, but all about the beak ligament, we now realize that there's a lot of stability right at the back. I, I believe that a lot of that ligament is attenuated because of either the disease process or because of inherent problems with the soft tissues in these patients. And when I come to stabilize the joint, I really have to imbricate that either with a pants in vest, trousers, reconstruction, or I imbricate it to try and get as much stability as, as I possibly can. And in a couple of cases where I've gone to revise these, again, when you manipulate them, I do the approach and I expose the capsule and my repair is completely stretched out again. So I think there is, like when you operate on hypermobility patients, I think there is, their soft tissues are inherent, inherently, have, intrinsically there's a problem. And so they may always be susceptible to getting instability later on, which will cause pain. So there is also a question on artillon. Yeah. So basically it is a fabric, right? Which we are keeping inside the joint yeah. and it acts as an interposition, some sort of interposition. So do you think that uh, the volar beak ligament reconstruction is not necessary or what is your take on that? Because it is not, it is just acting like an interposition, right? Yeah, so I, I think the artillon was designed to have a biological reaction with the body. It was designed to reinforce the capsule, get a bit more stability. Um, and um, and resurface the end of the trapezium as well. Um, I never put any of them in, and it was when I was doing my fellowship about a decade ago, 
the papers were just being written then and Jonathan's probably seen a few more than I have and I know we've talked about it in the past um, I, th I think the Cartiva is different um, it's the same materials used as contact lenses it's thought to be inert but so was silicon when it was first put in um, I haven't got any histological evidence of synovitis following a Cartiva retrieval but we'll continue to send those off to the lab uh, when we revise, if, if and when we revise them. So I think, I, I don't think you can compare Artelon to Cartiva. Um, and, I, and I don't think you can compare Artelon to silicon in a way. They both cause foreign body reactions, but they've, they've brought, they're both different materials uh, and they're designed to do different jobs. Thank you, Dr. Savi. And uh, next question is like, uh, like Dr. Warwick mentioned, that there is a problem with MCP hyperextension in some of these cases. Uh, do we have any tips and tricks in dealing with MCP hyperextension? Any of the faculty has experience with those? Dr. Warwick? I think it depends if it's uh, primary before you do the trapeziectomy or whether the problem occurs as a complication of trapeziectomy. And we, we see both of those. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I did show a picture earlier on of someone before their trapeziectomy with a really, really adducted thumb base. And I don't think those people do well with a simple trapeziectomy. Um, their soft tissue is completely out of balance before we even start. And if you take the bone out, there's even less um, resistance in this system to becoming a zigzag. So I think they're a real problem, those people. And uh, for some, if there's lots of pain, I've taken to doing a primary fusion a bit like, uh, like Dougie Russell talked about earlier, uh, because what will happen is if you fuse that very, very adductive thumb base out, the MP joint will correct itself. So for those really adducted ones, when you start, I think soft tissues, uh, some sort of sling aren't gonna work very well. Um, so that'd be my, um, my position. There's a question here actually addressed to me on the slider, which is a similar line saying, how about if you do a primary FCR sling or Vialby sling in your first operation, will that help? Well, maybe it will, maybe it won't. Maybe there's a role for tight ropes in that particular group of people if it's readily correctable, just to try at the end of your first operation. Because the whole point in the thumb is you have to make this O shape like this. And so the other thing is with our physios, our rehab, they concentrate very, very much on AP L, rehabilitation after trapeziectomy. And we spend all of our effort learn, teaching the patient to abduct the thumb base and then flex the MP joint. Because that's what you do when you pinch. You abduct the base, then you flex. So the other thing is hand therapy afterwards uh, will be to just strengthen this here, get the patient to learn to bring their thumb along the side of their index finger here to strengthen that APL, to try, try, try to get this base out because it's the base that defines the pinch after trapeziectomy. Dr. Hobby, you, you want to comment something? <clears throat> uh, yeah, so th the first thing I'd like to say is what is I really enjoyed the talk on the Indian experience. And I think one thing we have to bear in mind is, is that if you ignore these patients for long enough, a lot of them will go on to spontaneously ankylose the joint, at which point the, the pain settles. Uh, so um, I think one of the things is, is that if you're patient, you may not need to operate. In terms of slings, I've discussed this at length with Tim Davis, as you can imagine. Um, I think uh, he does sometimes do a sling in spite of his, his, his paper. I think if you can really repair the capsule well, uh, then the sling's probably unnecessary. I use an APL uh, sling uh, because a small proportion of patients have a very unstable thumb base after surgery. APL is a very small intervention. It takes a couple of minutes to do. And as long as you don't damage the FCR tendon or put it too tight, uh, I've seen no morbidity as a result. I think the problem with the FCR procedures is they're much more extensive procedures. And if you look in the literature, there's evidence that they can lead to superficial radial nerve injury. I think it, it, it's, a, uh, the, you may, there's an argument you shouldn't use a sling at all, but I think using a very complex sling is probably a mistake. 
coming Thanks, to the uh, uh, link. Uh, Praveen, may I just, uh, this is Sudhir. Yes. I'm sorry, my video doesn't seem to be coming oh, okay. on. Yes, sir. Yes, but sir, thanks. Yeah. yeah, but thanks, Jonathan, for the appreciation of that talk. That's probably one of the toughest talks I've ever given. <laughs> Trying to make a, a reason for not operating. But there's just one point I'd like to make, and that's what you did mention about they, them going on to ankylosis. More often than not, they fall off the trapezium. And once they fall off the trapezium, although the thumb is very crooked, it's fairly functional and fairly painless. Yes, so, uh, Dr. Praveen, is there time for a couple more questions? Yeah, just two minutes remaining. Uh, okay. okay. Yeah. So is there a role of denervation of the first CMCJ in these cases, isolated denervation? Any experience on those? Denervation of the first CMCJ joint. I don't use it. No. Okay. I have one question for Dr. Sudhir, if, if it could be the last yes. question. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so that was a wonderful talk. Uh, I, I, I wanted to know what is your choice of treatment. You've shown a wonderful I'm result sorry. of trapezectomy. Yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, what is your choice? Does it change with age of the patient? Uh, or is it, it still the trapezectomy is your, uh, your uh, preferable uh, treatment? Much in line with what was discussed through the talks. Right. The elderly patients, the elderly patients obviously would get a, a trapezectomy with a sling. I, I regularly do a sling, uh, but I don't drill it through the metacarpal. And uh, and the uh, and for the younger patient with a greater demand, uh, I would prefer to do an arthrodesis. We've done quite a few in professional boxers. And there's a very, very unusual reason why they were dislocating. And that's because the gloves that you get, you, 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 when you go to a boxing match, you don't carry your own gloves. You're given a glove, uh, a pair of gloves at the match. And this happens in all tournaments across the world. You cannot carry, you can't, you can't bring uh, brass loaded gloves to the tournament. So you, you have to use this, this the standard stuff that the sponsor for that tournament is giving you. And unfortunately, the sponsors in India were giving gloves that kept the thumb a little abducted. And that was causing a lot of force on the first metacarpal ray, on the ray, dislocating or fracturing them. And top level athletes, believe me, five of them I operated in the period of two years, about seven or eight or 10 years ago. And I did write to the board and to the Federation and uh, they did look at that and we haven't been seeing that after that. So for those boxers to get back and there are two of them still uh, fairly active 10 years after their surgeries, they've had uh, arthrodesis. I think that generally puts uh, across the ideas that I have about treatment of CMC joint arthritis. Thank, Thank you very much, sir. So now we move on to the next session, which is on uh, tendon transfers. And this uh, session will be moderated by Dr. Sumed, Dr. Manoj, and Dr. V. And while they take on to the moderation, in meantime, we'll start the first video of the session, that is a restoration of thumb opposition. Greetings from Christian Medical College, Valor. I want to talk with you about the opponent's plasty procedure. Since BSSH is involved, I want to recognize the role of Dr. Paul Wilson Brand, the great uh, um, English surgeon who was in India as a Christian missionary surgeon. He took on himself the challenge of reconstruction, constructing leprosy afflicted uh, deformities in uh, hands. And he is an IFSSH recognized pioneer in hand surgery, a doing of tendon transfers, and he started uh, the hand surgery unit in our hospital. I wanted to show you some pictures of operation notes and uh, detailed documentation they followed as early as 1962, 1958, pre-operative and post-operative pictures. And, and here is a picture of uh, his operation note. And what's a tendon transfer? Tendon transfer is a technique where you uh, relocate the insertion of a functioning muscle tendon unit to restore lost movement and function at another site. Uh, <clears throat> so what is the uh, purpose? Number one, it is to improve function. 
uh, when there is a nerve, a nerve injury and you cannot reconstruct the nerve uh, after injury and when there's loss of muscle tendon unit because of trauma or in certain neurological condition where, where you want to improve function and in congenital anomalies where the muscle is absent so you're trying to replace function and to correct a deformity opponent's plasty can be done isolated or sometimes along with a clock correction this is a picture of a clock correction procedure done along with opponent's plasty, you have pre and post operative pictures. And when you talk about tendon transfer, there are some very important precepts that you need to follow. And I call it the A10 commandments of a tendon transfer. The first one is tissue equilibrium. I'll elaborate on that. Correction of contracture. Then when you talk about the muscle that is being used, you, you need to have an expendable donor, which has an adequate strength. And the amplitude of excursion of this muscle should be uh, good enough for the uh, function you're trying to produce, a straight line of pull that matches the one of the muscle that uh, you're trying to replace, and one tendon, one function is what you mostly you aim for, and synergistic as well as phasic transfers are, are easier to retrain. The tissue leg problem means you should not have any edema, no sinus, no inflammation, no scar, and no infection as much as possible, and so you need to have an ideal supple hand for transfer. Role of preoperative hand therapy cannot be overemphasized. The tendon transfer cannot work against a stiff joint. All joints must be supple and patients should be educated about the need for a structured program postoperatively. This is a picture of the center started by Dr. Paul Brand for hand therapy established in 1958. And whenever you talk about a tendon transfer, you always talk about the muscle that is being used, FDSR here in Brand's technique. And the root of transfer you talk about, where you transfer the tendon is subcutaneously, subretinacular, or interosseous. And you talk about the attachment of the tendon that is being transferred either to a tendon or to a ligament or to a bone. So the opponent's plastics can be different kinds. Again, uh, the brands is one, then Buckhalter used uh, extensor indices. Camus used Palmer's longer abducted digital minima. Huber transfer is an example where you need to use the hypothena muscle, abducted digital minima, mobilize it proximally adequately so it can be transferred to get a straight line of pull as much as possible. Here we have transferred in a child, abducted digital minima, along with the skin paddle to get a hypothena bulk. So I'll show you an example of EI opponent's plasty technique. Uh, I'll show you a video that is slightly fast, so I'll pause it once in a while to show you the uh, things. So there are two incisions on the dorsum of the hand, one on the thena region, uh, the region of the MCP joint. Angular incisions are preferable, and uh, yeah, you uh, disinsert the extensor at the hood. Uh, you identify the extensor in this is uh, proprius tendon on the ulnar side of the two tendons, and this is carefully disinserted from the sagittal band, you can make a very small V extension into the region of the sagittal band so that you get adequate length. Once it is disinserted, <clears throat> you can actually, uh, you need to uh, mobilize the tendon slightly uh, from all these uh, additions that, not additions, I mean facial attachment that are around it. So preoperatively, you make sure the EI is working, it is uh, up, uh, available for transfer, and then you need to um, mobilize it carefully from the uh, genitourate tendinum and other facial attachments. The next approach is uh, incision is in the dorsum of the uh, distal ulnar aspect of the forearm. And a uh, good uh, blunt and sharp dissection can be done. Protect the veins as much as possible. Identify the tendon carefully by tugging distally as well as uh, uh, noting it proximally. You can loop uh, an umbilical tape around the muzzle. And at this point, it's very careful to uh, remember that you need to uh, tuck it gently and retrieve it proximally. Sometimes there may be some uh, attachments uh, in the hand. For example, when there's an anomalous muscle and the dorsum of the hand, it may not come uh, easily and we need an extra incision, but make sure you retrieve the tendon proximally very carefully. <clears throat> at this point, you can um, use the saline gauze to hold the tendon but uh, mobilize it proximally and make sure the amplitude is nice and free. And thereafter, you make a slight passageway for the tendon, uh, dorsal to the ECU tendon, and you then turn your attention to the thena region. And you use a tendon tunneler to transfer the tendon carefully. 
uh, into the region of the uh, thena region and the line of transfer is shown here you uh, can use it and you can uh, use a hand wheel gently tunnel gently and uh, they open the tunnel mouth and grasp it very carefully and then it is retrieved uh, gently into the thena region <clears throat> at this point uh, you can uh, actually uh, grasp it uh, with a hemostat and go and close your dorsal wounds it's very important and then position the hand very carefully uh, and then <clears throat> you attach the tendon after adequate tensioning you position the wrist in 15 degrees flexion thumb in in the position of opposition and you do uh, you uh, yeah very careful tension is important and uh, uh, at the bond is used to anchor it <clears throat> And post operatively, again, you see the position you need a cast. And uh, yeah, that's a good position of the hand, uh, for example. And uh, <clears throat> you need to notice that uh, good pronation and opposition to little finger without the tendon standing proudly. So remember the 10 tenants of uh, eight ten, uh, tenants of tendon transfer. Use the technique that's consistently been giving you good results. Meticulous and minimal tissue handling is important, and good post operative therapy is vital. Thank you very much and God bless. Uh, thank you, Dr. Samil. Now we go to the next talk of this session, which is by Dr. Ashwat. That would be about how to get the radial nerve tendon transfers right. Hello, welcome to the Indo-British Midterm CME. I'm Dr. Ashwat from Manipal, and I'll be talking about correction of wrist drop deformity. So the indication for correction of this deformity starts with inquiry about the duration of injury. And after that, we make three inquiries on the evidence of clinical recovery, which is that of proximal distal motor march, progressive tinel sign, and the EMG signal of polyphasic action potential. If that doesn't recover by about six months time, we start counseling the patient for tendon transfer. The next important point is to check on the hand dominance and occupation of the patient. And the need for radial abduction and retro position cannot be undermined in such patients where the smartphones have become so ubiquitous in our uh, part of daily life. It becomes even more important for people who use uh, a desktop or keyboard where the position of thumb and the fingers are so important. The next important uh, thing we check is the level of injury for which uh, the type of tendon transfer tends to be a little different, particularly with the uh, posterior interosseous nerve palsy. Then we check on the soft tissue equilibrium. We check on the, uh, the past wounds, the maturity, the integrity, the signs of inflammation, the passive range of movement, all should be within the normal range. Then we inquire about uh, the donor uh, availability. Uh, pronator arteries is the most popular one uh, for wrist uh, ECRB. Then we can use the FCU to be transferred to uh, EDC. But uh, this is not a good choice in pin policy. So for which we use the FCR, which is a better choice. FTS can also be used, but uh, uh, it has uh, known to uh, cause uh, finger contracture or swan neck uh, type of deformity. For uh, thumb, uh, independent action, EPL uh, rerouted to uh, palmaris longus is a very good choice. But of late, I have uh, also tried uh, uh, palmaris longus transfer to uh, the thumb abductors for the reason which I've told just a little earlier. Now, coming to the incision, uh, uh, the, the incision is made on the mid forearm uh, radius to retrieve uh, the pronator teres. You can retrieve all the three important uh, tendons. The FCR can be harvested from here. This can be tra transferred to the uh, dorsal side to small mini incision to EDC. But make sure that the FCR uh, doesn't cross any of the uh, suture lines. You can retrieve the EPL through the Lister's tubercle region and the MP joint region and then transfer it to the OLR side. Similarly, we can uh, bring the palmaris longus to the first extensor compartment here. So this is the uh, incision for FCR and palmaris uh, longus. So it can be retrieved at the uh, mid forearm and uh, from the same place uh, we can, uh, this is the brachioradialis the ECRL. 
So we can identify the ECRB to which we will be transferring the uh, pronator uh, teres. Now the important thing is the uh, radial sensory nerve which needs to be protected here. And then finally we can uh, nicely expose the uh, uh, pronator teres. So it can be stripped off with the periosteal elevator and it has to be completely freed uh, from the surrounding soft tissues to make sure that uh, the proper uh, excursion is there for the tendon. Then we expose the uh, finger extensors, the three finger extensors. And finally, uh, we expose the uh, uh, EPL and then divide it at the musculotendinous junction and then retrieve it at the MP joint and then transfer it to the uh, volar side, not the uh, APL uh, action, type of action, apart from the IP joint action. Now, this is transferred uh, uh, to the palmaris longus to which it is sutured, not the excursion. And the tensioning is done just short of full tension. This is the most important step. So a modified pulver tuft uh, weave is done. And then uh, you check the passive range of movement. Now, this is a very important step. Notice that the pronator teres has to be brought superficial to the brachioradialis tendon so that uh, we avoid uh, injury to the radial nerve or irritation of that nerve. So, wrist is kept in about 30 degree of extension and the tensioning is just short of full tension. And in that position, we uh, suture the tendon in a modified pulver taft weave or side to side weave. Then we retrieve the FCR tendon, which is uh, brought and uh, uh, it is passed through the split uh, EDC tendon. Uh, then the IP joint are kept flexed, wrist and uh, MP joint are kept neutral. And then uh, the same tension is applied and uh, modified uh, a pulver top weave is used. And then you check the uh, finger cascade, make sure that the normal cascade has been re uh, restored. Then we immobilize for about uh, four weeks in a plaster slab. And at around four uh, weeks, we start active and passive range of movement exercises. Then by about eight weeks, we start on uh, uh, resistant exercises and full function can be restored uh, by about uh, 12 weeks. And this is the result that we can get uh, with the tendon transfers. So where you have independent uh, finger extension, we can have independent wrist extension, also thumb extension, radial abduction. But there are pitfalls. Uh, uh, what we have observed sometimes is uh, inadequate restoration of the cascade. Sometimes the index may not be adequately extending. And the other problem is the uh, palmaris uh, longus, which may abduct the thumb rather than uh, uh, offering the radial abduction. So for that, we now uh, use the uh, EPB uh, in addition. So, which will give a pure uh, radial uh, abduction at the CMC joint as well as extension at the MP joint. And sometimes, if you are lucky, extension at the IP joint as well. So, this is transferred to the EPB and the EPL, uh, we uh, give the routine FCR transfer ap apart from the other tendon. Then you can get a good uh, extension at the IP joint, including retroposition and radial abduction. Now the future of uh, uh, wrist tendon uh, transfer surgery, I think uh, it's uh, with wide awake transfers, although I have not done this, but I feel the biggest benefit with this tendon transfer is uh, the tensioning part, where we have an excellent control of balancing the uh, tendon transfer. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. In this session on how to get it right, I'll be talking about tendon transfer for claw correction. Yes, 
by doing a tenant transfer to correct the claw, you can get a result like this, where the claw is totally corrected and patient has got a good flexion extension of the finger and patient is able to use the hand for all the day-to-day -day activities quite comfortably. And it could be quite effectively and easily done. Provided we follow some principles that we have a right patient, right method of correction and right surgical technique. A good patient is the one who does not have any contracture at the joints. There is no scarring around the root of the transfer and reasonably good flexor and extension function is restored. How to choose a method? We know that there are multiple methods available. So we could divide it into the donor selection, route of transfer and the site of insertion. Let us discuss the options, which is better and how to choose. There are various options of donor claw correction. The most commonly used is the FDS because it is easy and quick to do. It is easy to rehabilitate and has provided good results in the literature. The second option is using an ECRL. However, it always would require a graft for extension, hence an additional operative site. But to note that this is the only transfer which is adding power to the hand because you are transferring a wrist extensor to the fingers. FCR and finger extensors are very uncommonly used. However, one specific indication for using FCR is in a patient who has a flex, habitual flexion deformity at the wrist. Because using FCR in such a patient would correct the deformity at the same time would also correct the claw. So if you want to improve the flexion power of the hand, better is to use ECRL. Otherwise, FDS is a good option. And in a patient with flexion deformity at the wrist, use FCR. Choosing the route of transfer, we have an option of dorsal or volar route. However, we should assure that our transfer goes palmar to the MCP joint axis because our transfer has to act as a flexor of the MCP joint, which it will do only when it is volar to the axis of the MCP joint, which corresponds to it being volar to the transverse metacarpal ligament. To assure that when you are passing a tendon turner under the transverse metacarpal ligament, we should note that the finger should be going into flexion and not extension. If finger is going into extension, then you are in a wrong path. So volar route is considered to be biomechanically more efficient. So we should always prefer to do by a volar route unless there is a lot of scarring in this area. And those are the only cases where we need to go on the dorsal route and always be volar to the transverse metacarpal ligament that is the axis of MCP joint. Choosing the insertion site, again, there are multiple options available, the lateral band, the bone, phalanx, pulley, and the interosseous tendons themselves. They have been studied biomechanically and it has been found that all of them give sufficient flexion force at the MCP joint, but extension force is given only by lateral band insertion. Among these insertion options, if you insert the tendon to the A2 pulley, you get the best flexion force. And next is the lateral bend. So whenever we want a patient to have interphalangeal extension, we need to attach to the lateral bend. Otherwise, pulley insertion is quite good enough and easy to do. Now, how to decide where to insert would depend on Bouvier's maneuver. So you could see here, just by preventing hyperextension at the MCP joint, the claw gets corrected. So what does it indicate? It indicates that the extensor apparatus beyond the MCP joint is in good shape. And if the MCP hyperextension is prevented, the claw would get corrected. This is Bouvier's positive. So in a Bouvier's negative patient, even after hyperextension at the MCP joint is cor corrected, the patient will not be able to straighten the fingers. That indicates that the extensor apparatus is overly stretched out. So in such a patient where you have a Bouvier negative test, you need an active extension transfer for the finger extensor. So you should always insert to the lateral band. But if a patient is Bouvier positive, any operation which prevents MCP hyperextension would work. So again, to emphasize, lateral band insertion in patients who have a Bouvier negative test, 
and any other insertion should be fine if you are having a Bouvier positive. Our preference is an extended pulley insertion in which we insert the slip to the A1 and part of the A2 pulley. Now coming to appropriate surgical technique, of course you need to plan the incision well, a traumatic handling of tendon and a strong repair is recommended. But tension adjustment is the most important part of the operation and we will talk a bit about that. Now positioning is very important. So wrist should be positioned in 10 degrees flexion and about 80 degrees flexion at the MCP joint. So wrist would come over here and the MCP joint here. And this is the Fritchy splint, which we regularly use in our hospital. The hand would be placed something like that. And to get a correct tension, first you start with the index finger. You give a maximum pull and then leave it legs. So correct tension is exactly in between the two. That is the most practical way of getting the tension correct. Once the index finger is completed, we go to the little finger. We pull on the little finger slip and look for the movement at the index finger. And moment you see a movement at the index finger, a six millimeter more pull would get a perfect tension between the two. Why is this six millimeter? Because when we have tied the slip to the index finger, the whole tendon complex would have migrated radially. And now when we are tying the transfer to the little finger, we need to get it in the center. And it has been found that it is six millimeter more than the place where the index slip has started moving. And once index and middle, <clears throat> index and uh, little are completed, now you go onto the ring finger and middle finger and see the movement of the previous finger and suture into that zero tension. This is the perfect tension where you get a nice cascade. With extension of the wrist, the fingers flex, and with flexion of the wrist, the fingers extend. When you are adjusting tension in the lasso technique where you are using the extended pulley insertion, you take the slip of the FDS, loop it around the A1 and part of A2 pulley and suture to itself. Here tension adjustment is much easier because you are straight away seeing the fingers over there and you need to assure that the fingers come in a cascade like this. And again, same tenodesis test to confirm the tension. By following this principle, you could get very good result. As you can see over here, FDS with a lateral band connection, a result like this. FDS with a lasso type of insertion, a result like this. And this patient who had a combined median ulnar nerve injury, ECRL extended with facial letter graft, four slips, and a result like this. You can see the patient is able to maintain an intrinsic plus position has, has very good flexion and extension at the fingers and the claw is completely corrected. So yes, we can get good results with tendon transfers to get a, to, to correct the claw deformity, provided we have a right patient, we choose a correct technique, appropriate donor, route of transfer and insertion site, and we adjust the tension perfectly. Yes, by following this principle, we can surely get it right. So now this uh, session is open for discussion. May I ask the moderators to come on and ask some questions to us? We do you want to summarize? Yes. Uh, can uh, can you on my video, please? You can put it uh, on yourself, Doctor V. Uh, I can't because the host stopped it. Yeah, yeah. For me also. Is that okay? okay. Now you are able to. No. Nope. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So yeah, three yeah. excellent yeah. talks. Uh, so we we'll open up this time for discussion. We wait for questions to come in. I'd like to start by asking Praveen some questions. Yeah, sure. um, great talk, which uh, really reflects your experience, uh, seeing what works and what doesn't. I noticed you use the uh, you weave the FDS tendons to the ulna side of the index finger and the radial uh, side of the rest of the finger. Uh, I understand the rationale for that, but maybe you can expand on why you did that. The second question is uh, which uh, preference for which, which finger preference for FDS uh, do you do do you use the middle finger or the ring finger, and how do you prevent a sore neck deformity? Yes, thanks, Doctor V, to bring out uh, three very perfect questions, and uh, so uh, coming to the first one, 
Yes, so when we are inserting the tendon, we insert onto the ulnar side of the index finger and the radial side of the other three fingers. So there are two basic reasons for that. One is quite easy to understand. That is, if you do it, the insertion in this way, you get a closure of the fingers. So if you are attaching onto the radial side of the index, the index would not close onto the next fingers. So by doing this type of insertion, that is the ulnar side of the index and radial of all the other fingers, you get a good closure of the fingers. So that is the reason number one. Second, there it is a nice interesting region which was actually uh, uh, suggested by Brand that if you give an insertion onto the ulnar side of the index, it gives a supination to the index finger and then it acts as a better pinching surface for the thumb. So these two are the reasons why you attach the tendons as I described. Now uh, coming to which finger would you would like to use. So when a patient is have got a low ulnar nerve palsy, I prefer the ring finger because index and middle finger are involved in chuck pinch. So you require an FDS over there, but ring finger, I think is required more of a power grasp where the FDP is quite good enough. But in a high ulnar nerve injury, where there would be a paralysis of the FDP of the ring finger, we opt to take for the middle finger. Now coming to the last thing, how do you prevent swan neck deformity from the finger where you have taken out the FDS? That is a very, very important thing in Indian situations because we Indians are quite lax and uh, we are very prone for developing a swan neck deformity. So though we always uh, uh, do a prevention to prevent uh, to preventive measures to, for this, what we do is when we are cutting the FDS slip, we leave one of the slip, which is going to the little and ring little bit longer and suture it onto the volar plate by keeping the PIP joint in about 20 degrees of flexion. So it would uh, kind of act like a tenodesis. So this is one which we used to routinely practice. Dr. Sabapati has taught me from so many years and he has been practicing it from for so long. But recently I read a paper and uh, by Dr. Uh, uh, Oskan. So their group says that it is not that uh, they never notice deformity in the finger from which they have taken the, the graft. So there, uh, the suggestion is the deformity is more because of over tensioning. So if you tension it more when you have attached to the lateral band only the deformity comes. So it is not because of you, you have taken the FDS. So maybe to prevent the swan neck deformity, we can take this preventive suturing of the tendon to the volar plate, a tenodesis, and not to over tension the transfer when you are attaching it to the lateral bands. And if possible, if you don't require a lateral band insertion, maybe you can opt for a pulley insertion. Yeah, can I add to that, Praveen? Uh, yes, sir. Here. Can you on my video, please? Allow it on that. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. You can on so, it, sir. Yeah, <clears throat> question about taking FDS is middle finger FDS is pretty long. So you would want to take FDS of the middle finger for these procedures where it has to reach the lateral band. But before you harvest any FDS, you have to make sure the FDP is grade five because you don't want a weak FDP and you harvest the FDS and you end up with a finger that cannot close. So that's, that's mandatory. You need to check the FDP strength. The second one about the swan neck deformity is we usually cut the FDS not close to the insertion, but slightly away from the insertion so that the remainder of the slip can lie down on the bed and sort of scar in that position. We don't suture it, but we have not really noticed a swan neck deformity as long as you don't cut it too close to the insertion. And of course, if your tensioning for the lateral band is high, that also can cause you lateral swan neck deformity. So two things you have to be careful about, not over tensioning, and not cutting too close to the insertion. I think those two are important. Yes, sir. Anything else, Dr. V? Yes, uh, my co-moderators, do you want to ask questions? Yeah, um, if I could just ask a quick question of uh, Dr. Samuel. Yeah. Uh, great talk, um, by the way, this is excellent, very educational for, for me, I'm sure for a, a lot of us. I just wanted to check with you what you would do if uh, someone had a fixed adduction deformity. So it's not uncommon, isn't it? When you lose 
thumb function that the thumb then comes to lie in the, the plane of the fingers. Correct. So would you exclude these patients completely uh, or would you do a release, maybe a trapezectomy type thing? Thank you for the compliment, sir. Um, <clears throat> that's why the importance of preoperative therapy is very important. <clears throat> we have a uh, therapy session with the patient preoperatively most of the times, and you can subject them to serial thumb spike casts, maybe gradually um, increase the thumb web as much as possible by passive manipulation. But sometimes we can go in and release the intermetacarpal lig ligament, the dorsal one, and then get the get to increase the abduction range of the thumb. So you will not do a tendon transfer unless you're satisfied with the full passive range of the thumb at the CMC joint. So you can be, bring it to good opposition passively. Then only your opposition plasty can be successful. So preoperative therapy and if required, a proper surgical thumb web release to get a passive range. That's very important. And uh, one more quick question was about the the ulna handshake, as I call it, you know, because it's a non-phasic transfer. You're taking this across from the ulna side. Uh, do you, any, any tips to avoid getting the ulna bundle involved in your, in your um, repair? Or is that just the skill of your tunneling? Do you use anything special or any tips on that particular aspect? You And we aim, you, we can feel the FCU tendon as we are doing the um, passing the tunneler. And it's the feel that you get that you're not going deep to the FCU tendon. You're going around the FCU tendon and around the ulna and superficial to the FCR, ECR on the dorsum. So the, as you're pushing it, you know that you're going in the right plane and you can also feel the tip of the tunnel going in the right direction. So yeah, we've not had an injury of the ulna no, so far, as far as I yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Manoj, do you want to um, take questions? <laughs> Dr. Ashwan. Yeah, one, one of my question to Dr. Samuel is, uh, uh, when we harvest the extensor indices, uh, do you go to the extensor expansion or take it away from the, just short of the extensor expansion? Mm. It's on the radial side, on the ulnar side of the uh, ulnar side sagittal band region. So we just make, make a slight V extension into the sagittal band to get slightly longer length, but we don't go completely into the full length of the sagittal band. Uh, partial entry into the ulnar sagittal band does not cause any, any problems in our experience. And uh, we usually allow even the index finger movement straight away after surgery because EI is different from EDC. So yeah, so we do extend, make a slight V extension into the sagittal band so we can get a slightly extra length. You give an insertion only to the APB or a second insertion also is given? Insertion in the APB capsular region, and if it's long enough, we uh, put it over to the dorsum, to the extensor hood region, so that can give you more pronation also. And also, yeah, the, if you have it longer, it's preferable to lay it on to the extensor hood on the dorsum. Uh, questions are coming in, uh, which is great. So a uh, question to Dr. Ashworth, what, what do you do if the uh, palmaris longus is absent? for EPL or EPB reconstruction. And, and the other question is, uh, how, do you, how do you balance the tension between uh, the, balance the, the lack of excursion between the FCR and the EDC? Would you make use of the TNO DCs effect uh, when you're adjusting your tension? Yeah, I was uh, expecting this question. So what you saw in the video was I was giving um, full tension to the EDC. So uh, once you give the full attention, then only you pass, you place your fingers in uh, flexion at the IP joint and neutral extension at the MP and uh, breast. And then you pull on the proximal side, uh, the uh, EDC uh, completely. And then you tunnel uh, the FCR uh, just proximal to the, uh, the retinaculum. So the important thing is that the tendon has to be kept out and uh, the finger position has to be uh, kept like this. So by doing that uh, and the tension which I mentioned, uh, somewhere just in between full tension and uh, complete relaxation, uh, you can actually adjust. Does okay. that answer, sir? Here. Thank you. Yes, that answers very well. Uh, what do you do when the palmaris longus is absent? Yeah, if, uh, of course, we sometimes use the FDS. FDS is one of the choice of the ring finger. 
if the little finger is available we would uh, use the little finger uh, fds that would be the alternative apart from the fcr and the pronated degrees can i give an answer for that um yes when the palmaris longus is absent um and you this get this kind of scenarios in brachial plexus injuries where the donors are very minimal so we have included the epl also into the fcu transfer um so the fingers and the thumb extend together but um, we have also tried doing a split fcr transfer fcr tendon muscle can be split up into uh, two tendons right down till the muscle belly and they are supposed to act independently giving you both extension of the thumb as well as extension of the in fingers independently so we have some cases of split fcr transfer which can be tried when you have only one tendon for fingers and the thumb it is this is a common question asked in exam so i have a very good answer to this to tell yeah. all the students we teach that you have to tell there are three options so option number 1 is you can split the fcu itself and attach to the epl that is one second one you can do an in continuity transfer to the digitorum and the epl which has been told by alkatan that it gives equally good result and third one is you can use the fds so if you tell these three full marks in exams <laughs> so uh, dr thatte had a question and maybe after that we will wind up this session as we are on uh, we have completed so my, my question has been answered but can yeah. i just add one more thing yes sir the middle finger fds yes it sir it is considered superior because it's considered more independent than the other fds is the only one which takes origin from the radius therefore there is a very old paper on this i think in prs or yes sir APS, and that is why yeah. middle finger is a Correct, yeah they say uh, actually there somebody some mention was there that it has got uh, the best cerebral control also but in when we are using it for closer so in a claw hand patient is already doing the fds function before the mcp flexion yeah. so when so you take an fds you are just shifting the pip flexion to mcp flexion so maybe that much independence is not required so it works and fds uh, fds of the ring finger actually uh, works equally good so i think we we may choose it based on the level of injury and now we go on to the next session which is about the miscellaneous talks and uh, in that the first will be the most uh, complex of the topics for all the hand surgeons which is the complex regional pain syndrome and we have got a very apt speaker to address all our concerns there and i welcome the moderators of this session dr parag dr ajit and dr subhashni to take over and take care of the session thank you uh, thanks dr pravin and i thank indian hand society for giving us uh, opportunity to moderate this session uh, here i welcome dr jonathan hobby and dr jeremy field to talk on the most common topic that every hand surgeon or orthopedic surgeon or a plastic surgeon he who would like to run away from the situation if we face complex regional pain syndrome without wasting time i would like to welcome vice president of british society of surgery of hand dr jonathan habi also recognized that. in a landmark good afternoon we're going to spend the next 15 minutes considering complex regional pain syndrome the syndrome was first described by Alexander Denmark a British naval surgeon that worked in the Hasler hospital in Portsmouth he presented a case report of a soldier with a bullet wound to his upper arm causing a radial nerve injury the wound healed quickly but the patient was troubled by ongoing pain the syndrome was also recognized in a landmark publication after the american civil war by silas weir mitchell the book reported on lessons learned from the management of gunshot wounds with a particular focus on nerve injuries he reported characteristic changes in skin texture and color with chronic pain wasting and stiffness he also described the psychological consequences of chronic pain paul sudex subsequently described characteristic radiographic changes with osteopenia in a report to the German Society of Surgery in 1900 the syndrome has had various names over the years 
and it remains a controversial diagnosis. Searching on Google, I found over three and a half million hits, which were equally distributed between patient support groups, lawyers and health providers. A population survey in the Netherlands published 15 years ago described a surprisingly high incidence of CRPS. <coughs> Dr. Chris Bass, a liaison psychiatrist from Oxford, for whom I have huge respect, has questioned whether CRPS is a helpful name uh, for the syndrome. Paco del Pinal from Santander has suggested that the diagnosis of type 1 CRPS should be abandoned. Published research has described similar, if less severe symptoms, when the risks of normal volunteers were immobilized. Unexplained and prolonged disabling pain is the cardinal symptom. The pain is typically out of proportion to the injury and it becomes more severe with time. Patients describe hyperalgesia and allodynia, which is pain in response to a normal stimulus. There are also usually vasomotor changes. The pain, swelling and colour changes may be associated with changes in skin texture and increased sweating. There also may be increased hair and nail growth and later in the disease it's quite common for stiffness to develop. This is an example of early changes with swelling, increased sweating and colour changes. In this patient there's marked swelling and redness. The degree of swelling is such that a differential diagnosis should include the possibility of a factitious disorder with application of a tourniquet. The shiny skin and chlorine seen here are characteristic of the later stages of the disease in more severe cases. Diagnostic criteria were agreed by the International Association for the Study of Pain at a consensus conference in Budapest in 2004. Symptoms and signs are divided into four domains, pain, vasomotor changes, edema or sweating, and trophic or motor changes. To satisfy the Budapest criteria, a patient should have symptoms in three of the categories and physical signs in two of the four categories. CRPS has been classified in two types, depending on, upon whether or not there is an associated nerve injury. CRPS usually follows trauma, including surgery. It's much more common in women and peaks in middle age. It's commoner in the upper limb and is associated with smoking. The commonest precipitating injury is a fracture. Estimates of incidents vary widely and the role of psychological factors is controversial. My co-presenter, Jeremy Field, published an elegant study looking at the pre-injury psychological status of patients with distal radius fracture. He found no association between those that developed C CRPS and pre-injury psychological distress. In terms of investigations, there are visible temperature changes on thermography and increased uptake on isotope bone scans. The Royal College of Physicians in the United Kingdom has published a multidisciplinary guideline to the management of CRPS. Fortunately, CRPS resolves spontaneously in the majority of patients, but there is limited evidence of benefit from medical management. There is a huge range of treatments proposed for CRPS, although the evidence of effectiveness is rather sparse. There is some published evidence to support physical therapy, oral steroids in acute CRPS, bisphosphonates and low-dose ketamine in early disease, and spinal cord stimulation for severe chronic cases. There is little robust evidence for any of the other proposed treatments. 
it can all be rather confusing. I'll outline my own approach. I do use the diagnosis of CRPS and believe it's quite common. It varies in severity. I most commonly see it following conservative treatment of distal radius fractures. Fortunately, most recover within a few months. The best treatment is prevention, and I believe that good perioperative pain relief is important. You should avoid tight dressings and be aware of the risk of acute nerve compression, most often carpal tunnel syndrome. I avoid immobilization when possible and urge patients to stop smoking. In my practice, explanation and reassurance are the bedrock of management, both prevention and managing established CRPS. The patient needs to be engaged with their treatment and have an understanding of the likely pain and symptoms so they're confident to rehabilitate. If someone does develop CRPS, good analgesia is important, but I try to avoid long-term opiates. I encourage function and uh, am reliant on my hand therapists. I often prescribe nortriptyline, but if I'm reaching the stage of considering gabapentin, I would get the pain team involved. Uh, vitamin C uh, is controversial, but is at least harmless. Uh, and I think there may be potential for bisphosphonate and ketamine. Thank you for your attention. I'm now going to hand over to Jeremy Field. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, have we got Jeremy or has, has Jeremy fallen by the wayside? <laughs> I just called him. I think uh, he is not yet logged in. So maybe we can uh, have some questions for you, Jonathan, till then. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, yes, yes, Dr. Prabhu. Dr. Jonathan, may I know your views about considering carpal tunnel release for CRPS patients? Because recently, article from Spain, uh, it does about if we consider a carpal tunnel release for all CRPS patients, they do better. May I know your views on that? Um, I think that... Uh... I would favor carpal tunnel release if they've got carpal tunnel syndrome. I don't think you can operate your way out of CRPS. So I think, um, you know, if, if there's a distal radius fracture or some plausible cause of swelling, I would usually try a steroid injection first. So if I see somebody with CRPS, particularly after distal radius fracture, and I'm suspicious that they've got carpal tunnel, you can inject them in the first clinic appointment and if that provides relief, if they have ongoing symptoms, then absolutely I would suggest carpal tunnel release. But I don't think carpal tunnel release is a cure for all CRPS. And I think in these patients, you have to be really careful about planning surgery. Uh, surgery has to have a clear objective. So I think if you operate too much, you cause trouble. Um, but on the other hand, if you avoid operating for things that can be uh, that will benefit, uh, so, so I think there's a balance to be struck. Does that answer the question? Yeah. So uh, what is your idea about uh, this? I don't believe that there is no CRPS. Well, I think if you use brachial plexus analgesia, so patients have good uh, anesthesia, very little pain. If you spend a lot of time with them in the clinic before you start, so they understand what's going on. Um, if you're a very skillful surgeon and you see them a lot post-operatively, I think your incidence of CRPS will be very low. I think the problem, for me, the problem arises with an anxiety, I think is really important. So if you have patients who are anxious, they don't understand what's going on, they get pain post-operatively and then they don't move their hand, uh, I think they're the ones that are at greatest greatest risk um so i think if they see a lot of the doctor the doctor reassures them and and they move the hand um i think it's much less likely yeah. um so it may well be that paco gives his patients paco. such a good service uh, that he sees crps very rarely but i think where you get a frightened lady who's had a, a painful manipulation of a distal radius fracture 
She goes into a cast that's a bit tight. She doesn't really understand what's going on uh, and she doesn't use her hand. Uh, that, that's a really potent mixture in terms of CRPS, in my <coughs> view. I mean, it, it may be, but it is all uh, uh, a consequence of not moving your hand. So it, it may be that it doesn't exist and it's just uh, immobility with swelling. Um, but I, I think arguing about the minutiae of the definition is probably not helpful for the patients. Yeah. Dr. Hobi, uh, what do you, do you think a patient having a history of CRPS in the past is prone to get same problem in subsequent operations? Uh, I treat them as if they are. So I will operate on patients who have CRPS, um, but uh, I think you need to spend more time with them preoperatively. You have to be really, really sure that the procedure you're doing has a high chance of benefiting them. Um, and uh, I would try and ensure they have regional blockade. There are some anaesthetists I work with who will who uh, do chronic pain. So they give them various concoctions preoperatively. I tend to give them vitamin C. It may do no good, but at least uh, they feel they're doing something. And I would really strongly urge them to stop smoking. Uh, and I, I would make extra efforts uh, to see them regularly during their, their post-op. So I think you have to approach them with cautious, a caution but I think as long as the indications for surgery are correct and, and you are careful, um, uh, I don't think you need to be too frightened. Okay, so Parag is back now. Another thing, uh, uh, Dr. Paco says that he does carpal tunnel release and all the CRPS goes off, but I have seen some patient offer carpal tunnel release having a CRPS. So what do you say about that? I say what I said before, which is if you're sure they've got carpal tunnel, do an operation, but I would not do a carpal tunnel release unless there was a good evidence. And often the best, you can do nerve conduction studies if you can get them quickly, but a very easy way of confirming what's going on is to give them a steroid injection. And if they get some relief of their symptoms, that's safe, you can do it in clinic. Um, if they get some relief of their symptoms, if it all goes away and it's fine, then that's fine. But if they have some persistent symptoms, then absolutely I'd do a carpal tunnel release. But it's uncommon in my practice. Uh, I think it's a mistake to just think if somebody's got CRPS, they need another operation. Sure. The other thing that I've found really helpful, and I use a lot, is nortriptyline. So I think if somebody has CRPS, you give them a lot of opiates. That often really doesn't help. It creates another problem. But my experience, I'll prescribe nortriptyline myself without resorting to the pain clinic. And you need to tell them it'll take a week or two to work. Uh, but I think that I've found that to be really helpful. I think the evidence suggests bisphosphonates might be helpful, but I haven't used them. Although if you look at the literature, that, that I think there may well be a role for those. Okay, thank you, Dr. Hobby. Now we'll go to the next talk, which is about the serratus anterior palsy. Again, a very difficult problem to manage, especially the diagnosis of it and at what time we should intervene. Let us see what Hi, Dr. C.Y. Hi, this is C.Y. Ong from Wrightington Hospital. Thank you for the invitation. As hand surgeons, we are sometimes called upon to manage patients with serratus anterior palsy due to its implication of the long thoracic nerve. But what are the pitfalls of assessments and management? This is a 40-year-old gentleman who suffered from a flu-like illness. Two weeks later, he woke up with severe right shoulder pain. At three months, he presented with clear winging of his right scapula. About 12 months later, you can see evidence of resolution of the scapular winging. Many of you will recognize that. This is a classical case of Parsonage-Turner syndrome or neuralgic air myotrophy. However, not all patients would necessarily follow this course. In clinical examination, we rely on wall press tests to demonstrate the prominence of the scapula involved. In this gentleman with EMG-proven serratus anterior palsy, you can see that 
The scapular winging is only apparent on certain position of the arm. So wall press test is not foolproof. Rather, motion is key to clinical assessment. Pay particular attention to descent of the arm where scapular dyskinesia is most obvious. We will come back to this patient later. In 1948, Parsonage and Turner provided a classical description of the condition which has since been named after them. The potential pitfall of diagnosis lies in the fact that uh, the diagnosis is assumed without any uh, investigations. As you can see in this series of 60 patients who presented with some form of neurological concern to a shoulder clinic, neurologic amyotrophy turned out not to be the most common diagnosis at the end. So there are many mimics out there, such as this patient, who on first look appear to be straightforward serratus anterior palsy on the right side. But in fact, he also shows signs of increased lumbar lordosis, reverse pec crease signs. However, he does not have any facial muscle weakness. For following further investigations, particularly the genetic test confirmed that this was in fact a case of fascia scapular humeral dystrophy. Another case where the patient first presented with right shoulder girdle pain and scapular winging. But further examination revealed wasting of the forearm muscles, and this prompted further uh, investigation in the form of MRI scan of the neck. As you can see, he had a clear cervical disc prolapse. He was then referred to the neurosurgical service and underwent ACDF. Following surgery, he recovered very well. Key examination, key investigation for this group of patients is neurophysiology, particularly the EMG of the involved muscle. Radiological testings are guided or dictated by clinical features. You can see in this example, there is thinning and atrophy of serratus anterior on the left side of the screen compared to preserved thickness on the other side. If you are suspicious of hereditary neurologic amyotrophy where there has been recurrent attacks, there is a genetic marker. If you are thinking of potential myopathic disorders, I urge you to involve a neurologist where a battery of uh, further tests can be organized. So the differential diagnosis of neurologic amyotrophy should include traumatic nerve injuries, myopathy, spinal pathology, and iotrid nerve injury, which should be obvious from the uh, history. The assumption about the natural history of neurologic air myotrophy has always been a benign one. So is this assumption about spontaneous recovery in two years always true? Historical series, including those from Parsonage Turner, reported very favorable outcomes. However, more recent publications, such as this one, with 37 patients with a median follow-up of 18 years, show that one in five of the patients still have some degree of winging in the long term. Almost half of them still experience some pain. In this series of 246 patients with neurologic amyotrophy, approximately two-thirds of them who will follow up for over three years still experience persistent pain and weakness. So, neurologic air myotrophy or serratus anterior palsy or long thoracic nerve palsy may not necessarily be benign and self-resolving. The mainstay of treatment still lies with analgesia and physiotherapy. In the acute stage, multiple painkillers may be required and a short period of rest in a sling may be helpful for those with fairly severe pain. The role of high dose steroids and immunotherapy remain controversial. Steroid when given at the right time may shorten the duration of pain, but it may not necessarily uh, change the cause of the disease. In the second phase, physiotherapy should focus on maintaining range of movement, strengthening re muscle and addressing secondary issue from uh, compensatory muscle activity. 
in those with persistent paralysis, despite a period of non-operative treatments, there is potential role of neurolysis of the long thoracic nerve. Tendon transfer is reserved as a salvage. This provides a snapshot of the publications on the results of long thoracic nerve neurolysis. Overall, favorable outcomes have been reported. This was the patient that I alluded to at the beginning. And you can see following neurolysis of the long thoracic nerve, scapular winging has resolved. So in conclusion, when assessing a patient with serratus anterior palsy, accurate diagnosis is key. Employ ancillary tests, particularly neurophysiology, in confirming the diagnosis. Have a low threshold for onward referral to a neurologist, particularly when um, faced with a patient with atypical features. Analgesia and physiotherapy remain the mainstay of treatment but there is an emerging role of nerve surgery in selected patients. Thank you. Uh, that was a nice talk. So may I ask uh, uh, the moderators to discuss this topic, topic straight away? Thank you, sir. Thank you for the nice talk. Um, uh, regarding the neurolysis of the long thoracic nerve, uh, what part of the nerve uh, I have, there, there are some reports saying the distal part of the nerve alone neuralized is in a, what's your take on it, sir? Uh, hi, thank you for the question. In fact, thank you for allowing me to talk about this topic, Robin. Um, I routinely start from the thoracic portion of the long thoracic nerve. Um, so, so far I've done about 40 and out of those, I have had to go and explore the neck in about half a dozen of them. But I, those who recovered did very well. They did so after the thoracic decompression. So my the patients that I have treated, somehow they responded to the thoracic part very well. There are some exceptions. I have several where they have clear in accident or trauma to the neck. Then I would actually explore the supraclavicular plexus at the same time. So how... how how early you consider for the external neurolysis in case of uh, L chain paralysis? Could you repeat that? Yes. So my question is how early you will consider external neurolysis for the long thoracic nerve in case of SA palsy? Uh, uh, generally, about a year of uh, conservative management will be advised. There have been exceptions. Uh, there have been a couple of patients who are really struggling. So I did them uh, just after six months, but after the consultation. But as a rule, I would advise them to wait for nine to 12 months. The reason being, during the same period, I have also managed many patients conservatively. And those who recover by themselves tend to do so by nine to 12 months. There were a few who recover from 12 to 18 months. But that, that was a small proportion. So... If you were going to recover well, you, you have a good prognostic factors, you would do so within the first year. Now, I have a few very long uh, who presented very late. If you had winging beyond three years, I can say virtually there's no chance of spontaneous recovery. Okay. okay. So what is, what is your upper limit of uh, doing neuro? You will consider this neurolysis is not going to helpful. Now we should consider for the tendon transfer. Yes, uh, if I may use a carpal tunnel decompression as an analogy, given that we are all hand surgeons. So I think sometimes patients present very late, but because carpal tunnel decompression in, in our hands is relatively, um, you know, we are confident and low mobility. The thoracic decompression of long thoracic nerve now, um, it, in my hands actually is associated with very little mobility. So for those who have even up to five or six years, for instance, the case that I show you, it was after a rugby tackle. That was the recall incidence. Now, whether it was truly related to the rugby tackle, one is not sure, but that was the reported incidence. He had winging for several years, but that post-op was actually a matter of weeks. In fact, he recovered very soon after that. So I would offer them, but obviously I'll be more guarded with the likelihood of recovery if uh, they have winging for a long time. Can I ask a question, Praveen? Yes, that is, sir. Yes, sir. Ask, sir. 
Hi, Sivai. Yes, hi, hi, hi. Nice to see you again, Dr. <laughs> so, I have two questions for you. If your electrophysiology shows complete denervation, will neurolysis work? Because then there is, you need to nerve transfer, right? Um, the nerve transfer one, I, I have to say, uh, I was very, um, I was very enthusiastic initially, and I have done two in my in my in my forty so cases. Then I changed my mind based on one of them, n equals to one. There was one patient who had no activation at all, really bad. He was a chef; he couldn't work, so he banged and banged. I said, "Okay, I'll decompress it and see what happened." At a time of stimulation, there was up to maximum stimulation, 6 milliamp. There was no contraction at all. So we previously discussed, okay, I'll do a, so I transfer a thoracal dorsal and do side. Mm -hmm. Because obviously I still want to, hopefully it will, rego it will grow from the top. So I did an end to side. And by six weeks, he, he recovered. So I knew that it was not from the end to side transfer. I didn't downgrade his lat because it was just a branch. So from that case, I really, I, I started asking myself, this is not the same as brachial plexus injury. This is a sick nerve. We, we apply the knowledge we gain from brachial plexus injury. We treat them like cut nerve or traumatized nerve. But I have to admit that I don't think we fully understand this business with long thoracic nerve palsy. It's, it's, it's a form of sick nerve. My second question is, what is the preferred tendon transfer? Uh, uh, the, the preferred transfer is a standard one. It was using the pack major, but the truth is, in my series, uh, there's a proportion who recovered, and then there are several of them who have been referred pack major. And then once they know what is involved, uh, in fact, they chose to accept the partial recovery. Thank you. Okay. They have that not a, yes. transfer. Okay, thank you. There we, is a question in yes. the chat box, sir. Yes, like uh, how commonly you see this. And uh, have you uh, diagnosed it when patient come only with shoulder pain without any winging of the scapula? Right, how common? I, I, I think I'm very honored and I'm very um, very privileged. I work with, uh, in writing that I have many shoulder colleagues who refer these patients to me and I'm also very supported by my colleagues in the region. So um, many of my colleagues in the country would refer these patients to me. So. I have now over a hundred patients, so the, the series will be published later this year with the full details. So that's why I'm limited in how much I, I'm sharing in terms of tables, but the full description of the hundred page of the first hundred patients uh, will be published later this year. Um, so what was the second part of the question? Um, how common whether you see, So obviously this talk is just focusing on um, the serratus anterior and parsonage turner syndrome on neuralgic and myotrophy can affect many other muscles as well. But long thoracic nerve is by far the commonest. You, you can I also, in my series of other parsonage turner patients, trapezius can be affected. And then there's also the distal one, like the AIN and PIN. So there's also lots of digital, digital movements. There's a very rare one that I've seen two cases, isolated brachialis wasting. In fact, the muscular cutaneous is involved, but somehow the brachial is, is taken out and then there is relative preservation of the biceps. Both of those cases recovered by themselves. And uh, can you please comment about the palliative procedure like scapular thoracic fusion? Um, I reserve those for the myopathic patients. So we have a small group of patients with a fascial scapular humeral dystrophy, and that is an established treatment for them. Um, but otherwise, uh, I have one patient who had a very severe winging after decompression. There was no recovery, but then she, she eventually went to another uh, surgeon who offered her scapular thoracic fusion, which really good alignment. Nonetheless, she continued with pain. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank we'll you. go to the next talk yeah. now, which is about uh, ambulatory pathway during COVID. Something uh, it will be interesting in these COVID times. Hello, and thank you for inviting me to speak and give my experiences with an ambulatory pathway during COVID. I'm Mike Hayden from Wrightington Hospital uh, in England. 
So this wouldn't be possible without the pioneering work of Don Lalonde, who we're all familiar with his work using adrenaline in the hand and also developing lean and green minimal draping. His uh, ambulatory theatre has no additional air changes. Uh, we know uh, one of my colleagues is naming this N.A. Wallens because we don't need an anaesthetist. So the effect of COVID has been a reduction in the capacity, both on beds, but also on our staff, uh, with the nursing staff and anaesthetists being required to, to combat COVID. Uh, most of our elective work has now stopped uh, in, the, uh, in the various lockdowns. Trauma has become increasingly non-operative, but we are starting to now use well on techniques, particularly in an ambulatory environment, when we have difficulty to get into the main operating theatre. My private hospital has had an ambulatory theatre or a, a ambulatory procedure room for, for many years, and we were able to get operating on ambulatory cases as soon as lockdown ended. And I really wanted to replicate this in the, uh, in the NHS. We were developing huge waiting lists and it was causing ethical dilemmas where patients could self-pay to get their surgery in the private sector, but were unable to access surgery in the NHS. So I had to collect my evidence to take it to my, uh, to my NHS managers, my own data from the private sector, from the evidence of Don Lalonde, the Oxford experience with their ambulatory theatre, and then two papers by our ex-fellows, John Harrison looking at Dupatrons in an ambulatory setting and the cost savings in particular, but also the pioneering work of Ben Deans looking at his Corona Hands uh, paper showing that surgery, particularly under local anaesthetic, was extremely safe during the pandemic. I did have some initial frustrations trying to engage with the senior management team uh, to get this off, uh, off, the, uh, off the ground. But eventually, uh, having found the right finance person who had a particular hand problem, and once we sorted that out, we were able to uh, open the door and get moving quite quickly. And we opened up the ambulatory pathway just before December. It's an initial three month pilot, which we're coming to an end of, and it's, it's the, the concepts have been completely and utterly proven and bought into. So the facility, um, I'll describe our facility, but you'll have to work out your own space. Ours was a, uh, an operating theater that wasn't particularly being used. It was laminar flow. There's three protected car parking spaces right next to the building where the patients arrive. We text them when we're ready for them. Uh, they walk into an admission area. They're seen by a nurse in a reclining chair. Minimal paperwork is, uh, is performed. They go through into the theater, local anesthetics put in, the surgery happens, and then they come back to the recovery area on our discharge home very soon. Uh, we're about to move into a new, a new facility, which has got a one-way, purely circular route, so there'll be certainly no cross-mixing uh, or crossing of patients in corridors. The staff is quite minimal, really. You need one trained nurse and one untrained nurse to receive and uh, recover the patients. We've simplified our paper pathways significantly. And in theatre, we just have one surgeon, perhaps a surgeon and a trainee, one or two scrub nurses and a runner. We started this often as a green pathway. All patients have been COVID tested for, with PCRs, three day self-isolation. We started off with th simple cases, injections, carpal tunnel, trigger fingers and dequervins. We've now performed patient satisfaction survey, which is showing extremely high uh, um, uh, patient satisfaction. We've got large waiting lists and we've started to pool our patients so that no patients are disadvantaged from this facility. We suggest uh, staggered admissions and we start at eight in the morning and generally speaking finish by five o'clock. We've uh, divided the surgery up into units of time, an injection under x-ray controls 15 minutes from the time they walk into theater till they walk out of theater. And I think you'll agree that's quite generous. Two units of time, two units of time for a simple procedure, carpal tunnel or a trigger. And then three units of time, perhaps for a bilateral carpal tunnel, a simple one-digit dupatrons or a trapeziectomy. And then you can build that unit of time up depending on case complexity and how fast or how slow you might be as a surgeon. Staff engagement is really important. Some colleagues aren't keen on Wallens and that's fine. Some surgeons are, are, are quite happy uh, doing this. And I think there's a training element, so it may be worth some of your colleagues who aren't particularly keen just scribbling with you just to watch what, what you're doing. And it's really important to get dedicated ambulatory staff, both from bookings, from the, uh, the nurses, and also the theatre. We reduce that paperwork right down 
uh, just for a walk-in, walk-out type procedure. This is what you can get done on a list, and I think most people would agree that's a pretty decent um, ambulatory type list, a trapeziectomy, a couple of IP fusions, a couple of Jupitrons, bilateral carpal tunnel, uh, one of which is a revision. Staggered admissions, really generous, and then just uh, reduce those times as you get more and more confidence with the procedures. But what is important is that you do all one side first, then bilaterals, then do the other side. This has an advantage of uh, certainly speeding up the throughput. You're not having to move the arm table from one side to the other. And it's also well received by the nursing staff who don't have to keep carrying the, uh, the arm table one side to the other and uh, reduce their manual handling. And you obviously do the bilateral in the middle. Advantages, we're all familiar with the advantages of wide awake surgery. It's here to stay now. I've changed my job plan. I do one week ambulatory, one week in main theater, and I flip. Patients have got no pain when they get back to recovery, no post-op bleeding, and they can go home more or less immediately. We're now getting trapeziectomies in and out of the building in about an hour and 10 minutes. Advantages are no beds are required, no anesthetists required. We can get feedback so we can test a repair, test a gapping on a flexor tendon, any catching. And there's certainly cost reductions and the Harrison paper has shown that. Here's a few examples uh, over and above the simple stuff such as um, carpal tunnels. So this is a wallant. This is a trapeziectomy. Um, Not much bleeding. Uh, space. And the important thing here is on table, we can assess for proximal migration of the metacarpal. By asking the patient to grip their little finger to their their little finger to the tip of their thumb and gripping. Um, I usually put my little finger in uh, and then put your thumb to your little finger. So there's no, it doesn't squeeze down on my little finger. Uh, and again, put your thumb to your little finger. And you can see there, as tight as you can squeeze, that space no is well maintained. Uh, fasciectomy, uh, one finger on the left, uh, two fingers on the right. Left this as an open palm. The patient had an old rotatory deformity from an old fracture. But you can see fingers are a little bit uh, blanched. That will all pick up. And, and really, by the end of the procedure, there's minimal uh, ongoing oozing. Wrist arthroscopy, um, xylocaine into the portals. Uh, we can do this dynamically as well with a slightly different uh, finger grip. Uh, Arthrex have brought out a new nanoscope, which is particularly uh, well suited for an ambulatory procedure. Joint replacements, this is a sialastic MCP, this is the trial, we can assess Straight range down. of movement, right. stability. Right. Flexor tendons, we can start the rehab in the operating room or in the ambulatory room. Here the wrist is flexed forward, showing them what's, what's needed to protect the repair. Full active movement, no, no catching, nice fluid movement, and then full flexion. This is a pulley injury at a climber, blown out all the pulleys. The lateral wings are still intact of the pulley, so we can use those and uh, use the mutet technique of taking some extensor retinacillin from the back of the wrist and suturing them over, uh, giving them new pulleys. We can test for bowstringing, uh, on table, and range of movement. So we'll take now. And this is a golfer with an ECU stabilization that can be performed while and uh, this is the end of the procedure, the full procedures on, uh, on view many, and this is the uh, closing down that bed space that was first uh, uh, described by Ross. Tendon transfers, very, very straightforward, wallant. This is a little bit loose and it's very easy just to, to tighten up that pulvertaf uh, weave so you get just the right amount of tension. So the future, at present we're green. We may be moving to a yellow and ambulatory where the patients aren't. Uh, aren't uh, COVID swabbed. It's a pretty safe COVID environment. There's a lot of space. Uh, it's a circular pathway. We're all wearing masks and there's uh, positive ventilation with laminar flow. So, so in many ways, it's, uh, it's safer than uh, going to the dentist where obviously you're not, uh, you're not tested. I think you should extend your indications within your own comfort. We should in due course challenge the 15 air uh, change dogma. Um, uh, given the uh, Canadian data, and I think we should all try and be more lean and green with minimal draping for cost and the environment. Thank you for your attention, and uh, if you've got any questions, I'd be more than happy to, uh, to, to answer them.
Brilliant talk, Mike. Dr. Mike. So I have a question uh, for you. Uh, what are the changes you have felt pre-COVID era and uh, after the, I mean, the now in valent surgery? Or what are the uh, protocols you have changes which was not in the pre-COVID era and now you have considered especially in the valent surgery? Thanks. Um, for me, in the private sector, nothing's changed. I've been doing valent surgery for over 10 years. Um, and it was just um, trying to, to challenge the NHS um, resistance to change. Unfortunately, um, we got the right person. And one of the finance people had a hand problem that would be immediately suitable for Wallant. Um, he acted on it very quickly. We had support then. Um, we've done a pilot. It's proved, proved to be an enormous success. And, um, and hopefully now that will get dedicated lists going going forwards i think one of the challenges is is with your colleagues um, just trying to them get them to adopt this it's really important that you don't push it too much because some people you know don't like blood and uh, they prefer a tourniquet which is absolutely fine but i think for the next year at least we're going to have huge challenges with waiting list and um, there is a training element to this and certainly to my last two fellows who've been extremely good fellows, um, way above average, have adopted this and they're very, very comfortable doing complex Jupitron surgery with Wallant without a tourniquet. You know, it might take them an hour, hour and a quarter. Um, but so, so that's the, the, the main change, you know, is getting the NHS to, to, to listen, but then a training implication for your, um, for your colleagues and, and trainees coming through. Dr. Mike, uh, how, how, how do you manage the field sterility especially in the patients who um, uh, you're suspecting as a COVID positive or a uh, COVID patient? So um, in the NHS, these are all on a green pathway. So they've all been PCR tested and then self-isolated for three days. In the private sector, ever since first lockdown ended, we were on an amber pathway and none of those okay. patients were tested. Um, we as, as clinicians were tested uh, twice a week. Uh, with lab, uh, well, with PCR um, initially, um, and we didn't have any reports of patients getting COVID-related problems associated with their visit to us. So our, our main worry is is the, our NHS staff are very worried about um, operating on patients on an amber pathway, but as they're getting more and more vaccinated now, and I think once they have their second dose of vaccination, our our theatre staff and our um, our nursing staff should be very reassured that that risk is now minimal and we should then adopt a, a co uh, an amber pathway where they're not tested. Okay. Thank Dr. Ajit, can I ask the question? Yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah. May I know, uh, Dr. Mike, do you have NSTP standby? <clears throat> so it's a, it's a really good question and that was one of the uh, hurdles that we had to get over initially. Uh, in the private sector, I always have an anaesthetist present with me who gets remunerated by either the patient or the insurance companies. In the NHS, there is always an anaesthetist somewhere in the complex or in the hospital. And of course, we all have a crash team available. I, I always look at this as the analogy of being in a dentist. We go into dentists for you know, one hour procedures. They're using similar doses, uh, similar drugs to us, and there's no anaesthetist in, in most dental practices. So I'm quite happy to operate on these um, for patients under local anaesthetic without an anaesthetist present or even in the facility. Um, if a patient has a cardiac arrest, it's probably just as likely for that to have occurred in their supermarket as it is in the ambulatory theater. And provided we've got an appropriate arrest team to deal with that, I'm sure we'll be fine. But it's a, it, it is one of the challenges you will face. Anaesthetists um, have adopted this very well actually um clearly there, there's a lot of their work is now going away and the surgeons are putting the local anesthetic in but particularly during covid they've realized that this is a necessity it's a very safe thing for us to do and and most of them haven't felt uh, intimidated or threatened by it whatsoever and are actually applauding what we can do because it's clearly safer than a regional block and safer than a general anesthetic Okay, Dr. Sue has uh, some questions. She has raised hand. Yes, madam. 
Uh, hi, Mike. Thanks. Hi. A really excellent talk. Um, can I just ask, uh, Mike, uh, do you send your patients home when they uh, or do you wait for them to colour up and what sort of advice do you give them? It's a, a really good question, Sue. And thanks and congratulations on your presence. Um, we um, let them go home with a white finger. No problem at all. Um, it will reperfuse over the next hour or two. Um, we've given them a dedicated phone number uh, on the ambulatory. If they've got any concerns, they can phone up at any time. Uh, the Jupitrons do sometimes get quite white, but I always tell my trainees that at the end of a Jupitron, if you, if, you, if you just squeeze the tip of the finger, that might be white. If there's some rebound, then that finger's absolutely fine. But if when you press the tip, the pulp of a finger at the end of a Jupitron, and it stays concave, and there's no rebound, then that might, I would be a little bit more worried about that. But I've never had a case um, that I've ever been worried about uh, that's not had reversal. You know, the half-life of adrenaline is quite short. Um, we've got fentolamine around as a reversal agent, but I've never known of anybody needing to use fentolamine um, as the half-life is so, so small, so short, sorry. Thank you. So everyone. I let them go home straight away, Sue. That's Good nice. question. Yeah, thanks. Thank thanks. You, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so now uh, uh, we shall wind up this session and we'll uh, have a five minutes break now. And in the break time, uh, let us make uh, some use of this uh, break uh, with Dr. Pankaj giving us some information about the ISSH. Uh, uh, I, I have I have nothing to say. I just wanted to display this slide for benefit of everyone. Thank you. Yes, sir. You can keep it for a while. So, Parag, in uh, this meantime, is there any question which has come for the previous session? We can answer that, yeah. yes, sir. Yeah. Is Dr. Jonathan, sir, around? Dr. Hobby? I'm here. Not going yeah. anywhere. Yeah, sure, yeah, sure. Yeah. So, sir, Dr. Jonathan, may I ask you a question? In case of uh, acute uh, CRPS with suspected nerve injury with the red inflamed hand, for that I, I think it was my question audible yeah no no parag it was not audible do you mean that you wait for the redness to subside for any intervention Suppose a patient has a CRPS and the whole limb is red. Do you want? Uh, do you wait for the redness to subside, or you would operate straight away? Um, it's not a a situation. I've I've got it. I mean, I think um, I would be nervous about operating. I mean, I, I think if there's a source of pain, so carpal tunnel syndrome, if they're in a lot of pain. It may be that a simple procedure to release the nerve might help you. But I think if they've got an established nerve injury, probably I would want to give analgesia and rehab to try and get some of the swelling out of the hand and settle things down before I, I, I did a, a procedure. I think the, the impact of surgery depends on how extensive it is. So, I mean, probably some of the most difficult cases I see are where people get CRPS after complex Jupiter's surgery um, and that then you get a lot of stiffness and they don't do so well I have to say um, I mean I think if you if, if you had a nerve injury um, I don't know uh, <laughs> I think you'd, you'd have to assess it on how how severe things were. I mean, if, if they've got nerve injury, they've got nerve pain, and you can relieve the nerve pain by um, decompressing the nerve. There might be an argument for that, but my my inclination would be to 
to to wait a few weeks and try try and treat them intensively and get on top of the pain. Uh, occasionally, we bring someone into hospital for regular physio analgesia, just to try and uh, break the cycle of pain and get them uh, get them back onto an even keel. Okay, good. Thank you, everyone, for a nice interesting Thank you. session. I think, uh, Dr. Hobby, I think we did well to select this topic for discussion. You see so many questions came by. Uh, so, so, <laughs> is Sue on the line? Yeah, she's there. Yes, I'm here. Sue with the guidelines. So. Yeah, I mean, uh, the things I might just add, so, so we revised the guidelines in um, 2018, actually, and they were republished. Uh, but the things that I might add is, one, I think hand therapists are really important here because they're often following up your patients. And so actually you really need to make sure that the hand therapists are trained and that they have the Budapest criteria and they're very good. And if they have that criteria to um, mark the patient with, anybody that they're concerned about, they can bring to your attention very early on. And I think if you pick up these patients as soon as they start to develop symptoms of CRPS, so it's sort of three, four weeks often, and often there's some little clues like they keep getting uncomfortable in the cast and they keep coming back for plaster changes. Um, so I think if you can pick up these patients early at three or four weeks, and I hit them very aggressively then with analgesics, particularly um, uh, the neuromodulators, so things like gabapentin or nortriptyline, uh, then I think it, you very quickly can reverse them with some good education, analgesia, um, physio support. Um, the ones that don't reverse very quickly, so within a, few, within a couple of weeks, if they're not turning the corner, then I immediately go to MDT. So then I immediately uh, get uh, the, you know, sort of the wider specialities, particularly pain team and so on involved. But I find that I very rarely need to do that if I've picked the patient up expediently and jumped on them very quickly. C completely okay, agree. You, that's thank a, you. I would absolutely, that's exactly yes. my experience, really. Yes, yes. Thank you, uh, uh, Sue, and thanks, Dr. Hobie. Thank you, the moderators. Now we move on to the next session, which is, which again is a very interesting uh, compilation of the various different topics, which will stress on tips and tricks to get best outcome. So the first in the in the series is by Dr. Ravi Bhardwaj. He's going to talk on volar plating for the distal radius fractures. Good afternoon. I am Ravi Bhardwaj from Kolkata. And my brief today is to talk on tips and tricks to get best outcomes following volar plating for distal radius fractures. I have no conflict of interest regarding this presentation. Now, internal fixation in distal radius fractures has become very popular with the advent of volar locking plates and there's an increasing tendency to use these implants for unstable fractures of the radius because they offer the advantages of anatomical reduction, stable fixation and early mobilization. There's a plethora of designs available on the market. However, the three mantras that one should consider before fixation of these fractures are one should know the patient and the needs one should know the fracture personality and one should know the implants which is he or she plans to use. Ergonomics is very important when dealing with these fractures. It's important to uh, be seated in a comfortable position with the hand on the uh, operating side table. Bipolar diathermy helps visualization when used along with the tourniquet. Initially, a traction view and trial reduction is attempted and then once we manage to get a satisfactory reduction, we can hold the fracture reduce using provisional K wires. It is important to mark the radial pulse and the incision as this can be quite useful when the tourniquet has been inflated and you can stay out of arm's way. And the standard volar approach which you are all familiar with is used. Provisional fixation is usually done using K wires and most commonly styloid and dorsal lunate wires are used. Here's a case example of a very comminuted uh, distal radius fractures as is evidenced by the CT cuts. You can see it's very comminuted. And yet when you pull it out to length and pass three judiciously uh, pass K wires from the styloid and the dorsal uh, aspect of the distal radius, you can see that it all comes together 
and once the fixation is complete you have the option of removing the wires the kapanji wire is a very useful reduction tool here's the distal radius fracture which was initially treated uh, in a plaster cast but proceeded to displace uh, with unacceptable dorsal angulation and tilt uh, two weeks down the line and the plan was to revise it using uh, a volar locking plate so the first step to reduce the dorsal comminuted fragment was to insert a k wire using the kapanji technique which is advanced by hand into the fracture site and then levered subsequently to reduce the fragment and once that's done the k wire is driven into the proximal volar cortex and you can see that the fracture is nicely reduced on the lateral view and that all remains to be done is to put the implant when dealing with druge sigmoid notch fragment pressure on the ulnar head is a useful reduction tool let's see a case example here you can see that there is some incongruity of the druhg because the uh, ulnar sided fragment is not well reduced and what is done is use a dorsal kapanji wire uh, using the technique which i have already spoken about and the next step is to apply digital pressure using the thumb and index finger squeezing the ulnar head against the sigmoid notch and this maneuver itself affects some reduction and you can see that the position already is looking better a simple but very effective technique you can then proceed to apply your volar locking plate because the fracture is already reduced a few more technical tips the pq needs to be erased very carefully so that it can be sutured over the plate it's usually done in an inverted l shaped fashion when using home and retractors there is a wide variety and a narrow one there are two different types you should be aware of use the wide one on the radial aspect and the narrow one ulnarly this is important to avoid damage to the intraosseous membrane langenbeck retractors are useful you can see that this way you avoid piercing the intraosseous membrane repeatedly for radial styloid fragments release of the brachioradial disc might be necessary especially when you can't uh, get reduction to traction and manipulation so here is a case example you can see a displaced radial styloid fragment and after the brachioradial disc was released it was easily maneuvered into position and fixed provisionally with k wires and then you can go ahead and put the plate while dealing with plate fixation the first step usually is to position the plate centrally over the proximal fragment of the distal shaft of the radius then provisional k wires are passed to the plate k wire holes it is important to know the design of your implant in this respect most variable angle plates feature a double row of screws the concept of the double uh, subcondral support system and this allows the cortical screw to be placed to the oval hole and then the plate can be moved proximally or distally with respect to the watershed line as required you can adjust the screw length accordingly and then the distal locking screws using the variable angle feature can be used to capture all the different articular fragments while screening intraoperatively the styloid screw might appear to be intraarticular if you are not careful so all that needs to be done is to lift the forearm about 20 degree off the table and this shows that the screw is actually not within the joint while dealing with the distal radius fractures it is important to take care not to pierce the opposite cortex and sometimes one can get the erroneous impression that the screw is short of the dorsal cortex whereas because of the listed tubercle it might have actually pierced the opposite cortex so one has to take care with screw length in this regard the role of special views has been alluded to uh, literature has spoken about skyline and carpal shoot through views and these are special views which can confirm that the screws have not penetrated the opposite cortex very distal fractures like this one can require the use of a rim plate and additional capsular sutures may be passed through the plate distal k wire holes and offer more stability to the fixation as a bailout option you may keep the small fragment set and suture hangers ready this is a case example where uh, additional screw was passed in addition to the plate in an unexpected situation a contoured k wire can be used under the plate for a very distal fracture like this one and this was a wire which we bent and placed under the plate to buttress the distal fragment because we didn't have a rim plate ready 
for a volar lunate fossa fragment, you might require a separate volar lunate ulnar approach and separate fragment specific implants as in this case. So in conclusion, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, but it is important to understand that not all nails are same and therefore you should use your hammer wisely. I thank you for a very patient hearing. Yes, sir. Am I audible? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ravi sir, as usual, it's a very good lecture. Thank and, you. Uh, thank you. you <laughs> and you brought the very my famous, uh, my uh, very important topic of uh, the I, I, knew. Wire. <laughs> I knew you would like it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because uh, so my question is, uh, if there is only displacement, you use only K wires or you add with the plate by after reduction. Uh, my brief was actually to talk about tips and tricks on distal radius fractures. So basically, when you deal with, uh, you know, distal radius fractures, your decision is made preoperatively based on a number of considerations. So yes, if it is uh, simple intraarticular fractures, you know, and the bone quality is good, I won't hesitate to just use, uh, uh, you know, simple K wires uh, alone. You know, in, in India, economics is also a very important constraint and we have to take multiple factors into account. But what I would do is I would test the stability of the fixation on table, you know, and then if I was satisfied, I would leave it, you know, with a supporting cast, you know. Mm. So it depends upon bone quality and the fracture uh, geometry also. So you, if the plate is not available, the these tricks are very important. So how to get bail out the uh, uh, these things? All the uh, if you, the plate is it's not there, so you have you shown a very good tips so that you can bail out the <laughs> procedure. So nice, uh, nice uh, presentation, sir. Uh, thank you. We'll move for the uh, second presentation. Okay, thank you. So now, uh, next, I'm going to project the video of fingertip replant by Dr. Hari Venkatramani. And then in tandem, we'll uh, play the talk uh, by Dr. Ravi Mahajan by multiple digit replants, and we'll discuss both of them together then. Good morning to all of our British colleagues, and good, good afternoon to Indian members of Indian Society of Surgery of Hand. And thank you for this wonderful opportunity. To make fingertip replant successful, first of all, we need to be believe that it is worth doing it. And that is the fundamental thing to keep in mind when we see these injuries. It is the best form of reconstruction, much better than doing any flap, local or microsurgery. Aesthetic and functional restoration of the fingertip, which we can get with a replantation, far exceeds all forms of reconstruction. As seen here in a young girl, you see here there is very useful function and cosmetically just looks near normal. What makes this possible is the pressure head at the amputated level at the DIP joint is so high that if you are able to connect the artery and the vein, you will get a successful replant. So you need to understand the anatomy very well. So the lunula is the watershed line. Distal to the lunula, both the vessels coalesce and form the central artery. And proximal to the lunula, you will get two separate digital arteries. And that is how Tamai classified them into zone one and zone two. And Hirase classified them into one, two, and three. The size of the vessels at that level, the artery is 0.5 millimeters and the vein, five millimeters from the nail fold is usually around eight millimeters in size. They are very sizable. You can nicely see them under microscope and then do them. Whereas in case of zone one, there are no dorsal veins. So you'll have only the palmar veins to repair. And this makes it more difficult. The sequence is to identify the vessels, stabilize the skeleton, artery first in zone one, vein repair in zone two, and then nerve and the skin closure. The first step is to identify the structures and we find this technique to be very useful where the fingertip is stabilized between the ring and the ring fingers of both hands and you are able to work. Here you don't need an assistant. The other technique which is very useful is to take a suture through the nail plate and anchor it to the suture pack which is seen here and the assistant holds this. But now we use this technique whereby we just pass the amputated finger fingertip into a big 
forceps as seen here and the assistant just keeps rotating it to bring it in the field and you can keep dissecting it very comfortably and it is directly in the field of vision so first you identify the vein and then work towards the volar side and at the end of your dissection you should have a field like this whereby you see the, both the digital nerves both the digital artery well dissected and the dorsal vein all the structures around that that is a fibro fatty tissue has been excised which makes our field very clean and clear and also application of clamp and direct repair when we do much more comfortable we squeeze the dorsal side if you don't find the vein and you find a droplet of blood and that points to the dorsal vein the venous anastomosis on the dorsum in zone 2 is usually on the dorsal side zone 1 is the palmar side we have now started using a no clamp technique when it is very distal and the advantage of this technique is that there is no need to have extra space for application of clamp and also minimal trauma which can be caused because of the clamp is avoided the vessel dilator is the most important instrument which is needed for the microsurgical repair and we prefer 100 with 75 mm 75 micron needle for adults and 50 micron needle 110 for children in zone 1 no bony fixation is done we do the nail bed repair and this brings the vessels together and it also gives us space so we work our way from the deeper to the superficial side the artery is on the deeper side and the volar vein is on the superficial side and it also goes on to have good bony union as seen here when the nail is totally avulsed we use anchoring sutures as we do in case of a door crush injury where the dorsal side is avulsed like this and this again brings the bone in good contact and we can do the artery and the vein comfortably and that's again showing the long term outcome with good bony union when we have very difficult vessel repair this is a useful technique popularized by professor tamai where you can put a small stent inside and this stent is usually a 60 proline or a 70 proline and this is also very useful because we can see it till the end and just before the last stitch you remove it and you can get a good repair when the gap is just 3 mm in size it is also important to keep vein graft in mind bringing them together and pulling them together can sometimes cause on table there will be good pink finger but then over a period of time it will go in for thrombosis so even if the gap is 3 mm always keep vein graft in mind <clears throat> What do we do if we don't find veins? Various techniques have been described. The one we follow is doing the chemical leaching, but then you can also do an AV fistula with a vein graft as seen here, which we have not done in any of our cases. We have used in couple of cases leeches. Usually you need to put them for at least 72 hours and keep, in, uh, keep a close watch on them. This is a technique which we follow. We do the shaving of the dermis and this was first popularized also by professor kim and then keep dropping heparin on top of that so this is how it is done we put an above elbow cast the finger is shaved and then the instruction is given to scrape the raw area every 15 minutes and apply heparin drops 2500 units of heparin bolus is given at the time of clamp release and it is followed up by 5000 units of heparin over 24 hours and this is an example of artery only repair you see here we have done only one central artery and then we have just shaved the dermis and it goes on to heal well and that is the volar picture of the same finger skin closure as much as possible avoid taking too many sutures either a single stitch or no stitch also is very useful the soft tissue brings uh, very comfortably come together and they usually cover the vessels Shortening of bone when it is very close to the joint is very difficult. So most of the time you may end up doing an arthrodesis of the joint. So we don't hesitate in doing an arthrodesis if it is required. And that is a very useful technique and brings all the structures close together. When you have multiple fingertip amputations, you need to decide which one you're going to replant. Do that in the end. Before that, do all non-microsurgical reconstruction as seen here, two cross fingers and two oblique triangular flaps. And here, a single cross finger and a thumb replant. Now reconstruction, whenever we find the nerve proximally, 
you should always repair. But if you don't find the nerve, it is not a contraindication of replant. Nine of our patients, seven did not have vein repair, nerve repair, but still went on to have good sensory recovery. And this is an example. Both nerves are seen to be avulsed. And if you see at one year follow, we get a nine millimeter two point discrimination. The complications mainly involve pulp atrophy, painful scar, if there is a shortage of skin or nail deformity when the nail fold necrosis. The cause of nail fold necrosis is a tight closure on the dorsal side as seen here. If you avoid this closure, then the nail fold will not necrose and will lead to this deformity. You cannot do replants in children unless you do successful fingertip replants in adults. And that is why you need to keep doing them very often, as often as possible. And this is a one-year-old child. The size of the vessels are same as a vessels in an adult at the Tamai Zone 1. So keeping your skill levels high by doing successful replantation is of paramount importance. Keep pushing the boundaries, small step at a time, and keep pushing all the time. Thank you very much. We have the next talk, which is a similar type of talk on multiple digit replants by our president, Dr. Ravi Mahajan. We have the video. We'll play the video and then discuss both the talks. I welcome together. all the attendees of this combined CME of ISSH and the BSSH on behalf of Indian Society of Surgery of Hand. And in this CME, I'll be talking about the multiple digit uh, implantation. And you will all agree with me that the multiple digit uh, amputations are one of the most mutilating hand injuries, which pose a difficult challenge to hand and microvascular surgeons. And definitely it makes an absolute indication for uh, reimplantation. So I'll be discussing about uh, some of the important considerations for improvement of survival, as well as the functional outcome in multiple finger uh, reimplantations. One of the most important thing is that one must have a good operating microscope, preferably two, particularly if the digits of both the hands are involved. You must have good microsurgical instruments, particularly the vascular clamps, so that the unnecessary time is not wasted uh, on adjusting the clamps. And uh, it is always preferable to have two microsurgical uh, teams. The presence of a second microsurgical team can shorten the surgical time as well as reduce the primary surgeon fatigue. And as far as surgical technique is concerned, so there are two techniques which have been used for multiple digital implantation. One is digit by digit approach and the other is structure by structure uh, approach. In digit by digit approach, the main advantage is that the warm ischemia time can be significantly be reduced by storing the fingers in the refrigerator. Whereas in structure by structure technique, uh, the uh, advantages are that it reduces the operative time as the microscope does not have to be moved in and out again and again, and it may improve the survival rate and it may also reduce the complications rate. Whereas a comparative study which has been carried out uh, by uh, Camacho uh, has shown that the two methods uh, uh, do not show any change as far as the survival rate is concerned, but the operative time definitely gets significantly shortened in structure by structure approach. So structure by structure approach is the one which we usually follow. As far as the basic technique of reimplantation is concerned, so it remains the same as it is in a single digit uh, uh, amputation. Uh, you have to prepare the amputated parts very well. And then you have to, of course, prepare the amputation stump also in the same way we do it in single digit uh, amputation. And the same way, the basic technique of reimplantation also remains the same, starting with bone shorting and fixation, like flexor tendon repair, extensor tendon repair, digital nerve repair, and then the vascular repairs. Uh, one can do the venous repair first, and then go on to the arterial repair because that uh, you will reduce uh, the bl blood loss uh, to a great extent if the venous repair is done uh, uh, beforehand. When you have multiple digit uh, amputations, uh, sometimes you know some of the digits uh, may not be you know, suitable for replantation. So in those cases, you have to give uh, priority to the thumb and then followed by the middle finger and the index finger. And in some cases, uh, you may be using only the least injured digits and uh, you occasionally may transplant these to a new location to maximize functional recovery. So you have to see that what is going to give you the maximum functional recovery and those cases then you can do the reimplantation accordingly. So I'll just go through some of the examples. And this is a 32 years old female lady who had uh, 
the amputation of uh, the uh, index, middle, and the ring finger uh, uh, with the powder cutting machine. And uh, we were able to reimplant all the three fingers uh, uh, successfully. And she went on to have uh, uh, quite a good function and was able to do all the household chores after uh, the reimplantation. So this is a 13-year-old male child who had a rope avulsion injury uh, involving uh, the uh, all the five fingers uh, and in this case uh, only thumb and the other three fingers were brought but we could uh, uh, you know successfully reimplant only the two fingers and in these cases uh, uh, since uh, you know, the tendons have been avulsed so he's waiting for the secondary uh, repair of the uh, tendons in these uh, patients so this is a 30 year old male patient uh, uh, who again you know had a fodder cutting machine injury and uh, the multiple fingers of both the hands were involved so none of the fingers uh, of the uh, of the left hand they were found to be useful for uh, uh, reimplantation but we could reimplant uh, at least two fingers uh, uh, in this patient and thus were able to able to make uh, his right hand uh, uh, functional uh, to some extent and uh, this is a four and a half year old male child and uh, who again had uh, a fodder cutting machine injury involving the total amputation of the thumb and the index finger and both could be reimplanted very well and giving him you know again uh, a very good uh, function as you can see in this child and you can hardly make out that uh, he had uh, any amputation and uh, this is uh, a case of assault injury uh, in a 27 year old male where the index and the middle finger they have been totally amputated in zone 2 and this is after uh, uh, the implantation of these two fingers uh, and you can see that uh, his function is almost near normal so very gratifying results you can get sometimes uh, in zone 2 injuries as well if it is done um, uh, in a proper manner and uh, this is a 40 year old female again with a 40 fodder cutting machine injury, multiple finger amputations, uh, but only two fingers, index and the little finger, they were found to be suitable uh, for implantation. But, uh, uh, but uh, you know, these two fingers uh, itself, they gave uh, a quite a, a good uh, function to the patient and she was able to carry out most of uh, her daily activities with the help of these uh, two fingers and the thumb. And sometimes uh, patients uh, may have multiple finger uh, amputations, but they may bring, you know, a, uh, small parts which may not be reimplantable. Like in this case, uh, we had only one uh, finger, uh, uh, index finger, which was found to be reimplantable. But uh, you know, the reimplantation of just one finger out of the uh, uh, out of the four fingers, we were able to, you know, give her uh, a good function, and now she is able to write. Uh, very well with the uh, use of the thumb and the index finger. So whatever is replantable, you must uh, replant it. And this is a nine-year-old male patient again with a fodder cutting machine injury, and uh, his thumb was uh, badly avulsed, as you can see in this case. At, you know, this was not found to be replantable because the vessels were badly avulsed. So in this case, we did uh, uh, heterotopic replantation where the index finger was put onto the thumb, but then that uh, uh, gave him quite a uh, good function. And this is uh, another four year uh, old male child had uh, the amputation of the uh, four fingers at the uh, metacarpal level. And in this case, uh, we did the arthrodesis of the MP joint, whereas it, uh, uh, in some cases we try to, uh, to preserve the MP joints also. But in this case, the uh, arthrodesis of the, uh, all the four joints was done and the child was able to have uh, uh, some uh, good function uh, in this case as well. So this is a five-year-old female child uh, who had a running fan injury involving uh, uh, the thumb as well as uh, the uh, other four fingers. And we could reimplant only the two fingers out of this, but then uh, even these two fingers uh, along with the the uh, thumb which had been amputated only at the IP level, the child was able to uh, write uh, with this hand very well, uh, as you can see in this case. So to conclude, I would like to say that the multiple digit reimplantations should always be attempted and uh, it's always better to follow structure by structure approach uh, rather than digit by digit operate, uh, approach. And the two operating teams, they reduce the operating time significantly. And in case of selection, you must uh, uh, give priority to the thumb followed by the long finger. Thank you very much. 
So maybe we have a small time uh, for two questions. So one quick question, may I ask Dr. Vimalindu? Yes, Vimal. Yeah, uh, both of you, sir. Uh, what will be the uh, anticoagulation protocol for uh, you in multiple digit as well as single digit tree plants? <clears throat> So we give 2,500 units of heparin at the time of clamp release, and it is followed by 5,000 units of heparin over 24 hours. That is for five days. And what, no anticoagulation pro protocol. Do you uh, do you follow that? Yeah, this is a protocol. We give heparin, intravenous heparin. Yeah, the same protocol is followed by us also. You know, in adults, we will give uh, 5,000 units uh, at the time of release of clamps. And then, uh, you know, uh, the patient is uh, uh, given uh, the continuous infusion also with 5,000 units and normal saline, and which we give 60 drops, uh, you know, uh, per hour. And that again is continued for about five days. And in children, of course, you have to adjust it according to the body weight. And then even later also, after five days, uh, we prefer to give them uh, uh, a combination of aspirin and clopidogrel uh, for a period of two weeks. So that is what we are doing. Thank you, sir. I think we should move on to next. Next, yes, sir. So next talk is by Dr. Rajinder Nehete. He'll be talking on uh, thumb reconstruction. What are his tips and tricks to get best outcome? <clears throat> uh, good afternoon, colleagues, and good morning to uh, BSSH colleagues. Uh, actually speaking, the time given for me for thumb reconstruction is so less because there are so plethora of surgeries in this. But I will try my best to cover what I can do. So classification of thumb uh, loss has been Described by Morrison and O'Brien, Kleinert and Strickland with some minor changes and Graham Lister. But what I like is to follow Merle's classification because it really involves from tip to the CMC joint. Uh, and I follow it. Uh, thumb amputation, uh, actually the replantation is the best option. As uh, Hari said, you need to attempt every, every replant what you get, whether it is a badly crushed, you can see in these two pictures, Badly crushed replants, but still you should always try to replant them. But when uh, the replantation is not possible, the loss requiring reconstruction is uh, minimum functional level is up to the IP, uh, the IP joint. And uh, if the amputation is at the level of IP joint and it is not replantable, you may not reconstruct it, just cover it with something. So, but then beyond that, you need to reconstruct. So if you see the thumb reconstruction, there are two predominant modalities. One is microvascular techniques where you do toe to thumb transfer and with different modifications or different toes. Whereas non microvascular conventional techniques mainly involves the osteoplastic reconstruction, thumb lengthening, polycization and pedicle toe transfer or a prosthetic uh, thumb. So I will uh, focus more on osteoplastic thumb reconstruction. It is ideal for amputation distal to the MP joint. So, uh, osteoplastic thumb reconstruction, if you see this patient, he had the amputation at the level of MP joint and we use a tricortical bone from the iliac crest and we prefer to fix it with the plate. Uh, uh, I will I'll mention about it. When we put this uh, bone, we create a little bit of ball and socket type uh, uh, bone union so that it unites very well. And so the resorption rate is less. And you need to have a very rigid fixation to uh, reduce the chances of resorption of the bone. So when we cover it, predominantly we use a groin flap for this reconstruction. And when we raise the groin flap, the base of the flap should be narrow so that there is a mobility of the hand and if you keep the hand mobile, there is less chances of stiffness of the MP joints and the fingers of the hand, especially in the adult patients. And uh, another important precaution what we take before we divide it at three weeks, we do train the flap almost every time. So what we do is we, we tie an eight, eight number infant feeding tube at the base of the flap 
and keep his clam for 15 minutes in the beginning. We start this after 10 days after doing a flap and it continues till the 21 days and then we can safely divide at 21 days because the inset of the flap is only at the margin of the thumb amputation. The, the vascularity and that is why it is important to debride that edge very well and it, the all edge should be healthy edge so that the vascularity derived from the residual thumb is very good. Otherwise, you, are, uh, you face a problem. So this is the early postoperative of this patient. You can see little edematous. But then as the time goes by, it, it, uh, this is a five years follow-up and you can see an excellent reconstruction of the thumb. Another important thing is uh, literal neurovascular island flap to be added this to avoid the bone resorption because at the tip, because of pressure, there are chances that it will get resorbed. And uh, uh, we don't do it routinely, but this photograph is uh, courtesy Dr. Sabapati. And uh, he always regularly does uh, literal island flap for thumb. It gives a good uh, sensation to the thumb tip. Uh, this is a failed replant where we did the groin flap by the same technique using a tricortical bone and a groin flap. You can see it is uh, divided, but then later on, after uh, division, the though flap was looking good, slowly it had uh, venous congestion, and it had blister, but uh, slowly it recovered. So that is why to avoid this, we need uh, to train the flap uh, by inducing the ischemia by tying the input pinning tube. Another important point is when you shorten the bone, in such cases, it is easy because it is fixed by at the base by the plate. So the tip is free and you can shorten if, you, if, the, if the case be. Because uh, if you are putting a longitudinal K wire, it becomes impossible to trim that bone and uh, shorten the thumb in case you face a problem with the flap. Uh, sometimes there is a complex trauma which will require a flap cover to the other digits also. So in such cases, you need a very large flap. So in such cases, rather than putting bone graft primarily, we would prefer to put uh, bone graft secondarily. And this is the flap cover uh, with a narrow base so that the mobility is good. And uh, initially this flap looks bulky, but after thinning, this flap is, uh, gives a good cover. Uh, this patient was so happy that he didn't come for either for lengthening of the thumb or even for web deepening. He's, he's, he's got excellent function in his hand. Can also be done in one stage using a pedicle radial artery forearm flap or a free microvascular flap. So this was a patient with uh, amputation again proximal to MP joint and uh, well, this is a bone graft done and I have used a lateral, lateral arm flap in this patient and it gives a good result. Uh, little bit of uh, trimming and this will uh, look like a thumb properly. So we have done osteoplastic thumb reconstruction. Uh, total cases 19 over 22 years where 13 we have used groin flap, pedicle radial artery in four patients and free lateral arm flap in two patients. We had complications in three cases of groin flap uh, as I suggested. When, when we choose the technique for reconstruction, we always discuss it with the patients and the relatives. And in India, most of the patients are not ready for toe transfer and they opt for uh, the osteoplastic reconstruction. Uh, but then uh, uh, we, we off late, the, pay, the acceptance has increased and we are doing more toe transfers. This was a patient. Uh, Rajendra, the, the slides are not moving. Slides are not moving. I think stuck at MP joint. Praveen? Lateral arm flap, sir. Yeah, lateral arm flap. Yeah, here. No, it is not moving. No, the slide is only of amputation proximal MP, to MP joint. joint Look at amputation at proximal to MP joint. Here. Can you see it now? Sir, it is the same slide only now. No, I guess it is not moving on our screen. Yeah, it is moving at my screen. Uh, Rajendra, try to keep your video off and then do that. Okay. One video you keep off and try to move. I'll do that. Now, can you see it? No, sir. Is it moving? No, it's not. I will stop sharing and share it again. One sec. I'm so sorry for both of you. 
Now, can you see my screen? Not yet. Nilesh? No, not yet, sir. Oh. It is not yet opened up. Now, are you able to see? No, sir. Nothing you can see? No, sir. No, it is not opening, sir. Not seeing anything? Uh, no, sir. It's not no, coming. It is I'm coming dark. Yeah, I'm seeing everything on my screen here. Nilesh? Okay. Uh, I guess you can jo join back again, sir. You can leave the meeting and join back again, I guess. Because Nilesh, early... since we are short uh -huh. of time, yeah. could we take the question for Dr. Nete? Yes. You can yeah. have the question. Then. We'll do. Sir, so one question I have is that, that uh, you did the groin flap along with the bone graft and plating, right? Yes. So how uh, easy or I, I would find it difficult to maintain the position or uh, of the flap uh, with that long bone graft. So how do you uh, manage that? Or the, What I do is uh, I raise a groin flap, but that flap is almost distal to the away, uh, away from the vessel. It is almost distal to the anterior superior iliac spine. And uh, it is, it is uh, we suture the primary, uh, we do the donor area primary closure in such a manner that the flap end directs laterally so that it is easier to maintain that position and the hand is almost away from the uh, groin. I, I don't do a hypogastric type of groin flap where it, it comes on the anterior to the abdominal wall. It, this flap, it goes almost lateral to the body so that the position is very easy to maintain. Okay. Mm. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Slides, but yeah, it was a good presentation. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Thank, Thank you, sir. You, sir. We'll go to the next talk, which is on PIP joint arthroplasty by Dr. Sumit. I'd like to share with you some tips and tricks for PIP joint arthroplasty. These are some of my declarations. At Wrightington, we use a minimally constrained uh, proximal interphalangeal joint replacement. This is an unlinked anatomical prosthesis which is made of cobalt chrome and high density polyethylene with a hydroxyapatite coating. They're very similar to a mini knee. Um, this is a typical picture of a patient who would present in, uh, in your clinic with degenerative arthritis affecting the PIP joint, or it could be inflammatory arthritis. They would present with either pain, stiffness, or deformity. And one of the things that has become very clear um, to us, certainly at Wrightington, is that uh, PRP joint arthroplasties tend to work uh, in mobile fingers in the presence of overwhelming pain. Not so much in situations where the finger is stiff and certainly not in situations where there is a significant deformity. So you'd never perform a PRP joint replacement purely for the purposes of deformity or stiffness. Looking at this x-ray once again, the type of prosthesis that we would use would differ depending upon which finger you are operating on. For the middle and ring finger, because the ligaments are intact, a minimally constrained prosthesis would be satisfactory. For the index finger, you would need something with more constraints, such as a Swanson's or a Nuflex prosthesis, or because it's the index finger, some hand surgeons might even prefer a fusion. We perform these procedures in, uh, a, in the wide awake situation with just a, a digital block and a, a tunique. So it's important that any patient specific factors are very carefully considered. Make sure that there is enough shoulder abduction and elbow extension. Otherwise you could end up doing the procedure in a very awkward position. Two uh, approaches, the lateral approach, which Ian Trail, one of my colleagues uses, uh, involves subperiosteally splitting the collateral ligaments to provide adequate exposure to the joint, with shotgunning of the proximal phalanx. Following the insertion of the prosthesis, the collateral ligament is simply repaired side to side. I personally prefer, prefer, prefer the midline approach. I split the central slip subperiosteally in the center 
and on subluxating the joint, the first step is sizing the proximal phalanx with the help of a sleeve. I find that access is improved by uh, creating a initial perpendicular cut and um, access to the intramedullary part of the proximal phalanx is obtained with the help of a burr. Uh, a three cut guide is then used for the purposes of shaping the distal femur. This allows us to uh, create anterior and posterior chamfer cuts, as well as reset the, the level of the joint by providing a, 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 a sleeve for a, a distal cut. The proximal phalanx is then reamed with the appropriate size reamer, which is done under uh, radiology control. And then we turn our attention to the middle, middle phalanx. Access to this is uh, obtained with the help of a 1.8 millimeter guide pin. One must spend a, a reasonable amount of time to ensure that this guide pin is in a, in a good position to ensure uh, appropriate placement of the distal part of the prosthesis. A reamer is then used to recess the distal part of the prosthesis. And like we did for the proximal uh, part, uh, for the proximal phalanx, reamers are available for preparing the, the middle phalanx. This is what the implant trials look like. Uh, one of the advantages of doing this procedure under um, uh, local anesthetic is we can see what the finger will do once the extensor expansion is repaired. And you can see this person is struggling to extend the finger. So you could potentially end up with a boutonnier deformity. Um, in this particular case, we had overstuffed the joint and it's difficult to reduce it. Uh, and once you reduce it, you find that there is inadequate extension. After retensioning the extensor, you can get full extension, but at the cost of flexion. So clearly not very acceptable. So you have to downsize, as you can see what we've done here. And that gives us a little more in terms of range of movement. So a little bit of time needs to be spent in, in order to ensure that you get adequate balancing. And you have the luxury of checking your the tension in the extensor structures because you're doing this wide awake. So this is what it should look like. I'm closing, I'm putting a little stitch in the extensors and you can see wow. here a, um, what it should look like. Excellent cadence of the fingers. And um, this is what it looks like uh, under radiology. It's very important to ensure that these things are looked at uh, during the procedure. Some pitfalls, it's very important to make sure that uh, true cuts are made. Uh, with the saw capture mechanism, uh, you can end up with uh, ridges of bone which prevent the actual prosthesis from sitting down. Clearly, this is doomed for failure. Spend a little bit of time to ensure that the cuts are satisfactory and the prostheses are well placed. So looking at our patient that we did, this is his pre-op assessment. Ideal case, good collateral ligaments and good range of movement, but with overwhelming pain. This was after a block was given. So I've started moving these earlier and earlier with the help of our physiotherapists. You have to be very careful. Um, um, and it all depends on how much post-operative swelling you have. And you can see that he has a reasonable range of movement. At four weeks, he's almost able to make a full face. This is somewhat restricted because of his index finger. So we looked at 100, first of our uh, first 100 PIPR replacements and found that pain relief and um, grip strength improved. However, not so, so much success with the range of movement. In fact, I would go on to say that if the, if the range of movement is less than 20 degrees, there might even be a reduction in range of movement and that can cause significant dis disappointment. There is an improvement in the outcome measures in terms of the pain scores as well as functional scores and no evidence of any significant circ circumferential loosening. This was our um, survivorship of 85% at 77 months. Um, and revision can be quite tricky as it leaves you with these large defects within the joint. And this can be easily remedied with the help of plates. Increasingly, we've started using the apex fusion device when we really have to revise these prostheses. And this is very similar to a, a dynamic hip screw, but for the, the PRP joint. So we have a plate and a screw device, which allows for compression across the joint. And you can do this with, uh, with the use of minimal graft. So in conclusion, the prosthesis, if properly done, um, paying attention to various aspects that we've discussed, you get good pain relief and grip strength. 
uh, but not so much with stiff fingers. It's important to remember that all the issues that we consider and it's sacrosanct in total knee replacements, we end up defiling in uh, PIP joint replacements, specifically the central slip. We strip the medial ligament or the collateral ligaments and we strip the volar capsule. So it's a high risk, high yield procedure and patients should be given the choice when listed. It's important to note here that uh, in terms of the procedure itself, there have been waxing and waning trends. Many arthroplasties have come and gone, and this in many ways still represents one of the frontiers and of innovation in hand surgery. The use of the lateral approach and doing these wide awake has significantly improved uh, some of our outcomes. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. It was a very informative talk, particularly for all of us, because uh, here in India, there are a lot of factors such as cost, uh, easy, availab easy availability of the implant and surgical technique. So thank you. So quickly, I would like to ask one question. Since you are using dorsal approach and splitting the central uh, slip, how is your uh, experience of extensor lag of the tendon at finger? So one, one of the things we used to do in the beginning when we started doing these with pyrocarbons or even with um, the PIPR was to do a stitch through the, the bone. We used to bring the extensor tendons together. And increasingly, we found that we never got that tension quite right. So now I split the central slip in the middle, subperiostally elevated, and then when we close it, we close it as a layer. And then it when it heals over a period of a couple of weeks, it tends to heal together as one envelope. Um, we get the physiotherapist to work on the tendon glide, make sure that they don't swan neck. So between a boutonni and a swan neck, one of the things we've got to really ensure is that they don't end up with hyperextension. Hyper uh, about four to five, maybe five degrees of uh, uh, extensor lag is tolerated. But one of the problems with doing a formal closure of the central slip has always been um, significant tightness. So you end up with a very, very tight digit. You know, it really works like a, a, a very expensive finger fusion. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, Professor Jonathan, can ask a question directly? Yeah. And I just wanted to comment on the same thing. My experience has been you get more problems from over tightening it than having it too loose. Um, I mean, I suppose if you overstuff the joint, you could get a boutonnier, but actually a slight flexion contracture often gives you a better result than hyperextension is death of the implant. If they hyperextend, the, you, you get implant mig migration and they fail. Soft tissue tension is really important. Okay, yeah. Thank you, sir. Ian, Thank do you me. want to come in? Yeah, thanks, Sumit. Thanks for a great presentation. Um, just a, a sort of slightly allied question um, about the extensor apparatus. I, I too use that uh, dorsal splitting approach. And uh, one of the tips, in fact, that John Stanley uh, taught me was using an anti-adhesion barrier to try and ensure that the extensor tendon doesn't stick down as it's healing. Um, and I, I have actually continued to do that and not had to do any uh, significant numbers of tenolysis or anything or arthrolysis subsequently. I wonder whether you still did that in writing to me. No, I mean, we, I, I don't personally. I, Mike used to do that in, in the past, but... Uh, one of the things we are trying to do is to migrate to the, the lateral approach going forward. But I find the lateral approach quite tricky technically because when you shotgun the finger to the side, approaching the far osteophyte, so that the, the osteophyte where the hinge is, where you've sort of shotgun the finger, that's very difficult. And get, getting some of uh, Ian Trail's jigs in, the jigs for the PIPR can be very tricky. So I still find it's easier to, to go down the center and put the prosthesis in a little bit loose. So, you know, I, I tend to a very high index for, for putting them in a little bit loose. And you develop that confidence as you, you go along. Yeah, I'd agree. And, and, and I, I find, I mean, you can, it's, it's a lot easier to do, for example, a silastic through the side. Right. Much more difficult to do one of these sort of anatomical um, procedures through the side or indeed through the front, which I've tried. I've we gone back to the back. Five minutes to do. Uh, and if you're doing these in 20 minutes or something like that, you're not paying, you know, you should give it as much respect as you would if you were doing a knee replacement, I feel. Thank, thank you very much, sir. Uh, yeah, we'll uh, now uh, start the talk by Mr. Lorenzo. He's on boutonniere deformities.
I would like to thank the ISSH and the VSSH for inviting me to present on Boutonnier deformity. A sound knowledge of the relevant anatomy and biomechanics is paramount in order to achieve a thorough understanding of Boutonnier deformity and its optimal treatment principles. The extensive mechanism is a complex integrated system due to the complex interaction it has with the intrinsic musculature of the hand. The extensor tendon system of the digits should be more appropriately referred to as extensor mechanism rather than extensor tendon at all times due to its multiple components. Smooth extension and flexion of a finger represents a complex action that requires fine modulation. A so-called triangular ligament is a small area of thin tissue that connects the lateral bands as they converge over the dorsal aspect of the middle phalanx. Its integrity is paramount to prevent the lateral subluxation of the lateral bands that we observe in boutonniere deformity. The action of the transverse retinacular ligament is the opposite of that of the triangular ligament, as its integrity contributes to protecting the finger from swan necking. It is also important to consider the action of the oblique retinacular ligament that originates from the flexor tendon sheath and volar ridges of the proximal phalanx, and in particular its contribution to the APJ extension. It appears that the combined transverse retinacular ligament and oblique retinacular ligament action contributes to the stabilization of a boutonnier deformity. As we know, the etiology is a zone three extensor injury causing central slip attachment damage and concomitant or subsequent triangular ligament damage. Closed and open injuries may occur and the required treatment is different. A boutonnier deformity usually becomes noticeable between seven and 21 days after the traumatic injury. The first and foremost key concept to be borne in mind is that early detection of a zone three extensor injury is paramount in order to formulate an early diagnosis. Boutonnier deformity should not be allowed to become an established deformity, and the saying the earlier the better could not be more appropriate. Elson test to assess the DIPJ extensor tension can be performed either traditionally with the help of the examiner or by asking the patient to compare the DIPJs of corresponding fingers in both hands. Acute open injuries warrant early surgical repair, either by means of a stencil suture or central slip attachment onto the middle phalangeal base. Also, the triangular ligament should be repaired if injured. Non-operative treatment is indicated for acute, closed injuries of the central slip, either purely tendinous or associated with an undisplaced bony avulsion. Surgical treatment becomes required again in case of acute closed injuries with a displaced or large averse bone fragment. Core and epitendinous suture, uh, like the silver scale type, for instance, with non-absorbable suture material, uh, is required in case of an extensor laceration, bearing in mind the fact that proximal to the PIPJ, the central slip is thin, being its thickness approximately 0.5 millimeters on average, as described by Doyle. Reattachment to the middle phalangeal base of the terminal portion of the central slip is simpler to, due to the increased thickness of the central slip in that area. A transosseous suture or bone anchors can be used for the reattachment. If tissue loss occurs, then no technique or another technique for central slip reconstruction may be useful. Full-time PIPJ extension sprinting for six weeks with DIPJ range of motion exercise, including flexion, followed by a further few weeks of removable splinting are indicated for closed central slip injuries that are either isolated or associated with an undisplaced bony avulsion. Similarly to mallet finger treatment, in case of insuccess of six weeks of full-time uh, splinting, a further period of full-time PIPJ splinting can be performed. Larger displaced bone avulsions require either manipulation under anesthesia and k wire fixation, or open reduction in internal fixation. Subacute boutonniere deformity can be staged in four stages, mild and moderate passively correctable ones and mild and severe flexion contractures. Sometimes it is even possible to understand uh, by just assessing the appearance of the finger and the extent of its PIPJ flexion, whether the extension leg is still correctable or whether there is already a flexion contracture. For instance, the patient on the left here has an established PIPJ flexion contracture, whereas the one on the right has a passively correctable PIPJ extension leg. Therefore, the treatment required would be significantly different. Burton's classification of the deformity remains valid, and as previously mentioned, the treatment varies considerably depending on the stage, as each of them is profoundly different from another. Dynamic or static extension splinting uh, or progressive extension casts for the PIPJ can be used in the initial stages, and if successful, extension splinting should not be discontinued for quite a long time in order to preserve the outcome, usually between 6 to 12 weeks. For the stage one and two cases where non-operative treatment does not lead to full correction, a distal extensor tenotomy of the extensor mechanism can be considered. A tenotomy level should be distal to the triangular ligament, but proximal to the distal interphalangeal joint, and also proximal to the oblique retinagular ligament's insertion, in order to allow the oblique retinagular ligaments 
to continue to extend the DIPJ. Postoperatively, a mallet type sprint is required in these cases to prevent the DIPJ extension lag. Another key point for successful treatment is to address the flexion contracture when it is also present. For stage one and two where the operative um, treatment has failed, then the treatment depends on whether the PIPJ is passive extensible or not. In the latter case, volar plate release and accessory collateral ligaments release are also required. This is a case of delayed presentation of a boutonnier deformity, a stage one case in a pediatric patient, with pseudotendon formation distal to the adverse central slip, as shown in the picture on the bottom left, where the pseudotendon that is in fact fibrous tissue with no mechanical properties has been highlighted with the surgical marking pen. The pseudotendon should be thoroughly excised and the bony surface accurately freshened to prepare it for the reattachment of the central slip. I find temporary K-wiring of the PIPJ in full extension paramount to achieve an optimal outcome in these cases, as it protects the tendon reconstruction significantly better and more safely and reliably than just an extension splint would do. A splint may accidentally come off or be removed by the patient, jeopardizing the surgical outcome. Central slip reconstruction in this case has been performed using the snow technique with a distally based flap harvested from the extensor mechanism itself. It is very important to apply two small angular stitches either side of the base of the tendon flap prior to folding and reversing it in order to prevent accidental propagation of the tendon split that would detach the flap from the extensor mechanism. The proximal end of the reverse tendon flap becomes the distal end of the central slip. I tend to use bone anchors for bone fixation. Proximal to the flap, the extensor mechanism is also reapproximated with sutures over the dorsum of the proximal pharynx. Another key principle is that surgical treatment of stage three boutonnier requires two surgical stages, which are separate one from another. The first stage being PIPJ release with release of the volar plate, accessory collateral ligaments, and volar third of the proper collateral uh, ligaments. In any case, preparation preoperatively with progressive PIPJ extension splints or casts is also always recommended, as the less severe the contracture and deformity preoperatively, the better the surgical outcome. The second stage is extensor reconstruction, and besides snow technique, a number of other techniques have been described, some of, some of which are listed here and are of historical relevance. Finally, stage four is characterized by PIPJ arthritis. At this stage, either PIPJ arthroplasty with extensor reconstruction or PIPJ fusion can be considered. In conclusion, in order to achieve a favorable outcome, I would recommend to follow some principles that were proposed by Barton and remain extremely relevant. And I've described them throughout the presentation today. But in conclusion, it is very important to remember that boutonnier deformity rarely compromises PIPJ flexion and grip strength. Therefore, we should not trade PIPJ extension for a stiff finger and a weak hand. I would like to thank Donald Samut for the original anatomical drawings and also would like to thank all of you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this uh, very nice lecture. Uh, I have only one question. What uh, have you come across with a procedure uh, with a, uh, doing a flare, uh, FDS uh, slip uh, from volar to dorsal and reconstructing the central tendon? Uh, yes, I come across it. However, it's not it's not a procedure that I, I routinely perform. Uh, certainly, I tend to I usually tend to avoid um, uh, using uh, something from the flexor side to reconstruct the extensor side, and there is something that historically uh, was was uh, um, taught me by my uh, predecessors, of course. Uh, however, I think it's an extremely valid uh, alternative, uh, and. Uh, um, I don't see any reason why uh, someone wouldn't use it. I guess probably that's your experience. Yeah. So I yeah. Really do because if, if there is a uh, loss of, uh, because of the fibrosis, there is a tendon loss. So for reconstruction, I bring it to the dorsal and put it to the central tendon and use very good result. I think it's a very fine, very it's a fine procedure, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next, Pleasure. next speaker, please. Thank you. Yeah, next talk. So uh, next talk is uh, by Dr. Kartikeyan, and the talk is about management of workman ischemic contractures. Manakkam, in the next eight minutes or so, I shall be talking about the tips and tricks in the management of workman's ischemic contracture associated with each of the following steps in making a diagnosis, in ordering the relevant investigations, in planning the management schedule, in the surgical technique, and finally, in the follow-up and therapy. 
First of all, it is very important to make a correct diagnosis and an accurate understanding of the basic pathology in the Folkman's ischemic contracture because it is going to form the basis of our management. A very simple trick to understand the type of Folkman's ischemic contracture that we are dealing with would be to analyze the following criteria. If it has got involvement of only the FDP and involves a few fingers with no sensory disturbances but there is a tenodesis effect and no joint contractures and no paralysis of intrinsic muscles, it is a type 1. If it involves the FDS and FDP of all the fingers and sometimes other flexors like the wrist flexors and there is a sensory disturbance with the tenodesis effect and a paralysis of the intrinsic muscles but with no joint contractures, it is a type 2. In addition to all the above features, if there are joint contractures too, it falls under the type 3 category of VIC. Having made a diagnosis and having understood the severity of the problem, we need basically two investigations apart from the routine investigations. The first is X-rays to note the bone or joint position which will tell us the status of the joint whether it is correctable or needs fusion and secondly nerve conduction studies which will tell us the status of the nerves and the amount of damage that the nerves have undergone. Now comes the important part of planning the management protocol. In a severe case of Folkman's ischemic contracture like this, it may be a little complicated. So we need to see some tricks to understand this. The simplest trick would be to use what is known as the S3-M2 protocol. In this protocol, basically we assess five parameters. The skin problem referred to as the S1, the skeletal problem referred to as S2, the problem of sensation S3, then assess the passive range of movements which is M1 and then finally assess the active range of movements which is referred to as M2. So we have 3S assessment and 2M assessment. To understand it further, we shall see the details of the S3-M2 protocol assessment. In the assessment of S1, that is the skin problem, whether there is a contracture or an unstable scar as a result of grafting or just deficiency of normal skin, we need to first resurface all these with a good durable quality skin in the form of a flap cover. In assessing the S2, that is the underlying skeletal problem, it may be an underlying bone problem which could be a malunited fracture of the forearm bones or it could be a joint capsular contracture typically consisting of elbow flexion, forearm pronation, wrist flexion, digital claw and thumb adduction. In case of a bony problem, the stabilization of the skeleton should be done and in case of joint capsular contractures, release of the contractures and skin cover should be given and if that is not possible, bony stabilization procedures like proximal or distal row carpectomy, radial or ulnar shortening, wrist fusion or digital joint fusion should be planned. Providing the basic protective sensation to the hand is very important before going ahead with the motor reconstruction. So the assessment of S3 which is sensation should be done and to provide the basic protective sensation procedures like neurolysis, free nerve grafting, a pedicle nerve grafting or transfer as described by St. Clair Strange or vascularized nerve transfer may be done. Before reanimating the inactive muscles we need to make sure that the joints are soft and supple and this can be achieved by an assessment of M1 which is assessment of the passive range of movements and any stiff joints can be made supple by using physiotherapy, stretching splints or even surgical release if necessary. Once the full passive range of movements has been achieved, we need to assess the muscles that are not acting which are mainly the flexors in Folkman's ischemic contractures. It is simple to remember that the plan of management would depend upon whether the flexors are acting that is with an MRC grade of 4 or 5 or when the flexors are not acting that is an MRC grade of less than 4. This is because any surgical procedure on the acting flexor will reduce the power of the flexor by 1 grade. The next point to assess when the flexors are acting is the Folkman's angle that is the angle of the wrist flexion that should be done to achieve full passive extension of the fingers. As in this example in whom the Folkman's angle is 90 degrees. So a simple tip to remember what plan to make when the flexors are acting is when the Folkman angle is less than 30 degrees 
it is a very minimal shortening of the tendons and fractional distraction lengthening can be planned. When the Folkman angle is about 30 degrees to 50 degrees, a tendon lengthening procedure with Z plasty can be planned. But if the angle is more than 50 degrees, a muscle slide operation should be done. However, when the flexors are not acting, it could be the FDP alone not acting of the fingers while the FDS is acting like in cases of type 1 VIC and in these patients an FDS to FDP transfer can be planned and in case both the FDP and FDS are not acting but the extensors are acting an extensor to flexor transfer can be planned and in severe cases where the FDP, the FDS and the extensors are not acting a free functional muscle transfer will be required. Having made a management protocol is good enough. But when we go into the actual surgical procedure, there are some important steps and we shall see the single most important step or the important steps that are required in the commonly done procedures for Folkman's ischemic contracture. When doing the digital fractional lengthening procedure, we divide only the intramuscular tendinous portion of the flexor muscles that are contracted and it is important to remember that the finger should not be stretched after this is done. The tendon lengthening procedure can be done by a Z plasty of the involved tendons but making sure that the sutured portion of the tendon is well within the forearm and does not go into the zone 4 where adhesions are very likely. In the muscle slide operation, an extensive incision on the forearm is made. The flexor origin is erased, taking care to preserve the median and ulnar nerves and the normal cascade position of the fingers must be achieved. As far as the FDS to FDP transfer is concerned, the important points to remember are that the FDS which is the donor should be divided distally, the FDP which is the recipient should be divided proximally and tension adjustment to achieve the flexion cascade must be perfect. As we have seen, when the extensor muscles are intact, the extensor tendons can be transferred to the flexor side. The commonest done procedure is the transfer of the extensor carpi radialis longus to the flexor distorum profundus and the transfer of the brachioradialis to the flexor pollicis longus. It is important to remember when doing this transfer that a pulver taft weave is ideal so that we have a strong repair which can work well. As far as the use of free functional muscle transfer for Folkman's ischemic contracture is concerned, the gracilis is most commonly used. The important steps are the meticulous harvest of the gracilis muscle, if possible including a skin paddle for monitoring, adjusting the tension of the muscle when it is being sutured after creating a good origin and a strong insertion. The muscle should not be overly stretched or too relaxed. A good vascular anastomosis and a nerve coaptation are required for achieving good function. As far as the follow-up and therapy are concerned after surgery for Folkman's ischemic contracture, a prudent use of the steps of mobilization and immobilization must be followed. Okay, thank you sir. Thank you, sir, for a nice presentation. Thank you. And uh, yeah, regarding the uh, many a times we encounter along with the scarred tendons, the nerves are also are scarred. So, uh, what is your uh, uh, planning of how long nerve grafts uh, do you use safely before you consider any free muscle transfer or any other form of reconstruction? Yes. <clears throat> Usually, you find that both the median and ulnar nerves are involved in such patients. In such patients, when the gap is more than uh, six centimeters, I usually do a pedicle nerve transfer. I find the pedicle nerve transfer gives a very good result, but in the bargain, you are uh, sacrificing the ulnar nerve. But to achieve function, I think this is quite worth it. If it is less than six centimeters, then I put a sural nerve cable grafting for both the median nerve and the ulnar nerve. I have not done a vascularized nerve transfer so far. Thank you, sir. Probably Shall we go to the next talk, uh, Nilesh? We'll, uh, we'll now project the talk by Dr. Mukun Thatte, which is on radial club hand, tips and trips, tricks to get good outcome. Members of the British Hand Society, the Indian Hand Society, the chairpersons, ladies and gentlemen. 
Thank you for giving me the privilege to take part in this CME. My topic for the day is tips and tricks for radial club hand. Some disclosures in the beginning. I am assuming this is a meeting of peers and the time given is eight minutes. I am therefore not going to go into embryology and preoperative investigations, etc., etc., but come to the point about the tips and tricks and the difficulties in operating radial club hand. Let's start with what the real issue is. The real issue is partial or fully absent radius. Missing radial structures like the thumb, carpal bones, radial side muscles, and all the way up to the humerus. That depends on what grade you are at. Alna often overrides the carpus when untreated, like so. This is a typical example of a grade 4 radial club hand with a very hypoplastic thumb and you can see the end of the ulna overriding the carpus. These are some of the clinical presentations of various grades. While these are x-ray pictures of similar grades, grade 1, grade 2, grade 4, bilateral and so on. So what is the need of the hour? The need of the hour is distract the hand and carpus till the ulna is proximal to the carpus. Rotate and translate the hand and carpus so that the ulna is aligned either with the index or the middle finger metacarpal. If we use the index for this alignment, then it's called radialization, which was described by Book Gramco. And if we use the middle finger, then it's called centralization. In my humble opinion, both operations are the same. I prefer radialization because it is a slight overcorrection and all these children have a consistent and ongoing tendency at recurrence and therefore overcorrection in the beginning I think is worthwhile. If possible, and as I have written here, not always feasible in a type 4, do a neutralizing tendon transfer. Our technique was described in the Journal of Hand Surgery European in 2008 and I will now try to show you the technique and the tips and tricks. The longer term follow-up of the same paper for up to 16 years follow-up is sent up for publication currently. The details of our technique are shown over here. It's basically a combination of two techniques. The first stage is a distraction using a Umex biplanar distractor, where we distract and cause tissue lengthening so that the ulna is well proximal and is very easy to move wherever we want to move it. In stage two, the distraction is followed by formal radialization plus a tendon transfer if donor tendons are available. We use David Evans's exposure method in the stage two, and I will show it to you in the stages. So this is the distraction methodology. Umex fixator is an indigenously produced fixator in this country. Extremely lightweight, extremely easy to use and very, very cheap. For example, this assembly that you see here will cost between 35 and 40 US dollars or less than 30 pounds. We always use a bilateral frame. 20 years ago when we started, we used initially unilateral frames and realized that it was not serving the purpose. The K wires are 2 millimeter for the ulna and 1.5 millimeter for the metacarpals. The rhythm is half to one millimeter per day, depending on the child, for up to four weeks. We try to retain the frame for four more weeks if possible, so as to mature the lengthening of the soft tissue. And the problems we encounter is infection and loosening. It is not common, but it is not absent either. I will now show you the steps. So there is a transverse incision taken on the radial side. The bilobe flap is designed thus, flap A is on the dorsum of the hand and flap B is over the excess skin that is on the ulnar side. This is a close-up of flap B. We first take the radial incision and recreate the defect and we notice the nerve and the tendon over here, the median and the FCR. We also expose the extensor carpi ulnaris as well as the extensor digitorum. Essentially, the ulna is now separated from all the tendons. After taking both the flaps up, you can expose the ulna 360 degrees like this and cut the ulnocarpal ligaments so that the ulna is now free to move wherever you want to move it. And because you have distracted in advance, you can move it wherever you want to very, very easily. And after moving it, we fix it with a K-wire. 
and then we close the ulnar flap goes onto the dorsum of the hand the dorsal flap comes onto the volar defect and most important the ulnar defect is closed primarily which adds one more vector to the movement towards the ulnar side that you desire an example of a one year follow up with our method and an example of a growth arrested child with a notch plasty done with a traditional centralization we do not do notch plasty we do not touch the carpus we do not touch the ulna we merely fix it in a new position repair the ligaments and hold it for a long time so what are the tips start as early as possible ideally stage 1 at 6 months stage 2 at between 8 and 9 months from birth to 6 months if you have seen the child as a neonate do a progressive splintage either with a thermoplastic splint or with plaster of paris and there is no damage done to any growing end at any stage and what are the tricks ensure that the ulna is well distracted from the carpus after stage 1 easily possible to recognize on palpation and or plain x ray bilo flap gives an excellent 360 degree exposure and excellent movement maintain the corrected position in plaster for one month more after the ky removal and last but not the least we splint them till skeletal maturity i think this is one of the most important points in maintaining the correction this is a brief overview of results so the in our series the age at distraction was an average of 6 months but if you see the range it was 7 to 22 months similarly age of radialization was at 14 months average but shorter if you see the range follow up is 12.6 9 to 16 years and these are the lengths of the ulna the length of the ulna at follow up is 16.7 contralateral side is 24 in case of bilateral children it was only 13 so for bilateral children we took a control group of normal children who had no skeletal abnormality measured their ulnas found their average which was found to be 21% so bilateral children had greater length issues than unilateral children the pre post radial deviation 81.7 to 8 volar subluxation 20 to 12.4 transverse diameter in ap view and lateral view as shown over here to show that the ulna grows almost to the size of the radius this is a comparative chart which shows other studies and basically ours is the only study which does not do a notch and which starts at a very very early age the basic issues are continuous pull of the common flexor mass reversing the correction the radial sided wrist muscles are often absent corrective vectors therefore are not possible the radio scapho capitate ligament which is considered to be a mainstay of carpal stability is often absent heikel's thesis supports this we think that early splintage early distraction causing soft tissue lengthening minimal or no interference bilob flap method long term k wire long term pop cast and a molded splint are the keys to success an example of a 20 year follow up with 67% length I thank you for your patience. Thank you, Dr. Tate. Uh, good evening. Uh, good evening. Like always, a great presentation. Uh, this is Rohan. One question: yeah, uh, no. How how late do you consider applying a fixator, and you consider not applying a fixator? I'm sorry. You mean will I never will I not apply a fixator if the child comes late? Correct. No, I'll always apply a fixator. So there is no cutoff age group. No, there is no cutoff, but the earlier you do, the better. So in some of our public hospitals, we get a children at three years also. We still do the same thing. All right. Uh, thank you, Doctor. But it takes longer and is harder to distract. Okay. Thank you, uh, Praveen. Could we go to the next talk? Yes. Uh, Patankar sir, please uh, share your screen, sir. am i visible yes correctly sir yeah. thank you yeah uh, my brief is uh, 
slightly tweaked. I am going to speak only on closed K wiring of phalangeal fractures. The tips and tricks for the best outcome and least uh, complications. Uh, as you all know, proximal phalanx is very closely related to the flexor tendons, the neurovascular bundle, and it is surrounded by the extensor apparatus in its proximal two thirds. Therefore, there is a need for anatomical reduction in every uh, case of hand, but more so in the proximal phalanx, because as you can see that the flexor and extensor tendons are very closely linked to the proximal phalanx. A slight uh, disparity in the flexor tendon sheath can cause adhesions at focal points and uh, can lead to a uh, compromise outcomes. So anatomical reduction is very essential. Transverse fractures of the proximal phalanx are uh, always have a volar apex uh, angulation and this leads to flexor tendon adhesions and PIP joint uh, flexion contractures if left untreated or if the anatomy of the proximal phalanx is not restored. In the, uh, by the word anatomy, I mean that if you don't restore the volar concavity and the dorsal convexity, there will be problems as I will show you in a short while. So the goals of treatment in transverse or short oblique fractures of the proximal phalanx are anatomic reduction, stable fixation, the approach or the method should be tendon sparing and joint sparing, and we require early mobilization to get the best results. So I will be concentrating on anti-grade intramural fixation of fractures of the proximal phalanx, especially uh, as an index case, I will consider fracture of the distal shaft of the proximal phalanx to show you the tips and tricks of this method. This is the index case which presented 10 days after injury and the uh, deformity as you can see is about 90 degrees of angulation here. So what it requires is a careful study of the x-ray. You can see that the, there is a cross hitch here. So if we can get a close reduction with patience and sustained traction, I think uh, we could uh, do a very good anti-grade nailing in this case. So this is the close up of the same uh, patient. The fracture is of the distal shaft, is a transverse fracture. What we note in the X-ray is a very thick, intact volar cortex. And this is very important if we have to uh, get success with this anti-grade intramural technique, because it's basically a three-point fixation. And uh, basically, as I'll show you later, the two points of the fixation have to be on the proximal fragment, and only the third point has to be in the distal fragment. I take a liberal incision to identify the extensor tendon over the proximal phalanx. I split the extensor tendon in the midline like this. It does not cause any problem, though I have said it's a tendon sparing approach. This is a minimally invasive approach because anywhere you have to go, uh, you have to uh, go through the extensor tendon. And this is the best way as referred in this paper also that insertion of the pin in the dorsal midline is probably the safest thing to do in a proximal phalanx. So the bone entry uh, is, I, uh, I prefer to use a thick K wire. You can use a small owl also. It's about five millimeters distal to the MP joint line. And these are the few steps here. Uh, we see that the fracture is uh, having a crisscross pattern uh, so that it can be hitched properly. And what we do is give traction, correct the angulation, try to reduce the fracture. This is fracture is nearly reduced, but it cannot be held uh, unless a wire is inserted. So these are the steps. This is a location of the entry hole with a small K wire. The hole is increased to about two with a 2.5 millimeter wire. The wire is pre-bent and you seek the intramolar uh, cortex with this wire and then one should remember that we should not use more than one millimeter wire. Ideally, multiple K wires should be inserted, but 0.8 millimeters wires. The wire is inserted from the entry hole. This is the first uh, hole. This is the second uh, grip on the intact volar cortex. If this intact volar cortex is not there, this method will fail. Now, because of the curve, the wire would naturally penetrate out from here, from the dorsum. So at this point at the fracture site, under a C-arm, one should stop and
and turn the wire in such a way that after the reduction the wire goes on to the volar side because if the wire continues to go in the same line of the curve it will uh, come out of the fracture site so you can see that the wire has gone into the uh, nearly into the subcondral area and this can be followed up by inserting multiple wires these are all 0.8 mm wires you have to use a t handle it cannot be inserted with the hand because the intramedullary canal of the proximal phalanx is quite narrow and 1 mm wire would give too much of temp temper so 0.8 mm wires are uh, required the wires are bent uh, and cut here so that they are blunted here this is the pre operative picture for comparison you can see a very good reduction and especially a good reduction of the volar cortex and as i have said that is very important not more than 1 mm wires ideally 0.8 these are pre bent blunt wires i like to retract my extensor tendon with blunt skin hooks like this i use a small t handle on a chuck this is the index uh, this is a paper which i referred to uh, by gonzales and all and this also recommends the use of 0.8 mm pre bent nails this is the paper i had written in 2008 uh, a series of about 43 cases and very important now step is to cut the wires as close to as close to the bone as possible if the wires are cut as close to the bone as possible there is really no need to remove them use a very sharp cutter like this and the tendon is sutured with inverted knots here and we go back to this index case and that is the result at 3 years post op you can see that all the anatomical parameters are satisfied the dorsal convexity volar concavity is met and that's the result you can see the scar is healed beautifully there is no extensor lag and there is full flexion this method is actually most ideal if the fracture is more distal and but one thing is very important is to on the x ray you ensure take multiple views ensure that there is no intraarticular extension and that is the result at 2 years post op the same technique has been used and that is the result here this is the clinical picture now it is very important how much or uh, uh, where is what is the limit what is the limit uh, at which you cannot do this method i would say if there is a this method totally depends on an intact volar cortex so you can definitely do it the fractures of the neck fracture of the distal shaft and this part is dicey the mid shaft fractures are dicey if the fracture is here at this place you get a intact cortex here for the second point of fixation in this three point fixation method and you can do it but if the ex fracture extends proximally you cannot do it and this method will fail or it causes angulation especially if you use multiple wires then probably as a compromise you have to use a single wire this is a case which was erroneously treated by this method you can see this is not the method of treatment somebody had opened it and still not got a good reduction or i would say this is not acceptable at all and so this uh, k wire previous k wire was removed and you can see that in this case also the two points of fixation are in the proximal uh, fragment and only one point of fixation in the distal fragment so this method will succeed because and already what is more important is that you have to uh, think of the length of the proximal phalanx also a middle finger proximal phalanx is very long here in the little finger the proximal phalanx is very short so use multiple or i would say less number of wires but definitely 0.8 mm only and this patient because of the previous surgery started developing flexion contractures and this was treated with this capnus splint and that is the result some extensor lag still persist attributed to the previous surgery now when the fracture is slightly more proximal and if this method is followed you can see that the k wires having uh, their own temper will push the bone and deform the fracture site so this method is not really ideal anti grade method is not ideal for these cases so what is the method for these cases uh, uh, when this fracture is proximal to the mid shaft you have to i like to do a retrograde intramedullary wiring like this again we make a hole with a 1.5 mm or 2 mm wire here at this junction here as shown and insert multiple wires remember one thing when you when we do a retrograde wiring there is more space on the volar aspect of the proximal phalanx 
so the wires have to be inserted from the distal end and curved in such a way that they go into the volar cord volar area of the proximal phalanx proximally and that is the result at two years post op now this was another case very interesting there is a comminution in the proximal half so even if i want to do a retrograde wiring here i cannot insert this wire in such a way that it goes into this cortex so here knowing this volar oblique or obliquity on this side i have to use a wire in such a way from this side so that when the wire abuts against this cortex a retrograde wire it will push this bone on the medial side and get a reduction like so a single wire was inserted most important picture in this is this where the wire has gone exactly into the uh, radial aspect of the volar cortex and in the lateral view you can see that the con concavity is restored and the wire is gone on the volar side here this uh, in this method the wire is inserted very close to the joint so we expect some sort of stiffness till the wire is there but the fixation is very stable and you assisted uh, mobilization is done the fracture unites reasonably well and in time and this k wire has to be removed you can see that the extensor lag persists till the k wire is removed and at one year post op there is no extensor lag a wire removal has been done and the fracture is completely healed this method for want of time i would not i would stop here but we use the same method to extrapolate and published a paper on the use of antigrade wiring for middle phalanx shaft fractures in 2014 also i thank you all for your attention rohan yeah thank you sir <clears throat> for a very nice and informative talk there is one question from uh, dr bipin he is asking how do you decide the center of the shaft for introduction of the k wire wires uh, use of a c arm uh, uh, is very, very important you take a c arm and uh, put a small k wire there and uh, check uh, with a ap and lateral view to know the center the entry must be at least 5 mm distal to the mp joint uh, line okay sir how is your experience in oblique fractures oblique shaft fractures With oblique shaft fracture should not be treated by this method a short oblique you can get away if it is the if the length of the proximal phalanx is long but a shorter uh, proximal phalanx like a little finger the fracture will deform if you use a intramedullary wiring so it is better to use Uh, i am not very confident of uh, doing a closed k wiring for oblique fractures i i want my reduction to be perfect i prefer to open it and put interfrac screws okay sir how how do you uh, prevent distraction at the fracture site in which method same method in this integrated wiring yes uh, actually there is no reason to have a distraction what we can do is stop short of the distal end or stop short of pushing the wire completely and then press manually with the hand over the uh, flex pip joint the fracture will collapse all right <clears throat> okay thank you thank you dr patankar and uh, nilesh do you want to end the session yeah we don't have time for questions right yeah yeah, yeah. all right uh, yeah we can hand over to pravin to take it over and yes thank you nilesh thank all speakers for the wonderful talks thank you so much thank you everyone we'll go to the last Ooh. session of the meeting which is about avoiding complications and i would request the moderators to please uh, be on the mic to a discussion we will have the video and then discuss the topic immediately after the video because many of the topics are unrelated to each other so first is the talk by dr g balakrishnan which is on polycization so how to avoid complications when you are doing that vanakkam good morning my friends in uk and good afternoon to my friends in india i should congratulate the presidents of indian society and british society for bringing this meet i am the opening batsman to start the complication avoiding complication session my talk is on avoiding complications in policy session Polycization is not losing a finger, 
but gaining a thumb. It is indicated in a floating thumb, type 4, absent thumb, or in some congenital difference where they have three fingered hand. In the case of a type 4 or post plot hand, if the hypoplastic thumb is at the base of the index, we have to do only polycization. Whereas this lies here somewhere in the middle of the palm. Many of the, some of the cases, what I have done, I have done only a pharyngeal toe transfer. Coming to the decision making, the age is the important factor. Children should be operated within less than two years. To support this, I borrowed a slide from Alan Gilbert, where you could see that 85% of the cases have got a good and excellent result if you operate within two years. As the age, child's age grow, you have a bad results. This is the first thing to avoid the complication. Next, the other complications are rare, always due to technical errors. The early complications are hematoma, leading to congestion of the newly formed thumb, later infection, skin necrosis. All these are treatable, but sometimes there may be a loss of digit because of the spasm of the vessel due to the hematoma. That the gravest mistake you can complication we see in polycystation. The late complications are overgrowth of the formed thumb or improper positioning, inadequate movements. These two should be corrected at the very beginning, or you have to go for a secondary surgery. In the long middle finger, some of them will complain because the radial most finger is the middle finger, which they feel it is long. To avoid complications, it start from the incision. And then once I incise, the skin flaps are raised subdermally. Preserve all the deep superficial and deep veins so that your skin does not undergo necrosis. For the viability of the finger to transfer the finger also, that's very important. And you should identify the radial digital nerve and it be preserved. Coming to the Allah digital bundle, I got an anomaly, I'll show you now. Then venting of the flexor sheath is important because we are going to have the proximal phalanx as the metacarpal. Fixation, I have always used K wires. Muscle balancing, I'll, I'll show my technique and the post operative dressing. The incision, the original Bagram course incision, still many people follow. It has got a flap raised at the base of the index. And again, you make an incision on the dorsum. To split these two, to place your thumb in proper position. But this all done superficially, sometimes the skin may go for necrosis. To avoid that, Begram, Alan Gilbert said, you take the incision up to the neck of the proximal phalanx so that you have enough skin to cover the thumb pair. And again, on the dorsum, we don't make any incision. That is safe to do this procedure. Coming to the Allah said digital vessel, which is a dominant vessel. We all know about the Hartman pertinative anomaly, which is a percent of about 80% of the cases. The Allah digital vessel runs through a ring in the digital nerve. That happens, you not divide the nerve or the vessel. Just split the nerve and release the vessel, and then you can ligate them and solve the problem. Venting of the pulleys, as you said earlier, PPX is going to be the metacarpal, so remove first and, first and second pulleys, it must be rented to get a good movement. Coming to the length of the finger, the whole metacarpal, but for the neck to be removed, you could see the base of the metacarpal. And in the head of the metacarpal, the marrow to be removed so that you will not go for unnecessary growth. If you leave them, if you just leave this marrow or the metacarpal base, this is what the end result. You will have such a long finger coming up and then you have a deformity of the thumb. And coming to the fixation, we have, those days we used to do only suturing. But many times I see that the suturing is very difficult. Now we have adapted to the K-wire fixation, double K-wire fixation. On straight wire coming, 
head of the metacarpal is turned nicely, got a very small place for articulation on that extension. So no extension deformity of the formed thumb. And also one wire to rot avoid the rotation of the newly formed thumb. And coming to the muscle balancing, Valkramko divided the XSR tendon and sutured the EDC, which forms the EPL tendon. And the EIP forms the abductor pollicis longus. And the extensions are expansion or anchored to the intraoscular muscles to give the adduction and the abduction. But what we now follow is the Allen Gilbert technique, where we create a space above the bone of the proximal phalanx and try to get the bone, the intraoscular, and suture them. They get rested, they get uh, nicely united to the dorsum of the proximal phalanx so that you can have a good abduction and adduction. Here, the post op dressing, most of the people give above elbow POP dressing. Children with this weight always wriggle out and may come to us many times for dressing. So now we give a compression dressing, wherein just be below the elbow, we give this dressing and thumb also visible to get a no problem or a complication in the post-operative period. And with this, I can show you a good thumb which has been formed. If you don't do the proper procedure in the policy session as described, you may end up with a long thumb or the web contracture. If anything present there, it should be treated post-operatively. Thank you. Thank you, Bipin. We will go to the next talk of the session, which is on syndactyly release by Dr. Andrea Jester. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much to, for listening in my very short webinar on some tips and tricks in syndactyly surgery. Now, syndactyly is a very, very difficult topic, although it sounds simple and a lot of people do it. When you look on the internet, there are more than 200 hits on different types of surgical techniques with graft, without grafts, and so on and so on. Unfortunately, it's also a very highly emotional topic among um, congenital hand surgeons. And most of the surgeons will, once comfortable with their own technique, defend their own technique to by all means. But why is it so difficult? Because patients are all different. So we can't use the same technique for all patients. Patients have different skin colors. You can see dark skin, light skin, dark palm, the light palm. And there's a wide diversity of the condition. You see a simple um, syndactyly or what is called simple and more complex types. Now, the one single philosophy that I believe is so important is that the operated side must look better than before. And also like for like is so important, the color match of the skin grafts. There shouldn't be any hair growth on skin grafts like pubic hair. And the donor side should be very inconspicuous. There should not be obvious scarring. And the same on the dorsum of the hand. And we should attempt to anatomically reconstruct the web space. But equally, a wise surgeon will also anticipate outcome and counsel parents. We can't achieve everything. And we a lot of times know that there will be expected deformity after separation and there will be follow-up surgery. And then sometimes we cannot achieve the impossible, which means if joints are moving, they will not move after the surgery either. So each technique that you use, and I will not go into the description which technique is the best because frankly, I don't know, should be judged against how does the web space look? Does it make it look almost normal? Are there visible scars on the dorsum of the hand? Less is more here. Are the grafts color match? Is there hair growth? You don't want hair growth. Is the donor side good looking? Is the nail fold good? Um, one of the tips and I've learned, uh, uh, so sorry, uh, over the past years is to mark the web arches. Uh, you see it's almost rounded and the third web series is the highest and the, the most narrow one. 
And uh, you can see this in one of our techniques. Please don't look at the technique itself, just at the arches. I always mark the arches, makes it a lot easier for me to determine the location. And when I was younger, I didn't do it. And that was the result. You see web space too deep and too wide. A normal web uh, is about Gothic arch shaped. And uh, there's a junction of glabrous and pigmented skin, which slopes about 40 degrees. The skin color, when you look at your own hand, is somewhere in between the dorsum and the palm. And this is the 100 million Bitcoin question. How, which flap? makes it almost look like a normal web space. Here's the dorsum of the hand, here's the palm, and that is the form of a web space. So next time, look at your own hands. You will always need more skin and where you can take it uh, from the dorsum of the hand, you can equally take it as a skin graft or you can take a dermal substitute, but there will be a need for more skin. The dorsum of the hand will give you more visible scars on the dorsum. The groin will give you pigmentation difference, darker hair uh, and dark hair. And the anticubital fossa and the wrist crease is only a limited amount of skin. If you put skin grafts in, make sure that you don't place them into visible places like here where the skin graft is quite visible and actually not very pleasant looking. This is one of our techniques that we use in fair skin color dorsum and fair skin of the palm, so a palm of flap. And the reason why I'm showing it to you is the very narrow angle zigzag flaps and the Bukramko type nail fold flaps. Now the zigzag flaps result in almost horizontal scarring which disappear in the skin folds later on. on in contrast, if you use very broad zigzag flaps, they will leave oblique scars which are much more visible and when you raise the pulp flap leave as much fat attached to the flaps because that will give you a very nice nail fold and here's a result after one year quite reasonable uh, but obviously you still see some scarring if we talk about deformity there is a primary deformity, which is mainly after complicated bone structures and secondary deformity, which can be avoidable. I'll show you one case. And sometimes it's non-avoidable and then you might need secondary surgery. This uh, patient here, a bird's hand after separation uh, done in a, a different hospital, shows the deviation here at the joint. And in some cases, do think about placing a stabilizing suture during the primary surgery as you might avoid this type of secondary deviation. Later on here, we had to do a joint fusion. Now, in this case, obviously, this is a wanted uh, deviation. This is something that you want. Do not straighten the index finger because it will aid the pinch grip with the thumb. And if the parents ask you about it, defer the question until the child is older and the child can make their own decision whether it wants the index finger straightened or not. Here's a rotational deformity. Definitely tell the parents that this deformity will not be corrected after separation, but it will need further surgery later on. And complex polysyndactyly, a very, very difficult um, condition. If they are primarily flexed, you will not get them straight without a significant bony um, and shortening and straightening, very, very complicated. And at the moment, I'm almost in the state where I believe that sometimes um, we should not separate complex polysyndactylies, but leave it until the children are much older and they might need um, joint fusions to, to shorten the fingers and straighten them. And that could be left for the children to decide as you not necessarily make it always better. Beware of macrodactyly. This is a patient of mine with a very subtle dorsal macrodactyly, which I didn't recognize in time. And I only recognized it after a completely unsuccessful normal syndactyly separation. And this patient started over the next couple of weeks to develop this horrible keloid, which had to be treated with metotrexate. I only learned about it after um, reading two articles from Mary Beth Azaki and Michael Tonkin, that this is a very frequent complication in patients with subtle macrodactyly and syndactyly. Think metotrexate treatment here. 
Our technique in Birmingham is that you need to do, you know at least two techniques, a palmer and a dorsal flap, and you adapt it to the patient. So is there anything like a gold standard for syndactyly release? Obviously not. You have to adapt the technique to the patient and a wise surgeon will know several techniques. Thank you very much for your attendance. Bipin. Yeah, I, it was an excellent talk, madam. I want to ask you one question. If there is an absent middle phalanx, like a sim brachydactyly, uh, and two fingers are joined, how do you uh, really design your dorsal flap for the web? Or what flap you design if there is a, uh, because uh, in a traditional syndactyly, we take two thirds of the proximal phalanx length approximately. So in this case, what you will do? So um, if the patient, I have to go back to, to what I said before, if the patient has a light colored dorsum and a light colored palm, then I will not use a dorsal flap. I will use a palmar flap because with the palmar flap, I can avoid a significantly dorsal scarring. And um, I can basically um, take exactly, I, I mark my, my web spaces and I can take it down as much as I need to. If the patient has a different colored dorsum from a different colored palm, and I use a dorsal technique, then I use, then I put it in thirds. So um, the distance from the metacarpal to the PIP joint is basically, I, I, I cut it in three, so it's in thirds, and then it's a little bit above the metacarp, uh, the, the uh, head of the metacarpal, and then exactly where it's two thirds. So that is my length of the dorsal flap. Thank you. Hello. I think, uh, Pravin sir, you're mute. I thank the BSSH for giving me the opportunity to speak on the preventing complications in uh, major replantation. Uh, this is important uh, because major replantation is one surgical procedure in hand surgery where death as a complication is possible. So we really need to avoid that. We need to be careful. The other complications like infection, skin necrosis, hemorrhage, falling blowout, or late complications can all be avoided and then easily be sorted out. So let's see how to prevent complication major replantation. If you see, you will find that the complications in a major replantation are really directly related to the extent of the ischemic muscle mass, that is the level of amputation, and the second is the ischemia time. So we have no control over the time at where the level gets injured, but then on our side, we have got a control over the ischemia time. So all our efforts are to reduce the ischemia time. And it gets more significant as the replant becomes more and more proximal. So because even with the best of efforts, you can wrap it up with uh, ice uh, cubes and all that. Even during surgery, you can wrap it. But then still core cooling is not possible. So speed of execution is the, very, is the key to success. And relationship between the scheme and time and complication if you take, it's not just, it's not linear. Uh, yeah, beyond a particular time, Suddenly, you will find the complications and all become very high. It's exponential. So that's the reason you, know, you need to really take care of the uh, ischemia time. And when the problem comes, it, you really don't have to see it. I think you know, people, if they are not under anesthesia, they can easily see it on the, you can, you can easily visualize it. And the patient feels uh, discomfort. And uh, the urine myoglobinuria, it starts uh, coming. And we have found if there have been a very significant myoglobin area or a significant symptoms, we can correct the symptoms, but we found that almost always you know, they have ended up in amputation. So what is the first step? The first step is that you, know, you need to think there's a fire in the house when you get a major replant. You need to really work fast. You need to bypass the regular emergency system and then senior people have to see it on arrival. The short one, which we have emphasized in uh, one of our uh, articles. And in one of the other chapters which we have written, what we have found is you need to identify your sequence. You need to change your sequence or make your addition depending upon the level of amputation. 
and the time they take to come to the hospital. So we have made a tabular column as to say they come and then they are they come at the proximal level, three hours, four hours, five hours, six hours, as to what you should do and put in the Neil Jones book. And it's also put in our uh, Douglas Ram lecture, and then we are classified into the lower levels. And uh, that is, I would recommend this so that uh, this will find as a guidepost to prevent complications. The next step is you need to debride adequately. That's the uh, most important step because we need to exercise all the muscles that will not get re rise after restoration. Particularly in aversion injuries, you find the tendons are linked with muscles. By no matter on those uh, muscles will get uh, re rise after the uh, restoration. They all need to be taken out. And second, bad bone has to be excised. And when you deep ride, even when you are debriding the distal part, what we need to do is we need to achieve hemostasis even as you uh, prepare the amputated part because they might not bleed massively afterwards. I think that again is important. Next, we come to the bone fixation where the maximum amount of complication can happen. It's not in fixing. It's the, actually, it's the time taken to fix itself to become a complication. So we need to fix it very fast. We need to get your bone out pretty quickly to fix it fast. And we say that uh, in a major replant, particularly proximal replants, we say no matter what we do, it must end in 20 minutes. And the poor fixation is the beginning of the end. So what we need to do is the bone fixation is gain because when you shorten the bone, we get, uh, you get good bone. And uh, we, the whole thing is open, so easily get in 20 minutes. You should fix it well. Poor fixation is the beginning of the end. And because we have bone shortened, and <clears throat> Bone shortening also helps us in other ways because uh, you don't need vein grafts, the soft tissue cover is better. In addition to that, we get better results because the, the vessels that we join, the nerves that we join are all, all of a good, good quality. For example, here you see in a patient who's got a bilateral uh, amputation, both of it, we, uh, that's the x-ray, both of it we join on the right side, where the distal radius fracture, we have fixed it well. And here, the wires that are put were not done properly. So that's what now here, here, here you get this. You find that the problem is this. Though the functionally is fine, but then you know you find etc. And you need a second surgical procedure. So when you do bone fixation, fix it well. Then the vessel repair, we fix as many vessels as possible, particularly veins. And the sequence will depend upon the ischemia time, as I told you uh, before. And we use uh, shunting, if only it's very important and the time is questionable. So you could use a shunt with a plastic tube and then you use it. You could perfuse it for about five minutes, give blood, and then you know you could do it. We feel the shunting gives us an extra half an hour of time. That's it, it doesn't give. And we repair both arteries. Sometimes I repair one artery in the forearm, another we use it for soft tissue cover. And the most important point that I like to say is. We repair the, in addition to repairing the, the main vessels, we also repair the vena comitantes because vena comitantes in major vessels around them, they carry a significant amount of blood. We have found that whenever we did this, the amount of bleeding in the post op period has been significantly less. The post op edema that happens also has been significantly less if there has been a good amount of venous drainage. Always attempt to you know primary repair of the nerves because secondary surgeries in replant are not very difficult and they are important. And uh, in a major replant, the goal is to achieve primary wound healing. Uh, never leave it to chance. If there is any doubt about the soft tissue cover, I think what we need to do is that you, know, you need to cover it with a well vascularized flap. You may wish you would get away, but then the experience has shown we never get away. And we never put a skin graft on a vein graft or an anastomotic site. For example, in this case, we are replanted. I think that's the way we do it. All the proximal and distal is excised. It's covered. But then we found at the end of it, we had an area which was exposed. So we had then used the other vessel to do a free, a free muscle flap. The grizzlies has been used. This is very important. This not only can happen immediately, but it can also happen at a later time. For example, in this patient, we find it's a major replant that you had done, all done well, but then we found that the acromic clavicle, that joint got exposed. 
and then what you need to do is to do a transfusion flap to cover it. Only then, you know, rehabilitation becomes possible. Be prepared for complications. And then at the end of replantation, see, here is a chap now whom we have a proximal replant. And if you see that at the end of replantation, you get a tall, tender T waves, and the patient was not doing well. It's 1.23 in the night. And then we took a call. I think it's not good, it's not worth it. And then we amputated it. We will find that uh, within five minutes after taking it out, you find the pulse rate settles down, ECG settles down. It's not worth it, risking, uh, risking a patient for doing this. Keep a close watch uh, and then you should not see something is not happening properly. You must have a high index of suspicion. Yes, in this patient, we did a replant. And your uh, sensorium was not all right. We thought of infarction. But then we took a CT scan. He had an insignificant amount of you know, scalp injury and found he's got an external hemorrhage, which we needed to take. You can get an amazing results if you just stick to the rules of the game. For example, even at such a high level of an amputation, I think we arrive at X-rays, we replanted you fine, and over six months' time, another finger start flexing, she's got a reasonable amount of an elbow flexion. And then you know, this has helped her to get married. And you can get an amazing results with this. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, sir. Dr. Latish here. Vivid? Yes. Hello. Sir, Latish is asking you one question, sir. Yeah, yeah, please. As, as usual, you have been complete and spot on, sir. <laughs> so, uh, what I wanted to ask you is uh, regarding the time. Uh, with the cold ischemia, do you change the timings of uh, replantation? No, even in that uh, the table column, we have uh, told about the cold ischemia yes, yes, also. also. We have told okay, okay, sir. Yeah. Because I find when you go higher up, you know, so beyond the elbow, if you go, uh, you cannot take off the muscles because if okay. you have a replant of the forearm, yes, sir. then you can debride the distal muscles. Whereas if you have a replant in the arm, then you cannot uh, reduce the mass of the ischemic muscles in the forearm. Okay. So uh, I'll be a little bit clear. So what we will do is that perhaps now we change the sequence, we may shunt. As soon as you get them, you give a shunt. If you shunt them for five minutes, I don't know how, nobody says, said uh, how long extra you get. Probably, you know, you get, say, about uh, 30 to 45 minutes extra uh, to do the procedure. Okay, okay. One more question is about the fasciotomy. Uh, so, yes. do you do fasciotomy and uh, how is the sequence of... Uh... Yes. So, we do do fasciotomy if you think the ischemia time is uh, critical. Beyond the time it goes, it, you do it. And if you have to do a fasciotomy, you do the fasciotomy uh, before you revascularize the vessels. See, suppose you revascularize and then do fasciotomy, the amount of bleeding will be very high. So that will lead to inadequate uh, fasciotomy. So if you think you will need fasciotomy, do it off when you debride itself. You, the distal partner, you do it off straight away. So that uh, you do a good fasciotomy, you will achieve hemostasis at the margins. And after you anastomose the vessels, uh, you don't have to worry at all. Okay. And regarding the anticoagulants, is it just like yeah. the same for the finger replant we use for the arm replants or major replants? Yeah, major replants, you know, we don't give uh, 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 anticoagulants. No? We, okay. Perhaps you know, if you're a little worried, uh, just around the wrist or something, those levels, you could give uh, at the time of clamp release, you would give. But then definitely not in the proximal forearm and in the... Uh, just see, we don't give it. We don't do okay, the replants. Okay. okay, okay. Thank you very much, sir. I think Thank we will so go much. for the yeah. we will go for the next talk uh, by yeah. Dr. Raman uh, from King's College Hospital, London, on avoiding complications in ulnar collateral ligament injuries of the top. Mm, Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Raman Tanasevi. I am a consultant hand surgeon at King's College Hospital in London, and I'm delighted to be a part of this event today. Uh, today, I'd like to talk to you about how to uh, avoid some complications when uh, undertaking uh, UCL ligament repair or even reconstruction in the thumb. Um, the two main things that I'd like to talk to you about are stiffness and laxity. We know that stiffness can be um, disappointing from the patient's perspective, uh, especially if they were younger and they were expecting to return to a high level of uh, function. But we also know that stiffness has an increased chance of re-rupture, especially in the athletic patient. So it's definitely a cause of revision surgery. 
equally laxity is very poor for function it can be very painful predisposed to degenerative change and both of these things will ultimately lead to failure and then the requirement for revision surgery so what can we do to try to influence this now acute uh, patients in the acute setting we will always try to uh, manage conservatively if we, if we can but if we're intervening surgically we will always try to undertake a direct repair obviously in the chronic setting we'll think about doing a, a reconstruction but many of our patients come to us at this awkward intermediate period sometimes maybe four sometimes even six weeks where they sort of fall in between two stools and i think this is where they are more likely to run into complications we also have to consider what the aims of function are for the patient are they looking to return to a particular activity or a particular sport that places them at higher risk and how can we avoid the risk of re-rupture for them uh, I will talk to you about elements of the surgical technique as we go along, but the time to mobilization is really key. So in an ideal world, we want to get these patients active and we want to get them moving as soon as we can to avoid some of these complications. It's worth mentioning that stability and stiffness are not the same thing. M many times we incorrectly, I feel, um, use these terms interchangeably and we I say, well, yes, of course, the joint is stiff, but at least it's stable. But I'm not necessarily sure that that's protective against further injury. And also, I don't think that it's necessarily a good thing for function. We certainly wouldn't be saying that about an ACL reconstruction, for instance. So the aim really should be to achieve stability, but in the presence of a mobile and functional joint. So if you can get these things right, we can hopefully avoid some of the complications that uh, I think are the most significant with regard to failure. In terms of what we can do in, in our surgical technique, I use a, a curved dorsal incision. And the first thing that I do is expose the aponeurosis and make a, a mark along the aponeurosis just at that point, uh, just inferior to uh, the extensor appar apparatus. Now, I think that taking care to mobilize this aponeurosis and then repair it at the end is actually a good thing to do in terms of maintaining tissue planes and also for um, increasing the stability of the final repair because the adductor will uh, definitely contribute to that. So when the adductor is then exposed and elevated, the joint is very clearly seen underneath. And in this particular case, we can see that there has been a distal detachment of the UCL, a capsular defect you can see all the way through into the joint. At this stage, we have to decide whether or not a direct repair is possible. And of course, the earlier or the fresher the injury, the more likely it is that the <clears throat> uh, UCL will stretch. Then the um, base of the proximal phalanx is exposed. And the next step is quite often to take a, an anchor in a standard way, whichever anchor you use, and to, to undertake that repair. But the next tip really is to consider using an augment. Here we can see <clears throat> that the uh, ideal position of the site of anchor insertion will be to mimic the anatomic situation. The obliquity of the fibers of the UCL can be um, <clears throat> recreated by placing an anchor quite close to the joint on the volar side. Um, we can also consider using a synthetic augment and placing that in the same position. So that will add strength to the repair it will maintain a fixed length that won't stretch with time. It could well share the load and can be protective against re-injury. It might give us some increased confidence, especially in the uh, athlete who's looking to return to sport earlier rather than later. But what do we do if we can't get that uh, torn or ruptured ligament to stretch all the way across? Do we undertake a stretch and the best that we can under those circumstances? Well, I personally feel that at that stage, especially in those intermediate patients where you can't get the ligament to stretch all the way across, that a good reconstruction is better than a bad repair. So I would have counseled the patient for the necessity or potential necessity for a reconstruction. I harvest palmaris through stab incisions in the usual way and take it out through sequential stabs. I then size it and here is the augment that I use. It's called internal brace from Arthrex. A whip stitch goes in and then I use a distal first technique which allows for better tensioning. A guide wire goes in and a hole is drilled. If you fix the proximal side first, 
the distal anchor as it goes in will actually deform the joint in the direction that you want to avoid. You're providing a vector which is deforming. However, if you do it the other way around, fix it distally first, then tension it proximally, you will actually be correcting the position of the joint. You do have to be careful because your original anchor for repair was seated in an anatomic position. Now you have to use a much bigger hole and you, it's very, very difficult to place that really volar and really close to the joint surface. There's going to be a real risk that you blow it out with a larger biotinodesis screw or a fixation device. And therefore your reconstruction is not going to be anatomic like the ACL is in terms of its position. Make sure that the holes that you have drilled are really well washed out. I use a swivel lock knotless anchor to secure the graft distally first. Make the um, second hole after excising the remnant ligament and then tension it when the joint is flexed. And I think that's a really important point. Don't try to um, reconstruct this with the joint and extension because otherwise the length or the working unit will be much shorter. And I think that 40, uh, sorry, 30 to 45 degrees is the uh, ideal um, uh, flexion uh, uh, to, to try to achieve when you're reinserting that second anchor. Then that second um, aponeurotic closure will also help with stability. And I think that uh, you, you can see here that there's immediate stability really and a good range of movement after a reconstruction and the confidence that you can get from this will enable you to uh, mobilize the uh, patient and the joint much more early than you perhaps would with a uh, primary direct repair. So in summary, um, stiffness and laxity can both lead to failure. Stiffness and stability are not the same thing. And I feel that a good reconstruction is better than a bad repair. And if you aim to mobilize them early, you will hopefully achieve the sweet spot in terms of overall function. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, I hope to answer some of your questions at the break. Thank you, Dr. Raman. A very nice talk. It was uh, a good learning for all of us. Uh, we have just few questions to you uh, regarding first question. Uh, what's the investigation of choice for you? How you go for that? Do you do uh, ultrasonography or a fluoro or a MRI? How you go about that? Or just a clinical sense and uh, examination, what to take on that? Hi there. Um, that's a great question. And I think that for me, the investigation of choice most of the time is actually a dynamic ultrasound. Um, <clears throat> firstly, the ultrasound gives you fantastic vision of the, um, the ligament itself and whether or not you have a stenal lesion. So I guess the primary decision is, do I want to treat this uh, non-surgically or do I want to treat this surgically? So it will allow you to make that decision on the spot. Secondly, I think that quite often people have, um, it's not necessarily black and white. It's uh, sometimes a partial injury. Sometimes some of the fiber ligaments will still be intact. Some of them may be torn, but I think that doing a dynamic ultrasound and having the ability to compare to the contralateral thumb is incredibly useful. So you can effectively counsel the patient really quite clearly uh, wherever possible, especially in a higher level athlete, I will also try to be present at that ultrasound because I think that it allows for really clear decision making in a situation when necessarily you don't have uh, a complete black and white picture. So the ability to compare to the radial collateral and to compare to the ulnar collateral on the other side to dynamically stress the joint and see how much opening you have is really is important. And especially in one or two circumstances, if you have, for instance, a young female who has a greater degree of inherent natural ligament laxity, having the ability to compare, I think, gives it much greater usefulness than an MRI scan does. Hello, Dr. Raman. Hi there. Yeah, I'm Dr. Latish. I just wanted to ask you, do you stabilize the joint after the tendon repair with the k wire also? Uh, I don't know. Um, I think that that just sort of contributes to the stiffness. And what I'm trying to, I guess, um, compare really with is, a, is an ACL. Um, and uh, you can imagine what our knee surgery colleagues would, uh, would think if we, okay. if we screwed the knee joint with a big fat wire after doing an ACL reconstruction. So I, I guess that some of the take home messages really are that if we are in a position whereby we can achieve 
um, good early or even immediate stability through a well done reconstruction. It isn't quite anatomic. I don't think that it's quite as good as ACL. And I don't necessarily think that early mobilization uh, or immediate mobilization is possible all of the time. But I do think that the envelope can be pushed towards you know, three weeks, two weeks, possibly even earlier, if you feel that the, re the reconstruction is, is robust. And same also for the uh, repair using an anchor. Um, and again, segregating stiffness and stability uh, as two very separate things, I think, is, is the way forward for lots of the things that we do in terms of small joint repair and reconstruction in the hand. Okay, one more thing is uh, whether have you come across whether there is an associated radial collateral also being involved uh, with the ulnar collateral in yeah. that case? Uh... Yeah, definitely. And, and certainly that happens in, in higher energy type injuries. Uh, and it can also happen in more complex sporting injuries. I try to be as conservative as I can with one side if I'm operating on the other. I think operating on both, unless there is gross laxity, uh, will definitely lead to stiffness. Uh, but I, I completely accept your point. If there is significant instability and also the possibility for a rotational malalignment, if there's been a, a circumferential injury with a capsule problem, I don't think that you have many options but to try to address them. It will lead to stiffness, but you may not have many choices under those circumstances. Thank you. Thank you very much. So let's go for the next talk. That's about flexibility and repair. I invite Dr. Dean Boise for this talk. It's a great honor to be able to speak to you today about tips to prevent complications in flex tendon repair. I've often observed with awe some of the fantastic flex tendon results reported in the literature and wonder if in fact I'm a bit of a butcher because in my experience flex tendon repair rarely results in a fully normal finger. So in line with the literature I've revised my approach over the past few years. I suppose a simple way to try to avoid complications is to perform a good repair in the first place. A good flexor repair involves a simple repair technique with minimal tendon manipulation. But you've got to ensure adequate glide. Absolute pulley preservation is no longer sacrosanct for me and indeed I've moved to more liberal release of the pulleys which I'll come to later. So what are the complications that we're trying to avoid? I suppose I could list things like infection or glide, rupture, adhesions, bowstringing, and contracture. It's been shown by a number of authors now that an early repair reduces the rate of all sorts of complications. Indeed, a repair within 48 hours is preferable. In exploring the wound, you've got to place your incisions sensibly with the angle of your flaps not too acute, otherwise you can get skin necrosis. Standard incisions to avoid this are the Brunner and the midlateral, although I tend to use a midlateral zigzag. You mark the skin creases of the finger flexed, so that as the finger extends, the incision line becomes apparent. And here's the exposure. Clearly your repair technique differs as to whether the injury is in zone 1 or zone 2. Zone 1 being distal to the FDS insertion and Zone 2 from the FDS insertion to the A1 opening. When extending your incision for a Zone 1 injury, you can't just extend obliquely across the pulp or you'll denivate half the tip. You've got to extend up the midline. In Zone 1, if the laceration is distal to the A5, then there's not enough tendon to get a suture in so you treat as an avulsion with advancement and primary repair to bone. If it's in 1B or C, then it's treated with the suture repair, inevitably with an A4 release or even division to allow glide. In an injury that is retracted to the palm, this must be delivered distally, obviously with preservation of the pulleys. There are a few ways you can do this, but I still use a paediatric feeding catheter. As originally described by Sumelis and McGrather. But once you've delivered it, what's the best way to reattach the FDP? 
Well, the first thing to point out is to avoid damage to the volar plate of the DIPJ, otherwise you'll get a joint contracture. External pullouts over a button are associated with increased rates of complications, such as infection and pressure necrosis to the nail and pulp. And to avoid this, more and more are tending to use transosseous internal suture techniques, such as those described by Theo and more extensively by Moyman and Elliott. We described our results with micro quick bone anchors a few years ago. And this remains the technique of choice in my unit. But when you get to zone 2, things get a little trickier. Partly because of the need to preserve a more complex flexor sheath. But I'm going to repeat myself now by reinforcing that there's no point in preserving pulleys if the tendons can't move. The A2 and the A4 are the most efficient pulleys biomechanically, and because of that they've been thought to be sacrosanct. But dogmatic preservation of these is a mistake if it leads to poor glide. Conversely, injudicious release of the pulleys will of course result in excessive bowstringing with eventual reduced range of movement. Things are also made difficult by the complexity of the flexor tendon anatomy and the fact that there may be potentially three tendon repairs within a very small space. And by the fact that a slightly bulky repair at the time of surgery has been shown to be beneficial in reducing gapping during active movement postoperatively. Inevitably, when you fix a tendon, even a single tendon, the repair is going to be bulkier than an uninjured tendon, and that is going to interfere with glide. So how do you manage this within each of Tang's zones? In 2A, which is the area of FDS insertion, when the FDP is repaired, the A4 is vented to allow glide, or if needs be, fully divided. In 2B, which goes from the FDS insertion to the A2, the A3 is divided, and only one slip of FDS may be repaired, and the other resected to allow glide. And this is resected as proximal as possible to prevent catching of the proximal end on the pulleys, and it's performed before the FDP repair. In addition, the A2 or the A4 are then vented, if needs be, to allow glide. In the difficult area of 2C, which is the length of the A2 pulley, the A2 is vented or even divided but divided only if the A1 is intact. One slip of the FDS is often resected to allow glide, and if still a problem, then only the FDP repaired. In 2D, which is proximal to the A2, the A1 is resected, and both tendons can be repaired. Tang has shown good results with his modification of the Tsug, but my unit still uses a four-strand repair, if the tendon has to be delivered distally to maintain as much of the sheath as possible, I find this easier to do with one half of a modified Strickland, and then the repair is completed, and a sparing circumferential 6.0 is used. When the laceration to the tendon is at a similar level to that of the sheath, this is less necessary. For example, here an Adelaide repair has been used, the A3 pulley has been resected, and the A2 vented in order to allow glide into flexion. And I really can't stress this enough, it's essential to test glide intraoperatively because physios are not magicians. If there's poor glide on the table, there'll always be poor glide. Some test this glide using Wallant techniques. In my unit, we've got a pretty efficient block system, and I think you can test glide sufficiently using passive flexion and extension. Like many, we've moved over to a short extension block or Manchester type splint which is made to allow up to 45 degrees of wrist extension, hold the MCBJs in 30 degrees flexion with full IP extension. This facilitates IP active flexion initiated from the DIPJ to minimize adhesions. Perhaps the commonest complication of flexor repair is joint contracture, and most usually in the little finger due to the configuration of the splint. If a patient seen to be developing a flexion contracture early, and this is usually apparent by two weeks post-op, then measures are taken to address this at an early stage at four weeks or very occasionally at three weeks, and this extra attention carries on well into the rehabilitation period. In summary, to avoid complications in flex tendon repair, do an early repair with a strong but simple technique with adequate pulley release to allow glide and partial or non-repair of the FDS if necessary. I'd advocate early active movement in a Manchester type splint 
with proactive management of PIPJ contracture, particularly of the little finger. So, thank you very much indeed for your attention. This is how we say thank you in Welsh. Thank you, Dr. Baisi. It was really a wonderful talk. And uh, may I ask one question regarding uh, the use of sutures? Uh, what, what suture do you use? Do you have uh, experience of barb sutures? And uh, what's your take on that? That's the one thing that has come up, barb, use of barb sutures. Yeah, thanks. Can, um, first of all, thanks for asking me to this, uh, this meeting. It's been absolutely fantastic and brilliant talks. And uh, thanks also very much for uh, finishing it in time for the Wales-England rugby match, which is in about an hour and a half's time. But um, as far as suture is concerned, um, I've got no experience of using barb sutures. And I think generally people are moving away from those sort of sutures. Um, I, I tend to use just an ethibond, uh, three or four ethibond. Um, for my core sutures and uh, a very sparing uh, uh, 6.0 circumferential. Yeah. And uh, just uh, if I just ask you, how often do you repair uh, one tendon in zone two or two tendons? It definitely depends upon the gliding. And you see whether it's uh, obstructing or not, you went out the pulleys. But if you see the percentage of cases, how often one tendon, how often one slip of FDS and FDP, and how often both slips and uh, FDP? I think if it's in zone 2B, then uh, I tend to just routinely re uh, repair just one part of the FDS and reset the other half and repair the FDP. Um, in 2C, again, I, I usually try and just repair the one, one half of the FDS um, and, and the FDP. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yes, Vivian. Yeah. So I, I wanted to know that in FDP avulsion injuries, uh, when you uh, reattach or use an anchor in the distal phalanx, how often you get restricted movement of the distal phalanx or a contracture of the distal phalanx? Um, yeah, I mean, very rarely do you get full extension, um, as you say, uh, of the distal phalanx. I can't remember the exact figures. We did report them a few years ago, but it's a few years ago now. But it's not uncommon, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. <clears throat> Now I invite Dr. Abhijit from Kolkata for his, uh, Dr. Anirban for his talk on pediatric fractures. Dr. Anirban Chatterjee. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Greetings from Kolkata. Let's talk about how to avoid complications in pediatric hand fractures. Well, pediatric hand fractures has uh, received some attention recently in literature. That's probably because it's one of the commonest injuries presenting to the pediatric emergency departments. And even though most heal uneventfully, some of them require careful management. And we tend to have a false sense of security thinking that all children's fractures will remodel. However, some of these don't. So let us look at why complications do occur in these fractures. Commonest is a delayed presentation where the people feel that it's a minor injury, the child is usually comfortable, you've tried the home remedies. However, in uh, developing countries, it may be because of uh, <clears throat> inability to reach a healthcare facility on time. There are certain problems inherent with children because it's difficult to assess the extent of the injury, the injury patterns itself are different and the management is different. There are certain physician fractures with a howling child, it's difficult to obtain a proper history and you have to entirely rely, uh, rely on the care provider. It's difficult to examine a howling child and you often get inadequate imaging because of uh, the same problem. While in imaging, <laughs> you, usually AP and oblique views are requested. It's difficult to obtain uh, true orthogonal views. As you can see in this case, if it had been done initially, then this sort of an injury would not have been missed. The clinical mind requires data, which is can obtained from history, clinical examination, and proper radiology, which if is inadequate, will not be able to give you the accurate diagnosis and he will not be able to plan the appropriate treatment. Cartilage is not visible on X-rays and it's purely visualized on the CR. However, it can, if we use arthrography as our pediatric orthopedic colleagues use, then it can be adapted and you can make it visualized. So here's a case example of a 13-year-old boy with a injury, a Salter Harris type 4, 
And you can see the joint congruity was confirmed intraoperatively by doing a bit of arthrogram. And you can see the good result at the end of two years. So which are the ones which turn ugly and cause problems? <clears throat> this paper uh, recommended that you do a thorough uh, physical examination and do a dedicated radiography so that the phalangeal neck fractures are not missed and semur fractures require good sound knowledge of the anatomy so that they can be treated adequately. Another paper from Singapore looked at the peak incidence. They said that the misdiagnosis rate was as high as 8%. There was, uh, but the most common fra fracture was the proximal phalanx fracture. They recommended that uh, we need to correlate the area of swelling and tenderness with radiological abnormality, get adequate x-rays, that is of both uh, in two planes for individual digits, and if required, if in doubt, do contralateral x-rays as well. So what gets commonly missed in distal phalanx injuries? It's often an open fracture, it's a subtle injury, however, it can be a spectrum of uh, facial injuries as well. So how do we avoid this? We need to treat it primarily as an open fracture, recognize the pattern, debride, uh, repair the nail bed, reposition the nail plate, and uh, apply tension band sutures if required, and give adequate antibiotic coverage. So here's a four-year-old girl with a dominant hand crush injury, and you can see the ecchymosis, the nail plate lying uh, on top of the epinecal fold. This is actually a seamal fracture. And al Khatan has mentioned about the complications that can happen if it is untreated. So you can get incomplete reduction and it can cause infection and pseudomyelin deformity, as you can see here in the clinical example. So what should be done primarily to avoid this? You do a proper X-ray, evaluate it correctly, see more of it, visualize it well, extricate that entrapped germinal matrix, reduce it and fix it and reposition the epinetium. So then you can get a good follow-up as early as three months here, you can see the physis is growing well as well. So coming to middle and proximal phalanx injuries, what gets commonly missed is usually condylar fractures, neck fractures, ligament aversions, and epibasal fractures. So coming to uh, phalangeal neck fractures, it's difficult to control this and uh, they have poor remodeling potential and delayed presentation is often common. al Khatan has made an extensive classification of this. And in case it presents delayed, we still have a few things in our armamentarium. We can do a percutaneous osteolysis as reported by Peter Waters, et cetera, and Don Bay. Uh, or else if you can do a subcondyle fossa reconstruction, it comes late with malunion and causing tendon impingement. All you can do is just resect that extra bony spur and it will improve the flexor tendon functioning. Ligament avulsion injuries, here's a case example of a 14-year-old boy injured while playing soccer and you can see the subtle small chip fracture that is there and after doing a proper open reduction and collateral uh, ligament repair, you can get good function. The epibasal fractures are often uh, salter harris type 2 injuries. They can have involve the single or multiple digits, and MUA POP is sufficient, but one must need to look for associate other injuries as well. In metacarpal fractures, the head and the oblique uh, fractures of the base are the ones which commonly get missed, as in the case examples shown here. Here's another case example, a 16-year-old boy with a motor vehicle collision multiple uh, other uh, systems also involved. If you do a proper imaging, you can see the multiple uh, injuries that are there in the metacarpals along with the uh, proximal phalanx as well. And all of these were fixed and you ended up with a good function at the end of 10 months follow-up. Coming to carpal bone fractures, these are a little rare, mainly seen in adolescents, but needs to treat them like as adults, as this paper mentioned, the ones which are displaced, those who are nearing skeletal maturity, and those who have failed conservative management need to be fixed like and treated like adults. So to conclude, one needs a high index of suspicion. You need to do a proper clinical examination, check for malrotation. One needs to be aware of which ones need surgery, which needs to be fixed properly, and ensure articular congruity on table. <clears throat> this paper also showed that the getting proper x-rays, that is the AP oblique and the splay lateral view, as shown in the example here, would give you proper visualization. And remodeling, one must remember, occurs only in the plane of the range of motion if, it is, if the fracture is close to the physis. However, only angulation and translation will remodel. No rotation can remodel. Hence, clinical examination it becomes important. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Be happy to take questions. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Anirban. It was really nice talk. And uh, one question too is uh, regarding the, the most common injury, which is fingertip injuries in kids. Uh, uh, what's about your take for nail bed repair, refination, or complete grafting? Will you just uh, speak about that? Yeah. Uh, thank you um, uh, for that question. Uh, well, the spectrum of uh, injuries in the fingertip is quite large, like you mentioned. If the nail bed is uh, intact and there is a subungual hematoma, then you can just do a trephination to allow the hematoma to escape. In case, most of the times it actually hides a more sinister nail bed injury. So I often prefer to open it up and do a nail bed repair and then reposition the nail. That is probably the best way forward. And uh, how you go for deformities in kids, basically, if you just try to grade that, whether the conservative management definitely upholds, but uh, how you take for, what are the indications for surgeries in kids? Absolute indications, if I just talk about four or five indications, absolute indication in kids. Okay, so if there is a rotational deformity after a fracture, say it's a fresh fracture, then there, those are the ones which will definitely need some intervention. If there is an angulation in a fracture which is close to the physis, then you can accept some amount of deformity and that will remodel. But if the same angulation of the fracture is far from the epiphysis, then it is unlikely to remodel. So you would at least need to reduce it. And if you can get a close reduction, uh, you can still carry on with splinting. But the problem with children is they're not very compliant with splinting. So it is better to fix them. and But when you fix them, it is better to fix them properly so that you can allow the children to do whatever they want with the finger. And you have to be a little careful with the cast. So I tend to keep them in uh, cast for a little longer because you just can't uh, control a child. Once the child is pain-free, they'll start moving no matter what you do. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anirban. Now we move on to next talk. We are waiting for all Dr. Abhijit for this wonderful for his talk on when is starting to learn wrist arthroscopy. So, Dr. Abhijit from Pune. Good evening. My name is Abhijit Vahegaukar and I'm from Pune. I would like to thank the ISSH and the BSSH organizing committee for the opportunity to speak in this midterm meet. Uh, my task is to talk about avoiding complications when starting to learn wrist arthroscopy, and I have no conflict of interest. Wrist arthroscopy has now long since uh, been established as the gold standard in several wrist procedures, and the indications for wrist arthroscopy have been expanding since its inception. And we now have soft tissue and bony procedures ranging from diagnostic to reparative and reconstructive procedures. However, like with any procedure, there are complications that are associated with wrist arthroscopy, but the good news is that the complications from wrist arthroscopy are rather uncommon with proper training, proper setup, and proper instrumentation. However, we also have to acknowledge that our understanding of complications arises from um, uh, surveys and individual case reports and cadaver studies. So we need to have more evidence to establish the exact complication rate. So let us now understand how to set ourselves up for success at the very beginning in our foray of wrist arthroscopy. And this is of course with proper material and setup, understanding the operative setup, the sequence of viewing, and also the indications and training. Material and setup is of paramount importance and having the right arthroscope in the form of a 2.7 or a 1.9 or a 2.4 mm scope with a 30 degree angulation and a blunt trogar is extremely important. Uh, we also need to understand that with smaller size, we have greater fragility and a reduced field of vision and let a, lesser definition, which is now addressed with 4K and HD optical systems. The visual field is that of 30 degrees, which is the most ideal and a Few instruments, again, add to our ability of performing different procedures. And it is desirable to have a hook probe, a fine um, halstead or a hemostat, a basket forceps and grasping forceps, and a 15 number scalpel blade in lieu of a 
of a eleven num blade. A small burr and shaver with the RF probe are again uh, something that will add to your ability of providing optimum outcomes with different reparative and reconstructive procedures. The hook probe is an extension of the arthroscopy surgeon's finger and allows for several different advantages when performing wrist arthroscopy. The operative setup is standard with the patient in the supine position with regional anesthesia. A pneumatic tourniquet allows for a bloodless field. The shoulder is abducted and the elbow is flexed at 90 degrees and finger traps and a hand holder are used for providing wrist distraction, just like so. Wrist distraction and traction in the uh, field of wrist arthroscopy is extremely important in providing this much needed uh, space to insert your scope and your instrumentations. And unlike other joints where we use fluid distension to provide that space, in wrist arthroscopy, we use traction to allow for um, the procedures. We use several different types of hand holders and finger traps in conjunction with wrist traction tars to, um, to accomplish this wrist distraction. Patient positioning also is very important. And in diagnostic arthroscopy, the surgeon is towards the head end of the patient, whereas the assistant is in front, whereas the nurse is at the side. And in a uh, surgical arthroscopy, the assistant is to the side of the surgeon in order to assist him more efficiently. Portal anatomy is very important. We all know that the extensive compartments um, and the interspaces between them are the portals that allow us to approach the wrist uh, in the mid carpal as well as the radiocarpal joints and thereby uh, perform different procedures while minimizing or uh, preventing any injury to the nerves and the tendons. If we were to imagine the wrist to be a box just like so, we could then approach the wrist from any which direction, either dorsal, volar, ulna or radial uh, between the extensor compartments of the dorsal aspect and the flexor uh, tendons on the volar aspect. It is extremely important also to understand the surface anatomy and use these landmarks to be able to find our way in locating the portals. And we'll just come to a very short video as to how to do that. Once we have palpated the Lister's tubicle, we roll our thumb over the Lister's tubicle to the soft spot that gives us entry into the 3-4 portal, just like so. This is a short video which will demonstrate the surface markings. We begin by palpating the easiest landmark, which is the Lister's tubicle, followed by the ulnar styloid and the head of the ulna. This will give us a clue as to where the distal articular surface of the radius is and the distal radio ulna joint. After this, we will be easily able to locate the extensor pollicis longus. Once we have the extensor pollicis longus, we mark the basis of the second and third metacarpals. Extensor carpi ulnaris is just dorsal to the uh, ulna styloid. And now we can very easily palpate the soft spot, which is just distal or a thumb breadth length from the uh, listless tubicle. At this point, we bring in a hypodermic needle, which is inserted into the soft spot, and about three to five cc's of normal saline is injected to ensure that within we are within the working space. And the piston pushback from the pressure ensures that you are within the uh, wrist joint. It is also important to orient the hypodermic needle in accordance to the radial uh, slope and inclination so as to have a proper working space. We make a small incision with a 15 number scalpel uh, going only up to the dermis and then use a hemostat to spread the soft tissue and thus prevent any injury to the uh, nerves and the tendons a pop into the capsule will ensure that you are within the wrist joint and then you bring in your trocar and cannula and thereby set yourself up for a, a wrist arthroscopy examination. A proper sequence of viewing is also very important in order to not miss out any pathology and also to be consistent in performing your wrist arthroscopy. Here is a, a sample video 
a representative video to help you understand how we go from ulnar to radial, from proximal to distal. Uh, we view the soft tissue and then the bones and the cartilage and thereby keep our examination consistent at all times when we are performing the arthroscopy. This is a mid carpal view where you have the head of the capitate at the uh, 10 o'clock to two o'clock position. Now you have the, the triquetrum and the lunate. I'm viewing from the uh, radial mid carpal, whereas the hook probe is coming in from the ulnar mid carpal portal. We are now testing the lunotriquetral joint. This is the dorsal corner of the lunate, the volar corner of the lunate, and the triquetrum. And then I'm using the hook probe to test the cartilage, the joint, the ligaments, so on and so forth. So this is just a representative video of how we go about performing wrist arthroscopy. So in summary, it is extremely important to have a proper training and desirable to have a cadaver training uh, and then perhaps set out uh, with using proper instrumentation and setup, be very thorough with the clinical examination and uh, investigations in order to have a proper patient selection and counsel the patient about the procedure. Uh, and this will enhance and optimize your success in wrist arthroscopy. I thank you very much for your attention. And any questions that you may have are most valuable. Hello, Dr. Abjit, Dr. Latisha. Yeah, Dr. Latisha, how are you? Uh, I'm fine. How are you? Good, good. Thank you. Yeah, just so I want to ask you, what, what diameter of scope do you suggest uh, for a scope? You have mentioned about 1.9, 2.4, 2.7. All right. So in, in the petite ladies and uh, perhaps the pediatric age group or when the book is tight, I would prefer to have a 1.9 mm scope. But as a standard arthroscopy in a full-grown adult, is usually a 2.4 or a 2.7 mm scope. Uh, you know, certain uh, certain companies have a 2.4 and certain have 2.7. There's not much of a remarkable difference between these, but the 1.9 and the 2.4, yes. And then if you're doing a CMC arthroscopy, an MP joint arthroscopy or a DRUJ arthroscopy, uh, 1.9 is mandatory. Okay, one more thing is, as you mentioned, the traction is the adequate, uh, is the most important thing. How do you clinically say that, okay, this is the traction or you have any, any method to say that this is the traction required for a joint? Yeah, so a ballpark, uh, you know, kind of an assessment is to have the hand in a vertical position and then just kind of feel the tension. It should not be floppy, but uh, the suggested weights are anywhere between six to eight kilos depending upon the size of the wrist, depending upon the procedure that you're doing and for what indication. Sometimes uh, a post-operative uh, stiffness might require a little bit of more traction than uh, usual. So up to about eight kilos is sufficient. Uh, what is important is to have your portals properly marked because if your portals are off or if you uh, stray away from the standard portals, then the angulation of uh, or the, the the angle of entry of the of the scope into the joint itself will preclude a proper visualization, and therefore before you commit yourself to the portal, uh, you know it's good to spend some time with your hypodermic needle, feeling your way around very gently in the medial lateral anterior posterior and proximal distal directions, so as to get a feel as to how your scope would be inside the joint. So that's that's. Uh, you know, kind of a good way of uh, doing this and prevent any problems with visualization. And one more last question. When do you advise that to avoid fluids, uh, which all conditions when you do so? Um, I think, you know, someone mentioned uh, some time ago that um, wet or dry arthroscopy are not enemies of each other. And uh, it's always good to use both uh, with proper, you know, judgment. But it is suggested that when you have distal radius fractures, there is a potential for the fluid to leak into the forearm and a potential for a compartment syndrome. Again, these are very rare complications. And then if you are vigilant and if everyone is on the same page in your team and you are too busy 
uh, with your procedure, your your assistant can always advise you as to if there is a swelling that is forming, be 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 very careful about it. So I think you can use uh, wet and dry arthroscopy in tandem as the indication might be. If you're putting in a bone graft for that matter, and if you have a fluid ingress and an egress, the bone graft may get washed out. So it's nice to have a dry arthroscopy at that point in time. Dry arthroscopy gives you the real view kind of a, a real image, whereas looking through the fluid might not give you the same um, you know, assessment especially of the ligaments for that matter. So using them in tandem is desirable. I hope okay. that answers the question. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Abhijit. That was a excellent one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Vikas, you want to add any new points about wrist arthroscopy preventing complications? And I'll just add, if we have made up uh, portal is not correct, I'll say rather than working through a wrong portal, make a portal again maybe a few millimeters, two portals, a few millimeters away, doesn't make a difference because uh, when angulation is wrong and uh, it, it might uh, damage the cartilage and other things. So you should always, portal should be right. As Abhijit said, even if you have to make a second portal near the previous portal, do it, it's always better. And, and just as an extension, quick extension, do not hesitate to uh, make as many portals as required and do not hesitate to switch between the portals uh, to get different perspectives of the joint. Y your, your perspective from the, for example, the radial metacarpal is going to be extremely different from the uh, ulnar metacarpal. And uh, you need to orient yourself and, you know, kind of uh, switch the probe, uh, the, the scope, so that your working instrumentation should be in the proper portal to, uh, to provide for the best approach and the best way to deal with these uh, with different pathologies. Yes, thank you, Abhijit. That was really nice. And thank since you. it is for the people who are starting, I think uh, two things. One is good traction so that you can go inside and never maneuver it like a knee scope. Otherwise, you will break the scope. <laughs> thank you very much, Abhijit. Thank you. And uh, then we'll go to the next talk, which is like treatment of mallet finger by Dr. Matthew Ricks. Hello, my name is Matthew Ricks and I'm a consultant upper limb surgeon at Wrightington Hospital and I'm presenting today on the treatment of mallet finger and this is to the combined ISSH meeting and BSSH meeting. So thank you for the invite. So I'm going to cover certain aspects of mallet finger and maybe focus down on the treatment, both conservative and surgical for mallet finger. So what is mallet finger? So it is a, it's a finger deformity. It's caused by the disruption of the terminal extensor tendon on the distal phalanx. It can be either bony or tenderness. It's described as a mallet because it looks like a mallet. The aim of all treatment is to restore the DIPJ joint extension and to prevent swan neck deformity as an intact extensor mechanism is vital in maintaining the function of the finger and in turn the hand. There are risk factors to developing a mallet finger, and this is commonly with a certain sports and activities, particularly ones that involve balls where you can have a direct blow to the finger that causes the force flexion. It's more common in the middle finger followed by the ring and little finger. It's also more common in the dominant hand uh, than the non-dominant hand and more so in young to middle-aged males. The mechanism is twofold. One is a traumatic impaction blow to the distal phalanx causing a forced flexion and therefore injury to that terminal extensor mechanism as it serves on the distal phalanx. The other mechanism is through a laceration or a crushing type injury to that distal phalanx and to that extensor mechanism attaching onto it. These patients present with a swollen, painful finger, usually commonly following trauma and commonly with a DIPJ held in a flex position, and they're unable to fully extend that DIPJ. I advocate imaging for all mallet fingers, and what you're looking at on the lateral radiographs to see where there's a bony avulsion, to see if there's any subluxation of the joint. Some situations where it's purely a ligamentous injury, you can have a normal bony anatomy, but the finger itself is held in a flex position. The Doyle's classification is what we commonly use for this. And there's a great paper by Doyle back in 1993, classifying this, breaking up into four main types with a subdivision of four into A, B, and C. 
Now, the key factor of this classification is there are different types of mallet finger and your treatment should vary upon the different types of mallet finger. <clears throat> the commonest type is type one by far. And the classifies acute and chronic by the four week mark. So the ones less than four weeks are acute and ones greater than four weeks are chronic. Type one is a closed injury where you get a dorsal avulsion. Type two is an open injury and you get a laceration through the skin down to the tendon causing the mallet deformity. Type three is where it's an open injury but it's more extensive soft tissue loss and in some situations tendon loss as well. Type four is broken up into A, B, and C, with A being a pediatric physeal injury, B being two, 20 to 50% of the articular surface, and C being greater than 50% of the articular surface. There's evidence from over the years which have advocated not to operate on any of these, that you don't need to, and this is one paper back in 84, saying that we didn't need to operate. There's a good outcome with conservative measures alone. There's been literature over the years that have looked at the, at the percentage or the degree of articular joint surface involvement from the fracture. And they say that greater than a third, there's an indication that you should operate on for these patients. Those with subluxation, you should consider operating on. So this is another area that some of the literature looked at, advocating surgery in your mallet fingers. But I think what this does, which is key, is it highlights that they are different than mallet finger injuries. You need to appreciate certain factors to it, and I'll go through the classification with you again in a second. So when it, there's also been Cochrane reviews looking at it, looking at the treatment of mallet finger, and their conclusion from looking at four randomized controlled trials, a big population of patients with mallet fingers, is, or the, is that there wasn't enough evidence to show which was the best way to treat this. There was no pooling of data and insufficient evidence from the comparison tested. So there's no clear advice on it. But what are we trying to do from our treatment? We're trying to prevent the complications, which is an extensive lag and a swan neck deformity. So coming back to our door classification, our type one injury. So I managed these with splinting. It's a closed tendon injury. I spin them for a in full extension for a six week period of time, then I wean them out of the splint. In some situations need to do night splinting and these for both my acute and chronic type one injuries. There are complications and non-surgical management of uh, mallet fingers, cold intolerance, skin issues. But I think the main factor in my young patient population group of manual workers is ability to tolerate a finger splint. A fellow of mine asked whether we should mobilize the PIPJ as well, which I th think was actually a good question to ask. And I think, and I pointed him towards a fantastic paper by Katzman et al in the Journal of Hand Surgery back in 99. It was a fantastic study that looked at transected terminal extensor tendons. It looked at PIPJ motion and it did not cause tendon gapping to that transected terminal extensor tendons. Neither did intrinsic tendon tension. That didn't cause gapping either. And that in theory, the PIPJ flexion should actually advance the extensor mechanism. So that's why we don't involve the PIPJ and also prevent stiffness. Type two and three injuries by their inherent classification are open wounds. So they need washout. And in some clean situations, you can consider suture repair or anchor repair back down. But you need to close a wound and consider splinting as well afterwards. I do these under Wallance, a wide awake local anesthetic, no tourniquet. And I wash the finger clean and then repair depending upon the degree of contamination. Type 4A injuries or epiphyseal injuries, they occur in pediatric patients. If undisplaced or reducible splinting, if displaced large bone fragment or subluxation, then I do a transepiphyseal longitudinal K-wire through the growth plate and DIPJ with a single pass. And if there's an associated nail bed injury as well, then I repair that. Type 4B and C injuries, majority of these I manage with extension splinting for a six week period of time, then mobilizing afterwards, and then considering night splinting if, uh, if needed. But if there's a third of the joint surface, if there's subluxation, then I indicate surgery for these patients. I consider fixation of the fragment with K wires or extension block wiring. This is a great technique. I use two K wires, dorsal wire first at 45 degrees, making sure you go by cortical in case the breaks, it can be easily removed. Fix the tendon and then I do a longitudinal wire, getting that distal phalanx fixed first and then reducing it. And once it's reduced, driving that wire into the middle phalanx of the P2 and holding it reduced. So this complication of the surgery is this complication with any surgery, nail deformity, secondary displacement, infection is a big one as well. 
but sometimes you can still get a residual extensor lag, even following surgery, even though you're thinking that you've done a fantastic reduction fixation, but they end up having a small lag. And there's a fantastic paper by Schweitzer back in 2004, which highlighted the position of the DIPJ uh, it's sensitive to length of the tendon. So even lengthening by one millimeter, even 0.5 millimeters can cause an extensor lag on there as well. So hopefully that's addressed some areas of mallet finger for you. And thank you for the invite to coming to discuss with you. Thank you, sir, for the excellent talk. Uh, I would like to ask a question to you. Uh, how do you uh, hold the uh, fragment, the dorsal displaced fragment exactly with the dorsal block or you do put a, another wire to lock the fragment? So, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the invite to come and chat and present as well. Um, it's a great question. So it all depends on the size of the fragments, number one. So there's multiple factors to take in consideration. The, uh, the uh, blocking um, wiring technique I described in the, um, in the video talks about reducing your distal phalanx back up and ignoring that small fragment chunk. If it's big enough, you can consider fixing it with either a uh, K wire in a percutaneous manner is one way, uh, but it all depends on the size of the chunk. And in some situations when I, when faced with an open wound or laceration over the top, I even perform a uh, all suture anchor type repair. And even though there may be a small chunk of bone, it's too small to actually fix. And so therefore, similar to other areas of the body, you ignore the small chunk and you can put an anchor in to reconstitute it and fix it back down. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, any other question? Yeah, one question. Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, I just wanted to know uh, two, two things like uh, Ishigero, when you're fixing the DIP joint, would you make it straight or it always remains a little bit flexed when you're fixing the fragments? I think it's a good point. I think it always ends up being a little bit flexed, doesn't it, when we do it? Um, and although my diagram, which I drew just before I did the presentation, is a complete extension, I think you're absolutely right. It does end up being in a slightly flexed position. Um, but the key factor is that you've reduced that chunk back down and it's held. But sometimes what happens, suppose it heals with a, with a gap, like there's a, a little bit weak over the dorsum and there's a lag. Uh, it's, I'm talking about uh, malunited ones. Would you make or start me refix it or what would be your approach for those patients? I think it's a good point. I think it varies from patient to patient, which is a big factor because as we highlighted one of the papers are presented is that even if you do the most beautiful repair, you can still get the extensor lag afterwards. And so I think it depends on the function of the patient, the demand of the patient. I haven't actually gone back in to do many revisions in those non-union type cases as most of the patients, even when faced with a small amount of malunion or extensor lag are able to function very well. And so I think, yeah, you're absolutely right. When we see these in clinic down the line, although we may identify it, I sometimes I think the patient's aren't aware and they're just happy to get back to a functional point. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Good. So now we go on to the last talk of the session and I must say that we have kept the best one for the last and Dr. Anil Bhatt talking on how to avoid complications when you are doing percutaneous fixation of the scaphoid. Hello everyone. Uh, percutaneous techniques are always fraught with complications and especially if you're trying to put a screw inside a curved or a, a, a twisted kind of bone like scaphoid. I don't have any disclosures or conflict of interest. Uh, in scaphoid, we generally use this technique in undisplaced or stable fractures for patients with preference for early return to activity or sometimes in minimally, minimally displaced fractures where we know that we can reduce these fractures, we can use this technique. KYs are sometimes used uh, as an anti-rotation rule, basically, but sometimes is a definitive fixation, but otherwise commonly used implant is a headless compression screw, which provides a stable compression and achieves length. Various designs are available. The complications to be anticipated are soft tissue related or instrument related or implant related. I'll be basically talking about the headless compression system, which we use in our setup. Patient's consent should be always be there for open reduction conversion, especially in all percutaneous techniques whenever we face complications. The HCA system is basically a self-drilling, self-tapping, non-variable pitch kind of screw. It comes in two sizes, 2.4 and 3 millimeter for scaphoid classically. The 4 millimeter distal thread length can increase to 5 or 6 based on the screw length. You also have a shorter thread length uh, variant of 2 millimeters. 
the two millimeter proximal thread is a, a fixed uh, kind of a measurement there. For a Wohler technique, preferably for waist fractures, the thumb traction is one of the option where fracture reduction and CR movement is easy. This is a picture from the Green's book. Or otherwise, we place the wrist on a roll towel like this to give hyperextension and ulnar deviation. The single most step where things can go wrong is the entry points, and we need to spend a lot of time here. If you look at the distal pole and if you divide it into thirds, the outer third is where the entry point would be ideal so that you get the maximum length of the screw and try to place it as much central as possible. Now, in a neutral position, it's very difficult to get this entry point because the trapezium is in the way and you might have to hyperextend the wrist for you to get into the interval between the trapezium and the scaphoid for this. Some people use a trapezium bar, otherwise, uh, this maneuver generally helps in this. The central axis ideally is from the dorsal side, from the proximal pole, and from the way from the Oler side, it's difficult to get the, the correct central axis most of the time. So a simple maneuver like dorsiflexing the wrist like this, hyperextending the wrist, will open up this interval and you can pass your guide wire into this. Now, when we start this procedure, generally drawing the axis in the both the AP and the lateral would be ideal. And checking each time under the CM is, is the most important thing. So that is the AP axis of the scaphoid like this. And then you draw the lateral axis and what, uh, where they actually both of them meet is your actually the starting of the entry point where your guide wire will go in. You can also use this 14 gauge needle like this and that can, the tip sharp tip can act as a lever to enter the ST joint there. And then you can continue with your uh, uh, procedure. And that uh, 14 gauge needle can also act like a trocar for your guide wire to go inside. Otherwise, you can directly use the guide wire like this, where that uh, axis meet both sides. Make sure you check both this, uh, both uh, planes, AP and the lateral. So as I said, uh, spend a lot of time here to get the best entry point. Check repeatedly under C arm. If required, you also have to screen it under C arm so that you know that the wire is definitely inside the scaphoid and also as much center as possible. So that screening, 360 degree screening is also very important. And avoid multiple pass, passes there, creating false passages uh, uh, with repeated kind of entry into the uh, scaphoid there. So one of the things you can do is uh, not start blindly, but actually you know make a small opening. We do that after this uh, step, but initially only you can do a small opening here so that you avoid uh, these false passages or also injury to the any of the soft tissues. So common complications in cadaveric studies, which has been described is injury to the soft tissues like FCR tendon or superficial ola branch or palmar branch of the radial artery is at risk. So that can be avoided with this kind of a technique. Minor tendon damages are what is being studied. The second important thing is measuring the screw size. That is again, very, very important. This is the depth gauge, which goes in later. And so make sure the tip of the depth gauge is in contact with the scaphoid for you to get the right measurements. Again, you can check under CM and make sure that it is in contact with the scaphoid. The screw size is very crucial. The screw length is measured by adding the proximal and the distal fragment minus the fracture gap here and plus the screw head, which has to go inside, which is about two millimeters here. So the distal screw thread is four or five or six, as I told, based on the screw length. So typically the screw is undersized by about four to five millimeters. So if the screw threads uh, are long or if they don't cross the fracture site, it might not give adequate compression here. Now, if you have a small distal fragment, the problem is that you have this four millimeters here, you have two millimeters here, plus two millimeters which has to go inside, plus the fracture gap. So average 10 to 12 millimeters should be your distal fragment for you to put this on the from the Oler side. So you can use the shorter uh, thread variant, which is two millimeters or you can use a dorsal approach for this. So a very small fragment like this, if the long thread screw is used, it might protrude into the radiocarpal joint here like this. So you'll have to use a shorter thread uh, variant here, or you might have to go from the dorsal side. Again, a lot of papers talk about the screw length, the guide wires, and what happens in, in any of these when there is excess compression. So advancing the wire into the subcondral surface of the radius like this will prevent the wire removal during your drilling and also loss of fracture reduction. That is one other tip to avoid any complication. Then is the drilling. Uh, so don't force the drill if there's any obstruction because your guide wire might bend or break because so it's very difficult for them to be retrieved again. And drill the dense proximal bone here to avoid stripping of the screws as you're putting in your screw and compressing it uh, because it might impede compression if the drilling is not good enough and the screw can protrude at the ST joint here. So the compression, how it is achieved by this compression sleeve is basically masking the screw head inside the special sleeve. 
and then which abets against the bone during insertion. So what happens is once the distal threads have crossed the fracture site here like this, the sleeve acts like a, a lag screw head and that's how we get compression. But the thing is we don't know how much compression to put and sometimes excess compression causes micro fractures, osteonecrosis, resorption and screw protrusion into the radiocarpal joint. So the moment you get some resistance, you stop at that point and then you exchange this with a cannulated driver for countersinking. <clears throat> now this screwdriver has this traffic signal kind of marking, the green, yellow and the red. So the yellow says that it's in flush with this bone there and this uh, red is basically it's gone two millimeters below the uh, distal pole here. So you need to go slowly into that and make sure that your screw is seated nicely inside the scaphoid like this. Dorsal approach, especially for proximal uh, pole fractures, there's one time where you can actually place the screw right in the center. But the only problem is with this is the wrist needs to be hyperflexed. It can displace the fracture to create humpback deformity and also your guide wire can break. Uh, again, there are enough articles talking about the dorsal uh, approach uh, in injury to uh, extensor pollicis longus, extensor carpi radialis, extensor digitorum tendons. So they say that many open kind of an incision would be better on the dorsal side. Some others talk about the guide wire distance from the posterior interosseous nerve and the extensor tendons. Now, again, as I said, you can use the same 14 gauge needle. The, the entry point is very, very crucial. The double ring sign proximal and distal pole is what is required here. And then you can use the rest of the procedure the same way. Only thing is, as I said, if the wrist is hyperflex, so you can't check the lateral view. You need to come out on this, keep in flush here with this, the guide wire, and then only you can check the lateral view. You can use another wire as an anti-rotation kind of a mechanism and then put the screw inside this. If you can't do this, then you'll have to do a mini open kind of a technique to avoid complications of guide wire insertion like this, and then do the rest of the procedure the same way, uh, the screw insertion here and then you'll be end up with the small cartilage defect there. So this will be much safer than trying to struggle to get the entry point here. So in summary, percutaneous technique is a biological fixation and we need to master the technique. And so it has a learning curve for you to get the precision here in this. A good entry point is half the work done and the threshold for open reduction should be less to avoid complications so that at any point of time there is problem, you need to abort the procedure. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, sir. Thank, thanks, Praveen. Thank you, Dr. Anil. Uh, just uh, one question uh, from my side. Uh, how do you decide volar versus uh, dorsal? Uh, it depends upon site of fracture or any frames for you. Yeah, uh, basically, it depends on the site of fracture. So most of the waste fractures we go, we prefer the volar site. And uh, when it's a proximal pole, the, the dorsal uh, approach is a better one so that you can place the uh, screw in the central axis. And as I showed you, depends on the, the, the fragment size also. So when you have a screw length, uh, which where you don't have the short threads and you're in, in, in having a four millimeter kind of a, a screw with you and you don't have the shorter thread of two millimeters, better to go to the dorsal side and uh, put the screw in through that. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, any time do you require to go trans -trapezi trapezial? Uh, I've not done it till now for the percutaneous. Uh, most of the time with a good wrist hyperflexion, I mean hyper extrusion, you would definitely get into the, uh, the interval there, the ST interval. And most of the time, it's easy to pass the screw through that. Yes, sir. Today morning, I did first trans trapezial. <laughs> So yeah, maybe maybe yeah. a tighter wrist and you know very yes, uh, yeah. small skeleton. Yes, probably. Yeah, yes. it was a bit tighter. Yes. X-ray looks much better in transcopy, isn't it? Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, the yes. screw is central, but otherwise, I don't think because yeah. uh, we do both uh, both ways. Yeah. Uh, thing is, measuring a uh, screw is a, again a challenge. Then you have to go by approximation. So if yeah. it is a waist fracture, I, I usually go by approximation. Because when you're going trans trapezial, it's uh, difficult to measure the yeah. screw. Yeah, yeah. but uh, this fracture orientation was something like yeah. you need to go a little bit more central in this yeah, case. That's, that's what I say. Yeah. Yeah. X-ray yeah. is always beautiful when you're doing trans trapezial. It's yeah. dead Dr. central. Dr. has a question. Dr. Ian. Dr. Dr. Uh, Dr. Ian, you, you thanks, have any Thanks. Comments? It's really just to contribute to that discussion. I. I yeah. That was a great talk, and I have a suspicion that probably the sort of Anglo-Saxon wrist is often quite a lot stiffer, um, and and it, it can be difficult to get that that sort of central line for the screw. 
So we, we probably more commonly have to trim off a little bit of the trapezium at least to get a, 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 a ridge of the trapezium. Just trim that off and then it gets your, your slightly more posterior um, uh, entry point without having to actually go straight through the trapezium. And uh, I, I don't yeah. know whether that's helpful yeah. or not. Most of the time, I think the Asian wrists are much more mobile and then generally we don't have that problem of going through the trapezium. I've, I've not encountered it like Praveen said, maybe I'll have a first time soon. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Abhijit wants to tell something. He always has to tell something to you, sir. <laughs> I, I'm glad he stayed back till till the end. <laughs> I couldn't miss out on the learning. Uh, very nice talk, Kamal. Uh, just a Thanks. quick one. You mentioned that uh, it's difficult to take the lateral view. Did you mean the PA view or the lateral view with the wire still in there? Uh, I, I didn't get it because it's easy, usually... I mean, easy. Uh, for, for the dorsal approach, uh, okay. when you're hyperflexing the wrist and passing your guide wire, right. right? once you pass the wire, you need to come out near the metacarpal here, then only you can extend it. Correct. So that's Correct. what I meant. And okay. then you take a lateral view for you to check whether it's in the center, I mean, it's in a proper axis or not. Okay. So as long as you have hyperflex, you can't extend because the wire will bend. Correct. So that is the reason. So you need to come out on the metacarpal yeah. side in flush with the wrist here, and then you extend the wrist. Yeah. And then you get your lateral check that, and then you can pass your uh, guide, I mean, the drill. Yeah, yeah. And, and just one quick question. Do you find it a little easier to do the uh, procedure with the wrist or the forearm in the perpendicular position and having your C-arm orient in the horizontal uh, position yeah. rather than the hand being flat out on the table? Yeah, uh, it is because then you need to keep the C-arm, uh, you know, in a horizontal position like this. So sometimes uh, with the constraints in the OT, it might not be easy for us to do that. Right. So most of the times the hand is, sometimes I keep the hand directly onto the C-arm itself. I just keep a small towel there onto the C-arm, it's still not on the hand table. So right. I get a magnified view of this and then you can do the procedure there. That's one right. way of doing it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Anil. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, Anil. Yeah. 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 Hi. Uh, we are a little bit lazy. We don't take out the wire. Actually, we take a AP view in this position. And I know like for many years, because when you take out and it adds on to another step. So yeah. lateral is easy. We just tilt our wrist so that we get a AP view. So yeah. it's possible. Yeah. Only thing you have to be careful. You don't bend your wire. Otherwise, you break your wire. Yeah. Most, most crucial part, yeah. yeah. Not to bend your wires and then you start going into your, with your drill and everything and then you have some resistance, you have this tendency to push your drill and I've had uh, two cases where the, the wire is broken and it's held to remove that. Oh, sometimes you just leave it alone and then put the screw in. No, so the trick, everything trick, trick for that is always pass a wire uh, through the metacarpal and hold it with a caucus. Yeah. Because Correct. if you break your wire, you just pull it out from there. Okay. Correct. Nice, yeah. sir. Thank Thanks. you very much, all of you. Thanks, nice Pravin. discussion. And now <clears throat> we have come uh, towards the end of the meeting. And before we give the closing remarks, I would request Dr. G. Karthikeyan to invite all of you, especially our British colleagues, to the upcoming Chennai meeting. Sir, over to you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Good evening and good, uh, good afternoon. It has been, I, I always considered the CME to be something like a dress rehearsal to what's going to happen in August in Mahabalipuram. And looking at how this has progressed, I think I have no doubt at all that the August Ishkan is going to be a great success, especially with, with our friends from the British Society uh, participating. I mean, their enthusiasm in participating has been really contagious. It's great. and. Just, I know we are all very tired. I have just a three minute video. Please bear with me. <laughs> Can I share my screen, Praveen? Yes, sir, please, sir.
That was the traditional greeting in Tamil. We have all survived perhaps one of the greatest disasters of this century, the COVID pandemic. So it is time to celebrate, celebrate life, celebrate friendship, and celebrate hand surgery. And what better way to do it than participate in the Indian Society for Surgery of the Hand annual conference at a pristine beach resort near Chennai, one of the traditional cities of South India, along with our British counterparts, the British Society for Surgery of the Hand, who are participating as the guest society in large numbers. Remember, August 6th, 7th, and 8th, 2021. Mark the dates as we need to celebrate. Can anything be better than spending a weekend with family at a beach resort? Yes, spending a weekend with family, friends, and learning hand surgery, the latest hand surgery from all over the world. So it is time to have a friendly chat with your friends over a cup of coffee or any other drink that you deem fit <laughs> and discuss all that we have been discussing in front of a computer so far. We, the organizing committee members, are waiting to host you at the Chennai ISKCON 2021. Be there and vanakkam again. Okay, thank you, sir. Yes. Indeed, a nice welcoming uh, gesture. Uh, I'm sure that a lot of British, our friends will come and we all are surely going to come. So before we go on to the thanksgiving by our secretary, Dr. Pankaj, I would invite uh, the British Hand Society secretary, Dr. Ian, to say a few words. Thank you very much. So uh, really on behalf of BSSH, I'd like, like to thank ISSH uh, for their really generous hospitality and for allowing us to participate in such an excellent day of outstanding talks and really rich discussions. And I've certainly learned uh, many excellent tips and tricks myself today. Um, I'd like to thank all the organizers, moderators, speakers, the 3000 participants from around the world, and especially Dr. Praveen and Dr. Sumed, the excellent co-organizers for all their contributions to such a successful day. I think today once more has shown what a fantastic educational program can be delivered by the collaboration between the Indian and British societies. And we all look forward to our next meeting and to that celebration in August, when hopefully we can all enjoy a face-to-face -face scientific program and also to socialize on the beautiful beach resort near Chennai. So really a massive thank you from BSSH and take care everyone until we meet again. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, over to you, Pankaj, sir. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's been exactly uh, a Bombay London flight sitting. I've been sitting <laughs> in one place. The next time there is a meeting, uh, I re strongly recommend uh, DVD profile access for everyone. <laughs> it, 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 it was an overwhelming meeting, largely because we are, we are all scheduled to meet uh, twice in next two years. Once in August in Chennai and then in London in 2022. And I, I really can't wait to get into uh, the physical meetings again. I profusely thank uh, the B BSSH for participating and adding a tremendous academic value to this meeting. And 3,000 participants, that's a wow number. And all credit to uh, Dr. Sumit Tervarkar and Praveen Bardwaj. I think they put in a tremendous effort. And of course, uh, a fantastic digital platform provided by uh, Ortho TV. Uh, thank you, Dr. Neeraj, and thank you, Dr. Ashok. Thank you, all speakers. So uh, have a good evening. Stay safe. We'll meet in August. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Thank everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Hope to meet in Chennai.
Bye.